Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. There is, Mr President. The Select Committee on Job Security has lodged a proposal to hold a private meeting today at 1.15pm. Uh, I remind senators that question may be put at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call on the clerk to call on business. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Treasury Laws Amendment, COVID-19 Economic Response No. 2 Bill 2021, adjourned debate on the motion for the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Gallagher. Okay. And we're straight to the minister. What am I doing? You, uh, oh. <laughs> oh, sting. <laughs> Thank there you, Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President. There is, there is. He was just finding his page and removing his mask. So Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and can I thank uh, senators who have contributed to, uh, to this debate on the Treasury Laws Amendment COVID-19 Economic Response No. 2 Bill 2021. Uh, as, uh, as senators are aware, Schedule 1 to the bill amends the Payments and Benefits Act to allow the Treasurer to make rules for economic response payments to provide support to an entity where they are adversely affected by restrictions imposed by a state or territory uh, to control COVID-19. This measure gives effect to the government's commitment to assist any state that is unable to administer its own business support payments in the event of a significant lockdown imposed by that state or territory uh, between 1 July this year and 31 December next year. Schedule 2 to the bill amends the information sharing provisions of the Taxation Administration Act 1953 uh, to allow the Australian Taxation Office to share data uh, with Australian government agencies for the purpose of administering a relevant COVID-19 business support program. Relevant business support programs are those that have been included in a declaration by the Treasurer for this purpose. The Treasurer can make this declaration by a legislative instrument if satisfied that the program responds to the economic impacts of COVID-19 and supports businesses who have had their operations impacted by public health orders. Schedule 3 to the bill introduces a new power in the income tax laws that enables, by legislative instrument, eligible Commonwealth 19 business grants to be declared free from income tax. States and territories are also able to apply the same tax treatment where they have grant programs focused on supporting small and medium businesses facing similarly exceptional circumstances related to COVID-19. Schedule 4 to the bill extends the operation of a temporary mechanism introduced in 2020, which permits responsible ministers to allow for electronic signature for relevant documents in response to the challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic. And finally, Mr. President, Schedule 5 to the bill makes COVID-19 disaster payments received by individuals from the 2020-21 income year onwards free from income tax. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this bill. Uh, continues uh, the adaptive response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that Australia has applied right throughout uh, the pandemic. It enables governments to continue to be able to respond as necessary uh, to the economic challenges faced uh, and created uh, by COVID-19, uh, particularly as a result of restrictions put in place at different state or territory levels. As we've worked our way through the pandemic, our ability to be able to respond in ways uh, that is uh, more directly applicable to local circumstances has been enhanced, uh, and the measures in this bill uh, enable us to uh, ensure 
that we can have effective administration and tax-free treatment of the COVID-19 disaster payments, uh, which are applied uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to different areas as they are affected by lockdowns. Uh, it enables us to ensure that we can respond with economic support measures for businesses where states and territories need, noting that to date uh, states and territories, as they too have enhanced their capability, uh, are showing, uh, showing an ability uh, to be able to deliver those measures themselves. But it's important that we have uh, the flexibility and ability uh, to do that where they find necessary. It maintains, uh, as I said, other certain uh, important flexible measures to get us through the uncertain period that lies ahead. Um, what the advent of the Delta variant has taught us in particular uh, is that the uncertainties of COVID uh, continue uh, to exist uh, and that none of us can pretend to predict with absolute confidence what the future will hold. Uh, these measures will enable Australia and particularly the government to work with state and territory partners, with business, with Australian families, households and individuals to help them, as they have done, to continue to respond successfully uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I commend the bill to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. So the question before the Chamber at the moment is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to, which I'll put before the two foreshadowed amendments. So the question is that motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Appreciate the understanding of the Senate to facilitate the whips and the extensive hearing arrangements. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Chisholm teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 14, noes 14. The matter is resolved, therefore, in a negative as it is tied. We've got a couple of other reading, second reading amendments that have been foreshadowed, so I ask senators to remain in the chamber. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I move the second reading amendment that I foreshadowed in my second reading speech on behalf of the Australian Greens. It is on sheet 1359. The question is 1359. The question is. Yes, there's another one that's been foreshadowed by Senator Seward. So the question is that amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for minutes, one minute. Yep, if everyone stayed in the chamber. One minute. If the whips need more time, just signal. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is, the second reading amendment moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Chisholm teller for ayes and Senator McGrath teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 14, noes 12. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. We have one more foreshadowed amendment. Um, Senator Wish Wilson will be moving on behalf of Senator Seward, I think. Senator yes, Wish President. Um, on, on behalf of Senator Seward, who foreshadowed this during second reader, I move um, on sheet 1361 the second reader amendment relating to Treasury Laws Amendment, Economic Response Bill 2021. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. The question is that. Motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson on behalf of Senator Seward be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim teller for the ayes and Senator Chisholm teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 3, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the negative. Therefore, put the question of the second reading of this bill. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to provide an economic response and deal with other matters relating to the coronavirus and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. We have one amendment from Senator Patrick. Um, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, um, I move uh, uh, Amendment 1 on sheet 1352. Um, the, uh, this amendment, just to make it clear to everyone what it does, and I, and I did uh, mislead the chamber the other day because I was working off a draft, uh, a draft um, uh, amendment. Uh, so I'll just make it very clear. Uh, I'll just make it very clear what I what this amendment does do. The, um, this amendment seeks to do uh, to, to allow for disclosure of uh, companies that have received a job keeper in the past uh, and any other uh, measures that are proposed in this bill that the treasurer may wish to use to assist companies. Uh, job keeper is really important for businesses. Uh, and no one begrudges them from using it, but there have been a number of companies that, in effect, abused the JobKeeper scheme. And in New Zealand, they they disclose for all, every company that gets uh, uh, assistance such as this from the taxpayer uh, how much the uh, uh, the company received, for how many employees uh, they received that money for, and how much they've paid back. In Australia, only 0.28 per cent of money has been paid back from the JobKeeper scheme. In New Zealand, it's 5 per cent, just through having transparency so that people can uh, look at what companies received, uh, look at what, uh, what, they, what they have returned. And my amendment seeks only to replicate what has been done in New Zealand. It's not private company information that we're asking for. We're asking to disclose what the taxpayer has given these companies and, and for what. So just to be very clear, all this bill uh, seeks to do is disclose uh, four things. The name of the entity, the number of individuals for whom the entity received a JobKeeper payment, the total amount of JobKeeper payments received by the entity, and whether or not the company has voluntarily paid to the Commonwealth an amount equal to all or part of the, uh, the amount referred to or the amount they received, um, and uh, obviously a similar regime for any future funds received by companies. Uh, again, not ashamed to be helped. We just don't want to have people abusing the, uh, the, the JobKeeper scheme or indeed any other scheme where the taxpayer is helping a company. So I ask the Senate to support this bill. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I indicate to the Senate that the Greens will be supporting Senator Patrick's amendment. Uh, what we know already is that at least $12.5 billion in JobKeeper payments went to businesses and other entities that didn't actually need that money. And we also know that the final number will likely be higher because there are some. Uh, there is the publication of some figures that we are awaiting that will likely make that number higher. Now, 
Uh, I've tabled a bill on behalf of the Australian Greens, the Ending JobKeeper Profiteering Bill. That is currently under inquiry as we have this debate today. Uh, that bill would withhold uh, tax input credits equal to the value of JobKeeper payments made to large companies that ended up being profitable or that paid executive bonuses, but it would also establish a public register of large companies that received JobKeeper, which is uh, almost identical to what Senator Patrick is proposing in his amendment to this bill. Um, big corporations have rorted JobKeeper. Far too many big corporations have rorted JobKeeper. And a little bit of shining of the disinfectant of sunlight on the whole process by including transparency provisions such as those proposed by Senator Patrick in this amendment would go a long way to forcing companies to pay that money back. Thank you. Senator McKim. Um, uh, Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Chair. Uh, the government does not uh, support uh, Senator Patrick's amendment. Uh, I want to speak a little about uh, the JobKeeper program uh, in responding to the amendment and, uh, and then uh, we'll go particularly to the content of, uh, of the amendment. Um, uh, and what we see in terms of the JobKeeper program is that uh, it was one of the most successful economic responses at a time of crisis uh, in Australia's history and one of the most successful economic responses uh, applied right around the world uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, according to the Reserve Bank of Australia's research, uh, JobKeeper saved at least 700,000 jobs over the period April to July 2020. Uh, the RBA has also said from its analysis that JobKeeper was far more cost-effective than similar schemes in other countries. Estimates are that JobKeeper had a cost of around $100,000 for each job saved compared uh, within the United States uh, some $224,000 uh, for similar attempts at such programs. Uh, this was consistent with Treasury's own three-month review, which found that the program uh, was at that stage well targeted with payments going to businesses that experienced an average decline in turnover of 37 per cent compared with a 4 per cent decline in turnover for other businesses, as well as a doubling in their job separation rate just before JobKeeper being introduced uh, compared with no change in other businesses uh, who were not claiming JobKeeper. The success of the JobKeeper program meant that businesses across Australia performed better than expected. That, along with Australia's success in the suppression of COVID-19. This underpinned Australia's rapid economic recovery. It also meant that some businesses within the JobKeeper program, who were entirely eligible under the rules established at the time of making claims, also ultimately performed better than expected because the economy reopened faster, because the economy grew more strongly, because we saw the recovery come back more strongly. The combination of those factors helped to see our unemployment rate decrease for eight consecutive months, uh, falling to 4.9 per cent in June uh, prior to uh, the recent challenges of additional lockdowns occurring. Uh, Australia was the first economy to have seen both our GDP, the size of our nation's economy, and the level of employment across Australia surpass pre-COVID levels ahead of other advanced economies. And we also saw businesses with the strength they had as a result of programs like JobKeeper able to invest in new machinery and equipment and growing at its fastest rate since March of 2003, increasing by 8.5 per cent in the December quarter and 10.3 per cent in the March quarter to be 7.2 per cent higher over the year. These measures all show the economic dividend that has accrued from good management, including programs like JobKeeper as well as the particularly targeted saving of individual jobs at the time. It was so successful because JobKeeper provided firms with certainty and confidence at a time of great uncertainty. It was put in place quickly with broad eligibility criteria, easy to access, because at, the, at that time we were seeing lockdowns occurring across every state and territory. At that time, we were seeing particularly uh, public-facing businesses right across the country, including some of the retail businesses whose names I hear uh, used uh, quite frequently, being told they had to shut their doors. Now, it is a good thing 
that they were able to reopen their doors earlier than anticipated. It is a good thing that they were able to grow faster than anticipated. It is a good thing that they have been able to not only maintain the jobs they had, but in some instances some of these businesses employ more Australians as a result of the economic dividend that flowed from the management through the pandemic. So, Mr. Madam Chair, as a government, we hear the calls that are made now uh, to try to go back and retrospectively change the terms of eligibility to JobKeeper. The government does not believe that we should be retrospectively changing those rules. We adapted. We adapted. Senator Patrick says this doesn't do that, and he's and he's and he's right. He's right. The amendment itself does not. Order. But the motivations for the amendment are clearly about continuously going after certain businesses, trying to demonise them and imply or suggest they did the wrong thing. Well, businesses who did the wrong thing, who claimed what they were not eligible for under the rules of the program at the time, are subject to all the enforcement provisions uh, of the ATO. But businesses who claimed what they were eligible for at the time weren't doing the wrong thing. They don't deserve uh, to be targeted, to be demonised or otherwise. The government welcomes and encourages those who choose to make voluntary repayments. Uh, that's a welcome and an honourable thing uh, undertaken by those businesses. But other Australian businesses who have made uh, profits during the course of the year, uh, will they have been in a position to reinvest, as I said, driving investment in Australia to higher levels, to create more jobs, driving employment in Australia to higher levels. Uh, they've been in a position to pay dividends, often flowing into the superannuation accounts uh, of many Australians. These are you know, all of the things you expect to see in a stronger economy, and it is a good thing that JobKeeper, as structured, helped to achieve a stronger economy. I note that the Greens, in, uh, in the remarks made, uh, and indeed Senator Patrick's uh, amendment, only seeks, to target, only seeks to target businesses above a certain threshold. But we know that uh, just as there would be and are businesses above that threshold who ended up doing better than expected, so too would many small Australian businesses. So too would many small traders, sole traders across Australia. So too are many not-for-profit organisations across Australia. Again, it is a good thing that they all did better than anticipated at the start of JobKeeper. Today we have new programs in place, new measures that are able to be better targeted, better focused in the way in which they are applied. We are working with states and territories in the delivery of assistance to businesses that is targeted for duration of lockdown, focused very clearly uh, on businesses affected during those lockdowns. Uh, that is because over time we have been able uh, both to learn about how as a country we can respond to COVID-19 and the changing circumstances, particularly brought about by the Delta variant, uh, but also uh, to appreciate and understand how we can make sure as a nation uh, that we provide targeted assistance geographically, locally and to people most affected at the time. Back when JobKeeper was born, that wasn't an option. It was nationwide, it was urgent and it was in the face of great national uncertainty. The rules were written then to deal with the circumstances at the time, and we don't support uh, putting in place measures today that are about furthering some sort of argument that suggests that we should go back and change the rules or change the expectations on businesses retrospectively. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Gallagher, order. I uh, thank you very much uh, for the call, and I, I, I will just uh, contribute. Labor will be supporting this amendment. We do think there are good arguments to be put in place around increasing transparency um, for entities that are receiving uh, payments from the Commonwealth. Um, I was um, also waiting to hear the Leader of the Government's arguments around opposing this amendment, which I don't um, I think other than giving a run, historical rundown on JobKeeper and the reasons why we had JobKeeper, it wasn't clear to me why the government is not prepared, considering the length of the pandemic, the fact that has been ongoing, the fact that we have had such enormous amounts of money going out the door, 
that there is an argument against being transparent around where those payments are going. I think there was a criticism about it only covering businesses or firms with um, uh, where their uh, turnover, the annual turnover, is more than 10 million. But I didn't understand if that was an argument that it should cover the field. Um, so it doesn't seem to me that there is a strong argument against this. Labor agrees that JobKeeper was important. That's why we suggested a wage subsidy program back in the days, remember, when we reflect on this, that the government was opposed to a wage subsidy program and actually said it was dangerous. Um, we were arguing for it. We saw the merits and actually the reasons we argued for it this, um, came, uh, were, were what was achieved with the objectives of it, where with the 700,000 jobs saved, the uh, successful uh, rollout of, of a wage subsidy scheme was something that we were always uh, supportive of, as was the very significant health suppression of the virus, which contributed to, to our economic recovery. So I don't think there's any arguments around that at all. We did have concerns uh, about the lack of um, transparency once we got through the crisis stage. Uh, we we did think there was merit behind reporting, and, and New Zealand has shown the way on how it was done. We were also concerned about how, you know, and I think we raised it at the time, how some people who were earning considerably less than they got on the JobKeeper program actually uh, received that money as well. We think there were elements of the program that could have been better managed by the government to make sure that every dollar spent in this crisis is targeted to where it's needed the most. And I think now, with, with the opportunity we've had and with some of the work the PBO has done and others and reporting season for firms, we can see that billions of dollars went to large companies that did very well through the pandemic, uh, that, it, that returned massive executive bonuses or returns to shareholders, and the taxpayers are footing the bill for that. And I think people who have done it tough through this pandemic look at that and think that that does not sound fair at all. And I do um, congratulate those firms that have returned JobKeeper, who, do, who understand that the, the reason behind the JobKeeper program was not for firms to increase their profits, it was to actually keep people connected to jobs. That was the main reason behind it. And so where that has happened and firms are in the position to repay it, they have done so, good on them. We just wish that there was a few more of them that would follow that lead. And sometimes you change behaviour by shining a light on things. And that's where transparency like this, I think, is needed and, and probably is expected by the Australian community. So we do support this. I don't think the government's got a very strong argument against it. We did want to I would just say I don't want to hold up this bill passing. My understanding was the bill, uh, this bill, the government wanted this bill dealt with this week. We were ready here yesterday to deal with it uh, last night, so it could go to the House. Under the, you know, if this amendment passes and the House has a view on that, uh, we want to make sure that we are not um, slowing this bill down, and absolutely have not been doing that. We were we were trying to work with the government last night to make sure this bill was passed colleagues in the Greens, we amended our speeches and, and made sure we were in a position to deal with this bill. So I don't want to delay it any further. I think it is important that this passes at the earliest opportunity, but this is an important amendment and we're happy to support it. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I thank uh, Labor for their support and the Greens uh, for their support. I understand uh, One Nation uh, will also be supporting uh, this amendment. I just have to, I have to take the finance minister to task on some of the things that he said. Okay. This was not, and this is important because you cannot rewrite history, Senator Birmingham. We need to go back to what this program is about. So I'm going to read from the ATO website, which says the JobKeeper payment scheme was a subsidy for businesses significantly affected by coronavirus. Uh, again, the, the JobKeeper payment supported businesses significantly affected by coronavirus in, as, as the first principle of this bill. So don't you come in here and tell us that, that uh, it is a, a bill to, for, for economic stimulus, because if you'd come to us during the middle of a pandemic and said, I want to give a whole bunch of companies money, of taxpayers' money, so they can go off and profit, it would not have got past, past this chamber. So please do not rewrite history. You've got companies like, uh, like uh, Harvey Norman, who almost proudly are saying they took $22 million of JobKeeper money 
uh, from the Australian public and then made a, uh, they uh, doubled their profits. We took money from taxpayers and we funneled it into dividends and executive bonuses. Do you really think that's fair, um, uh, Senator Birmingham? Is that what the people of South Australia want? Their money funneled from their wallet to big business. That is not right. That is absolutely uh, inappropriate. Now, Jerry Harvey right now must be laughing at everyone. Okay? Every morning people can see ads in, the, in, their, in their papers, in the, in the tabloids, uh, where he's selling his wares, knowing full well those ads are paid for by the taxpayer. Every time uh, we see uh, the Olympic Games, and uh, I was up in the press gallery yesterday, and Channel 7 are very happy with their ratings in relation to the Olympic Games. Every time we see uh, a Harvey Norman ad, every taxpayer needs to understand that they're paying for that ad. It's their money that's paying for the ad, and the government thinks that that's okay. The government thinks that's okay. I've just gone onto the New Zealand. Uh, the, the New Zealand website while you were talking, Minister. I had a look at how much Harvey Norman were paid in New Zealand in their wage subsidy, $12,700,622.40. That's what New Zealand tells us about, uh, about Harvey Norman, but you're trying to protect Australians from being able to see that very information. Everyone in New Zealand can see how their money was spent. And I'm not saying that every single company uh, uh, abused uh, 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 the JobKeeper scheme. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not, not suggesting that the program shouldn't have been implemented. But transparency has caused in New Zealand a much greater return of money that didn't meet the objective of the program, where companies have decided, you know what, I don't want to take money from the taxpayer and used it in a way for which it was not intended. Now, all Australians can do now in relation to uh, JobKeeper is look at those Harvey Norman's ad Norman ads and, make, and, that, and increase their, re their resilience and their resolve not to shop at Harvey Norman, because they're ripping off Australians. Okay? And the accomplices alongside them is the Liberal Party. And in particular, we've got the finance minister uh, supporting this. Most South Australians will be most unhappy with Senator Birmingham. He's, he's just allowing a rort to, to take place. For, and I, you know, I limit this to the companies that made profits uh, greater than the, the, the period over which uh, they claimed the JobKeeper. Uh, you know, from, the previous, uh, from the previous year. I'm not saying all companies were bad. And this bill does not seek to retrospectively do anything. All it does is says, please lay out what taxpayers uh, uh, gave to companies to assist them. That's all it's doing. And there can be no excuse for not supporting this. Even in, 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 uh, in, in the amendment uh, moving forward, where, where we're saying, as you pay money to companies moving forward, there ought to be disclosure about that money. I don't see you trying to carve order, out that part Senator of the amendment Patrick, and supporting it. Order, Senator Patrick, it being 11.15, the committee will now report progress. Thanks, Senators. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Is there notice? Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Just trying to get myself organised here. Um, Mr. President, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights and pursuant to Standing Order 78.1, I give notice of the committee's intention at the giving of notices on the next sitting day to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the committee's name for the 11th of August 2021, proposing the disallowance of the Social Security Parenting Payment Participation Requirements Class of Persons Instrument 2021 made under the Social Security Act 1991. 
On behalf of Senator Dodson and pursuant to Standing Order 78.3, I advise that, he, uh, uh, that Senator Dodson objects to the withdrawal of the notice of motion and asks that the notice stands in his name. So, pursuant to that advice uh, and notification, the motion now stands in the name of Senator Dodson. Senator Urquhart. Mr. President, on behalf of Senator Dodson, I also give notice of his intention to amend the notice of motion, proposing the disallowance of the Social Security Parenting Payment Participation Requirements Class of Act Persons Instrument 2021 as follows. After that, insert sections four and six of. And I also seek leave to make a short statement of less than a minute on behalf of Senator Dodson in relation to this matter. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. For the information of senators, Senator Dodson intends to amend the notice of the disallowance motion so that it relates to sections four and six of the instrument rather than the entire instrument. Sections four and six prescribe the class of persons subject to compulsory participation in Parents Next. The remainder of the instrument repeals an earlier instrument which prescribed a slightly different class of persons. Senator Dodson intends to amend the notice to ensure that those parts of the instrument which repeal that earlier instrument remain in force, so that no class of persons are prescribed as being subject to compulsory participation. Senator Dodson will move the notice as amended on the 11th of August 2021. This notification is to enable any other senator to take over the remaining provisions of the disallowance notice. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. If there are no other notices, I will then move to Senator Smith. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Thank you, Mr President. I present the eighth report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Smith. Is that the report be adopted? The question is the report be adopted. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, just clarifying in relation to that Treasury uh, Amendment Bill that that is going to the Environment and Communications Committee because I haven't got a copy of the amended reference, so I just want confirmation. I'll call Senator Smith by leave. Correct. Right, so there being no proposals to amend that, the, quest the question is that the motion moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr President. I move that the government business order of the day, as shown on today's order of business, be considered from 12.15 pm today, that the government business be called on after consideration of the bill listed in paragraph A and considered till not later than 1.30 pm today, that general business notice of motion number 1203 be considered during general business today and the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Amendment Waiver of Debt and Act of Grace Payments Bill be considered at a time for private, members, private senators' bills on Monday the 9th of August 2021. question is the motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I seek leave to move a mo motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator I'm, Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator O'Neill for 5 August for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Okay. Um, uh, are there any other matters before I call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions? The clerk. Uh, postponement notification has been received in relation to business of the Senate. Notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senators Rice and Carr for today, postponed until next Tuesday. I remind senators that question may be put at the request of any senator. It being none, so notified. Are there any other matters to be dealt with? If not, I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business. And I believe there are two matters to deal with. I will commence with 1199 in the name of Senator Watt. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1199 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, the motion is moved. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart, um, 1205. Thank you, Mr President. On behalf of Senator Keneally, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1205 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. 
Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 in relation to pay, parental leave and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 in relation to paid parental leave and for related purposes. Senator Urquhart. Um, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Leave granted. It is. Senator Urquhart. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It is. There being no messages or committee memberships, we'll return to government business, I believe. I'm not used to doing it this quickly, I must confess. Um, government business orders of the day to Clark. I will need a temporary chair to come forward to take the. Um, I'm, normally, I'm expected to be here for a bit longer. I thank Senator Chandler for taking the chair back. Apologies all. We are, um, the Chamber is considering the question that Senator Patrick's amendment be agreed to and Senator Patrick looks like he is seeking the call on that question once again. Yeah, look, I just want to just, uh, f finalise my, my remarks. You know, I'm really disappointed uh, with, uh, with the Finance Minister in, the, in regard to this. We need to understand that all of the money that has been funnelled from the taxpayer to the, uh, to the pockets of executives, to the uh, wallets of, uh, of investors or to the advertising companies who uh, are engaged by uh, Harvey Norman, uh, that this is money that wasn't sitting in a bank ready to spend. This is money that is deficit money. This is money that is to be paid for by my children and indeed your children, Senator Birmingham, and every uh, senator's children and every Australian's children. That's where this money is coming from, uh, and again, I don't, re I don't begrudge any company having received uh, uh, JobKeeper. Uh, this bill does not seek to take any money back. Uh, it, it does disclose, uh, it does call for the disclosure of what taxpayers' money uh, uh, companies did receive, and. Uh, then there will be many in the community that will look to find if there are any anomalies, and that may help in the recovery of money for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Chair. Chair, I, uh, I just wish to uh, particularly make um, one point clear, because anybody who listened to Senator Patrick's entire contribution uh, prior to the slight interruption to debate um, uh, would perhaps uh, forget that it was a requirement of the operation of the JobKeeper program that uh, every dollar paid uh, was paid to employees uh, under that program. Uh, that, uh, and Senator Patrick, I don't think I interrupted you once. I'm pointing out the facts as to how the program operated and the fact that it was a requirement. Indeed, uh, many uh, potentially part-time or casual employees uh, potentially received payments in excess of what their normal wages would be. Uh, that was a requirement uh, of the operation of the program. Uh, now, it's a fact, as I acknowledged, uh, that economic conditions uh, in some sectors recovered faster uh, than had been anticipated at the time. Uh, but I think the way in which Senator Patrick uh, framed a number of his remarks 
simply proves the point that, uh, that uh, this amendment is about being able to uh, pursue a pattern of uh, attacking and vilifying uh, certain companies uh, and, in doing so, attacking those who are providing uh, jobs and opportunities for many Australians and who have helped in our economic recovery, uh, which is so important to the economic future of the nation. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Patrick. Um, Senator Roberts. I don't know how to take that. <laughs> thank you, Madam. Thank you, Chair. Um, as in the Senate, we have the responsibility for looking after the review of the parliament. I would like to know some questions generally, in addition to um, supporting Senator Patrick on his desire for accountability and transparency. How long do you expect to keep these JobKeeper payments in place? Because you've sought in this legislation to extend it to 31 December 22. Minister. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Chair. Uh, Senator Roberts, um, well, JobKeeper itself is, uh, is no longer in operation. Um, what, uh, what is in operation now are two particular streams of, uh, of support. Uh, one are the COVID-19 disaster payments, uh, which are triggered uh, by a range of conditions being met in terms of a Commonwealth hotspot definition being in place, uh, restrictions being in place by a state or territory. Uh, and, uh, and they then uh, result in individuals who have lost more than eight hours of work as a result of those restrictions uh, being eligible for payments. Um, uh, the other stream of payments are the business support payments, uh, which, uh, which at this stage uh, are being delivered uh, by states and territories. Uh, this bill provides a legislative underpinning uh, for the Commonwealth to be able to deliver those payments if a state or territory has difficulty administratively being able to do so. Um, but at this stage, we don't anticipate needing to do that. However, uh, we think it is prudent to have uh, the terms there. Uh, it provides the contingency for, uh, for these arrangements to operate uh, through the remainder of this year and next year. Um, uh, it would not be the government's expectation uh, that, uh, that such programs will, will be necessary throughout that duration, uh, but we think that it is, uh, it is prudent, given the uncertainties we've seen uh, with the advent of the Delta strain, uh, to have those contingencies in place, and noting also the practicality uh, that the parliament will be interrupted uh, for the dissolution purposes of an election next year uh, at, uh, at some point as well, uh, which, uh, which means that uh, the timing uh, most logically works to, uh, to run through to that period of time. Equally, we note these are extraordinary measures and provisions, uh, which is why having a clear sunset uh, there uh, was also an important principle to, uh, to bring to the legislation. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Minister. How much do you think will be the total bill that will be spent from now till the, 30, till the 31st of December 22? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, Senator Roberts, uh, that, is, uh, that is something that, uh, that is very hard to estimate, that I'm not in a position to put uh, a figure on. Uh, it does depend upon the extent to which uh, lockdowns ultimately end up being necessary or other such restrictions uh, that trigger these sorts of payments. Uh, our hope is that, uh, is that uh, they will be uh, um, minimised as much as possible, and the modelling work of the Doherty Institute uh, and the uh, evidence and science that the government is seeking to follow seeks to put Australia in a position where we're able to continue to save lives and protect Australians uh, whilst, uh, whilst minimising the need for those restrictions as much as possible uh, over that timeline and to progressively get to a point uh, where the restrictions that would trigger these payments uh, become less and less likely. Senator Roberts. This, uh, the, the devastation economically since March last year has been not due to the COVID virus, it's been due to government restrictions. And they've been capricious and arbitrary and devastating and at times inhuman. Why is the federal government propping these up? Because the minister just mentioned a minute ago that we're, it depends, the total spending will depend upon lockdowns. Lockdowns in the United States, where we've got 50 states, show that those states that have had lockdowns, those states that don't have lockdowns, there's barely any difference in COVID performance. In fact, the governor of Florida, DeSantis, Governor DeSantis, apologised to the citizens of Florida after the first lockdown ended, and he ended it quickly. And he haven't had, hasn't had one since. And Florida is packed with aged people. 
We have also seen Deputy Premier John Barillaro in New South Wales within the last week admit that he doesn't know what the hell is happening in his government or in New South Wales with regard to lockdowns. The World Health Organisation has come out and said that lockdowns are a blunt instrument that need to be used carefully and only initially to get control of a virus. Does that mean, Minister, that state governments using lockdowns are not in control of their state? Because it certainly appears that way. Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Senator Roberts, for uh, for the questions. Um, uh, while uh, I may disagree with some of the analysis underpinning his questions, um, you know, their views that are held in parts of the community, it's important those questions uh, uh, have the ability to be openly asked. Uh, analysis shows that Australia's approach uh, to managing the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has saved the lives of around 30,000 uh, Australians uh, relative to the way it's been managed in other parts of the world. Uh, as a government, we think that uh, that saving of Australian lives has been worthwhile uh, and does justify uh, the extraordinary steps that have been taken. And we know those steps have involved sacrifice uh, by many people, uh, sacrifice uh, by individuals, by families, by households, by businesses uh, right across the country. Uh, and they have come at an enormous uh, cost, uh, particularly a fiscal cost. Uh, the economic cost in Australia has been real, uh, but in part has been uh, subdued uh, by the success of fiscal, monetary and other policy measures uh, that have helped businesses and households uh, through the pandemic. But the fiscal cost is, uh, is real and will leave uh, a legacy to be dealt with in, uh, in years to come. We acknowledge uh, all of those realities. Um, uh, of course, uh, in dealing with a global pandemic, we've also had to deal with a continuous uncertainty associated with that. Uh, we do not know, uh, as, uh, as a government, what necessarily comes next at every stage uh, because uh, COVID-19 uh, was unheard of uh, until the pandemic struck. Uh, the Delta variant was unspoken of until it struck this year. Uh, these are the different variables that, uh, that we uh, have had to respond to. Uh, and, uh, and the states and territories have had to respond to as well. Uh, but, uh, but, Senator, um, uh, at its heart, uh, we believe the Australian approach has enabled us uh, as a country uh, to save the lives of an estimated 30,000, despite the difficulties felt in some parts of the country, particularly New South Wales that you referenced at present. Uh, it is an approach that is continuing to save lives uh, whilst vaccines uh, are distributed across the country. Uh, the Doherty Institute modelling provides uh, a roadmap that enables us to see uh, how that progression of vaccine rollout uh, will get us to a position where we can, uh, with um, uh, less economically uh, and socially harmful restrictions, uh, be able to manage the pandemic in future uh, in a way that still saves lives uh, but doesn't have the same costs as have been felt to date. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I want to make it very clear, Chair, that One Nation wholeheartedly endorses the saving of lives. We also want to make it perfectly clear that One Nation is about data-based, evidence-driven policy. And we don't see that, and we haven't seen it in the last 18 months. Senator Birmingham rightly pointed out that when COVID arrived in this country, there was a lot of uncertainty. We all accepted that. I stood in this place, in this chair, in, in Monday, the 23rd of March, 2020, and said we acknowledge the uncertainty. We see tens of thousands of people dying in China, France, Italy, Spain. We know there's uncertainty. Therefore, we're waving it all through, and we wave the job saver through, we job seeker through. Then we wave job keeper through. We did that. What we've seen is state governments on rampant, capricious lockdowns for political purposes because they don't know what they're doing. Now, I want to highlight Taiwan. I raised Taiwan on Monday, the 23rd of March, 2020. And I pointed to Taiwan and said it has a, a fabulous testing, tracing and quarantining process. They don't lock down everyone. They lock down the sick and the vulnerable, protect the sick and the vulnerable. Taiwan, up until a few months ago, it ha while having a population roughly the same as ours—24 million, not our 25—in a tiny island close to China with an earlier ingress of the virus, had up until a few months ago 
lost seven lives. The significant thing is not only their health of their people, but their economy bubbled along without any, any interruption. Now, since then, they had a major breakdown in quarantine, and they've lost hundreds of lives, but, but still less than Australia, their, their economy, and they've recovered very quickly. They had a quick blip and back down again. Taiwan is managing the virus. The virus is managing Australia. And the federal government is at abandoning competitive uh, federalism and now introducing or reinforcing, it's already here, competitive welfareism. States are acting capriciously, sometimes for the electoral advantage in a, prior to an election, as is shown in Queensland, WA and Northern Territory. And as, as Mr Barillaro has admitted, they don't know what they're doing in New South Wales. We've had accusations all over the country that Dan Andrews, Premier Dan Andrews doesn't know what he's doing. Why is the federal government continuing to let these, to just spend money and let these premiers behave irresponsibly? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Bush Wilson. Thank you, uh, De De Acting Deputy President. I'd just like to get a few other things on record to the Australian Greens. Um, look, I can see what the government's trying to do here. Uh, they're trying to take some credit for something that they've done in the last 18 months. Because of this fiasco that this country has had to endure with the vaccine rollout, uh, they're in this place, in the federal parliament, trying to claim some credit. But I want to get it on record that this government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to bring in JobKeeper in the first place. Just as, by the way, they significantly resisted providing these payments to people in lockdowns around the country today that we're debating. It wasn't their first in inclination to protect the vulnerable. They had to be coerced into providing these payments. Now, Labor have put it on record that they were early adopters of uh, or proponents of a living wage. Uh, so were the Greens. I remember when Senator Cormann's first response, very first response to the stimulus package occurred. The Greens were very vocal, saying it wasn't enough. We needed a living wage style arrangement that we'd seen in other countries. And I also wanted to get it on record that it was the union movement working with Chamber of Commerces and a number of other business groups around this country, with the Greens and with Labor, that got JobKeeper in the first place. So claim all the credit you like, and good on the government for eventually listening and bringing in this much-needed scheme. Good on you for doing that. But don't come in here and claim credit for it when you didn't want to do it and you had to be dragged kicking and screaming there in the first place. In relation to uh, ex exemptions around these payments or changes to these payments to make sure that it wasn't rorted, may I also say that the Greens were the first to raise in the very first uh, COVID hearings we had uh, and in significant correspondence to Treasury that we wanted to see a scheme that didn't allow for share buybacks or CEO bonuses to be paid or dividends to be paid by big companies that were taking JobKeeper. That was also being looked at by other countries overseas very early on in the piece. So this is not a novel idea. This is something we've been fighting for since day one that JobKeeper was brought in. I think that's also very important to point out. And in relation to Senator Birmingham's confusing uh, messaging in here today around small business also being beneficiaries of JobKeeper and do you want to see their payments disclosed, there's a very important reason why the Greens in, a, in, in our legislation we've brought forward haven't wanted to include small business in this. And that is partnerships and many other small businesses as part of the income they pay uh, the partners in their businesses and the owners of very small businesses often don't take a wage. They often don't take a salary, or if they do, it's very low. They rely on uh, getting to the end of their year, if they're lucky, and making a profit, and then paying themselves out in that payment by the end of their terms or the end of their financial year. That's why uh, it's been very, it'd be very difficult to include small business and probably patently unfair to include small businesses uh, in these payments. So I just wanted to get that on record, Acting Deputy President. Um, this is a very important factor. Lockdowns—and Senator Roberts is right about one thing. 
uh, and that is just one this thing. just one thing, and that is that these payments, JobKeeper payments, and the payments we're seeing today have been brought in because of lockdowns. But unlike Senator Roberts, uh, the Greens feel that lockdowns quickly and rapidly are currently the best solution we have to getting on top of pandemics and protecting lives for all Australians. So we need to continue with this. Australians want to see uh, their politicians in this place working together to their advantage. They want to see us getting on top of a vaccine rollout. They want to see us getting on top of stimulus payments to keep them uh, so they can pay their bills, to pay their rent uh, in times of hardship. They want to see this parliament acting on the homelessness crisis. They want to see this parliament acting on public housing. They want to see this parliament acting on the, uh, the frightening increase that we've seen in house prices around this country uh, during this pandemic. Now, that's been caused for a lot of reasons, but there are so many Australians out there, especially young Australians and low-income Australians, that still haven't been able to get in the housing market. And we've got, a, I believe, an obligation to those Australians, just like we do to everyone else in this country, to tackle inequality and try and make this a fair place to live. Thank you, Senator Bush Wilson. Senator Roberts. Thank you. A further question on accountability in the Senate and in Parliament. Um, on Monday, the 23rd of March 2020, I said we would be waving it through in One Nation. We'd support the government because we, didn't, we had a lot of uncertainty facing the, the country. But I also said we would hold the government accountable. We expected the government to share data and we expected the government to come up with a detailed, comprehensive plan from start to end. We have not seen the data. We have not seen that comprehensive, detailed plan. Never. In Senate estimates, I asked for some data and that data was given to me afterwards. I asked, for, I asked if the chief medical officer and the Secretary of the Department of Health could verify seven components that would make up strategies for a plan, a comprehensive plan. They endorsed the seven that I listed. They listed one, in fact. They endorsed all seven, said there was nothing missing, there was nothing there that shouldn't be there. Yet we have seen the federal government acting in only one area and the state governments acting in one area, a different area. And we've seen the federal government funding that destructive action where the state governments are acting. Why is there no data on the, on the virus's severity or mortality and transmissibility not shared with the public? Why is it that the Chief Medical Officer and Department of Sec the Secretary for the Department of Health can provide me with the data that shows the COVID virus has high transmissibility but ranges from low to moderate severity? I asked them to compare it with other viruses in the past. Low to moderate severity. Why is it that the public is not given that data? Why is it that the government is not funding or not making sure that people have doses of ivermectin? Proven already. We are talking about Australia lagging now countries overseas. India, the state of Uttar Pradesh, has had remarkable success with ivermectin. It is now proven in the South Americas, proven in European countries. It's been recognised here in this country as safe. The Therapeutic Goods Administration approved it in 2013 for other, other diseases. We know now from medical papers, medical and scientific papers, that it is successful in treating COVID. So it is cheap, it is highly successful, it is safe and is it effective. Why is the federal government not doing that? Because we need to stop this waste of money on lockdowns. We need to recognise there are seven major strategies for a plan, a comprehensive plan, and the federal government is, is blowing money on one. Furthermore, why is the federal government not putting out data on the breakdown of the, of the small group of people who are vulnerable? We are told it's mainly the aged. We know that this virus kills. We know that some people, including Senator Patrick here, didn't even know they have it. It's asymptomatic. We know that some people, it's, many people, it's treated like a dose of the flu or a cold. We know that for others it can be lingering. We know that for some it can kill. 
But this needs a tailored approach based on data. We're not seeing that. We're just seeing buckets of money shoveled out there. We're seeing businesses in Queensland, small businesses, shut. Multinationals making out like bandits because of this lockdowns. So we need to see a, a, a measured response, a planned, a, a simple, comprehensive plan from the government. At least seven strategies. I'd like to come to a question on the data sharing. The tax office administers this scheme, Minister. Can you advise under what circumstances under other government departments would need to receive this information? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, the Minister. Uh, thanks, um, uh, thanks, Chair, and to, to deal with the question there at the end of Senator Roberts' contribution. Um, uh, the, uh, the administration of, uh, of the business grants uh, is, as I said in earlier remarks, currently being undertaken by different state and territory departments. Uh, in other circumstances, it's, uh, it's possible that, uh, that uh, administration or payment could be made through the different grants hubs, the industry grants hub or the grants uh, and, uh, and payment functions of Services Australia. Uh, so, uh, as I described, the, uh, the business grants provisions of this legislation uh, are a contingency. Uh, they're there to enable the Commonwealth to step in effectively, uh, and, uh, and the sharing of ATO information is about uh, ensuring that, uh, that uh, there's able to be a level of integrity applied that the ATO can uh, where such grants or payments are being potentially administered uh, by other agencies. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Is it the intention, Minister, of the government to maintain the administration function at the Australian Taxation Office, or are you moving this scheme to another department? And if so, will the Senate have scrutiny of the move should it occur? Minister. Uh, Chair, I, I refer Senator Robert to the answer I just gave. Um, uh, JobKeeper program has finished, and at this point in time, uh, the Commonwealth is not uh, paying business support grants directly from Commonwealth agencies uh, to businesses. Uh, we are uh, undertaking business support payments in a 50-50 cost-sharing arrangement uh, with certain states and territories, uh, but the, uh, the distribution of those grant payments is being undertaken uh, by those states and territories. Uh, this legislation provides the contingency but also uh, provides the capacity for us to help with the uh, integrity arrangements around those payments by states and territories. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Last question, Chair. Um, Minister, will this data be shared with Health, Department of Health, to deploy a rule that recipients must be vaccinated to receive a benefit? And will you rule out tying COVID income support to vaccination status? Minister. Uh, Chair, uh, Chair, the government has, uh, has no intentions uh, in relation to, uh, to uh, such linkages uh, at present. Uh, we're delivering income support uh, for people affected under the terms that I've outlined and, uh, and those eligibility criteria are publicly available. Uh, there is, uh, is no uh, intention to, uh, to tie those uh, income supports for, uh, for COVID disruptions to, uh, to vaccination status. Uh, our message in relation to vaccines is that people should get vaccinated uh, first and foremost, because it could save their lives, the lives of their loved ones, or the lives of their fellow Australians. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. Um, and I, uh, I do support this bill, but I do not support the lockdowns. But having locked down, we do need to provide people assistance. I, I did want to just—I don't want to delay the passage of the bill, but just wanted to ask the minister a couple of quick questions. Uh, firstly, um, has the government calculated the cost of each life saved uh, from? Uh, lockdowns, uh, and if so, what is that cost, and how does it compare to the um, to the uh, guidance note that is on the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet's website on the value of a statistical life? Um, that guidance note says that willingness to pay is the appropriate way to estimate the value of reductions in the risk of physical harm, known as the value of statistical life, and the uh, va that value is, is around five million dollars. I realise it's hard to to reduce things to a single number, but uh, if we didn't do this from time to time, we'd be all driving Volvos. Um, and the second question I've got uh, is: um, is um, uh, what is the um, the case fatality rate of the Delta outbreak in New South Wales, and how does that compare to the case fatality rate of the outbreaks last year in Australia? Thank you, Senator Canavan, Minister. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Chair, um, and thank you, Senator Canavan. I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of uh, modelling that attributes uh, a cost uh, per life lost in relation to, uh, or life saved in relation to, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in Australia to date. Uh, as indicated before, there are uh, credible estimates that around 30,000 lives have been saved as a result of the approach uh, that Australia has taken in successfully suppressing the spread of COVID uh, relative to many other countries uh, in the world. Uh, I'd note that, uh, that loss of life is not the uh, only health impact uh, of, uh, of COVID-19, uh, that, uh, that uh, there are studies indicating uh, longer term uh, or ongoing health impacts uh, from people, particularly those who have had more serious uh, cases of COVID-19 that would add to uh, the associated economic cost. Uh, I also note that uh, the various studies have been undertaken uh, indicating that in parts of the world that, uh, where COVID-19 has been allowed to spread uh, without um, uh, government restrictions or, uh, or the like in place, uh, there has still been a very significant economic cost uh, as individuals uh, have undertaken behavioural change due to the heightened risk of, uh, of COVID-19 and the threat and spread uh, that they've seen uh, in their communities. And so uh, it shouldn't be uh, assumed, and I know that, uh, that you wouldn't, Senator Canavan, uh, that, uh, that it is um, a path of uh, government restrictions imposing economic cost uh, or no restrictions uh, and therefore everything as it is as it would have been uh, had COVID not existed, um, uh, there are still associated costs beyond the loss of life uh, accrued due to the spread of COVID uh, because of those other health impacts, uh, because of those behavioural changes uh, that accrue. Um, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of comparisons uh, about uh, the severe uh, health impacts and loss of life uh, from the current spread of the Delta strain in New South Wales relative uh, to the Victorian outbreak of last year. Um, I, uh, it may be a little early to uh, be able to draw accurate comparisons in, uh, in that regard uh, from the New South Wales strain. Uh, I would note that, uh, uh, though, that, um, that uh, the Victorian uh, outbreak, uh, which, uh, which saw um, COVID-19 spread into aged care facilities, um, uh, resulted in significant and tragic loss of life in, uh, in some of those uh, facilities. Uh, the, uh, there does, despite the fact there have been some cases associated with aged care facilities in the New South Wales outbreak to date, uh, we're not seeing a similar pattern occur. Um, uh, that uh, that uh, would seem to uh, back other international uh, studies uh, showing the effectiveness uh, and efficacy of the vaccination uh, that has occurred in those residential aged care facilities, uh, which, uh, which um, appears to be providing uh, protection to loss of life there uh, and more generally across uh, particularly senior Australians, some 80 per cent of whom over the age of 70 have already had uh, their first vaccination. Thank you. Senator Birmingham. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Chair. As I said, I don't want to delay the Senate um, and I thank the Minister for, for the, that insightful answer. I, I, I did just want to put on the record here, and in, and in fairness to the government, the go this, this government, the federal government, is not the one imposing the lockdowns, um, um, but it is an indictment on state governments that they have not done or not been transparent about just simple calculations about how much this is actually costing um, the Australian people, especially those poorer than most of us in this place who have just had their income smashed, their ability to pay their bills gone, their mortgages at risk. Um, their relationships uh, sometimes destroyed. Um, there's an enormous cost of these things that's not being properly accounted for in the decision making that we are taking. Um, I can only do rough estimates, but because the modelling and tra transparency is not there. But the Burnett Institute this week, I know, a, a group who was in favour of lockdowns, but they es estimated that the lockdowns in Sydney have have prevented 4,000 coronavirus cases. The fatality rate in Sydney. Uh, has stabilised at about 0.4 per cent of cases in the last few weeks. So that would mean that this, these lockdowns have so far present, prevented 16 deaths. AMP estimate the lockdowns costing uh, sorry, $150 million a day. And at the time of the Burnett Institute modelling, um, they'd been, the, the lockdown had been going on, going on for 35 days. So that puts the cost at $5.3 billion for 16 avoided deaths. 
the cost of life saved is $330 million on those calculations. That is 66 times the figure that the federal government approves as the value of statistical life in this country. As I said before, it's very hard to reduce these things to numbers. But as someone who lives in a country area where we do not have the same health services as everywhere else, I understand very, very closely how we have to sometimes make trade-offs. Because we have, where I live, we have a five-year lower expected life in central Queensland than people who are born in Sydney. But I realise we can't have a hospital, a tier one hospital in Emerald, can't have cancer units all over remote Australia. We have to make choices about how we spend and allocate uh, public resources to health outcomes. We have to make choices. And right now we're ignoring these hard choices to the great cost, especially to those of us who do not have the luxury of a guaranteed income despite a lockdown occurring or not. That is a complete abrogation of our duty and what we should be doing through this crisis, especially given we do not have to bear any of the cost of these lockdowns at all. Any of the lockdowns at all. And just on just my final point on the fatality rates, um, and, I, and I thank the minister for his answer. He was right. He's absolutely right to say about the effectiveness of the vaccines. They're clearly effective uh, through this latest outbreak. Uh, because that fatality rate in Sydney is running at 0.4 per cent. It's stabilised in the last few weeks, so it's not increasing. It looks to be about the level, and that's consistent with uh, fatality rates for the Delta strain in other countries where vaccines are available. Last year, last year uh, the coronavirus cost or every infection led to uh, well, 3.2 per cent of Australians who got infected died. So last year, the fatality rate was three, case fatality rate was 3.2 per cent. During this last Sydney outbreak, is 0.4 per cent. So we hear a lot about the Delta strain being more transmissible and how it's how it's 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 you know we should all run for the hills apparently. And I do not question that. This is a much much more transmissible variant, and it's and it's tough to deal with for state governments. But clearly, clearly, there is also we should also let the Australian people know that the risk of dying from this strain now is much much lower. And it's not the strain. I just want to be careful. We're probably not the strain. We don't really know. Uh, the, the epidemiologists haven't made conclusions yet about exactly the fatality rates of Delta, the Delta strain, but almost certainly what is happening is what the minister outlined is that now that our most vulnerable are vaccinated, that almost everybody in aged care homes are vaccinated, we are not seeing the same fatal outcomes as we did last year. And so given that huge difference, the Delta strain is different, absolutely different. It's different because it's killing 90 per cent fewer people than it did than the coronavirus, the Alpha and original Wuhan strains did last year. And so with that difference, why are we deciding on the same costly policy decisions as we did last year? What we're doing is fighting the last war. And it's a common mistake of all governments that we always look back to, OK, that worked last time, so let's do it again. And I was supportive of the lockdowns last year. They did work. They were the right thing to do at the time. But it's a different war now, and we're applying the same costly responses despite the information and facts on the ground being totally different. We're just ignoring it. Because we, we are going along with the sheep and the public who just uh, 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 are wanting to obsess about coronavirus cases, not leading and saying this is what's happening on the ground, and we need to make sure we do not impose undue costs, especially on people that have, do not have the flexibility and options that those of us that have the luxury to work from home. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, Chair. I just, just wanted to um, say so I was a bit confused by Senator Canavan's contribution there. He, of course, talks about the obvious costs of lockdown that we all acknowledge, and I don't think there's any of us in this place that don't want to get out of lockdowns as quickly as we can. I think all Australians would agree with that. And he also talked about the effectiveness of the vaccine in reducing the death rates. Yet I did not hear him saying here today, I encourage all Australians to go out and get vaccinated. I didn't hear him say that at all in here today. But surely that is the logical thing we should be talking about and using this platform and the privilege we have as senators to encourage all Australians to go out there and get their vaccines. And if Senator Canavan wants to talk about numbers, then I would refer him to both the Doherty Institute report this week as well as the Grattan Institute report this week, which clearly modelled, which clearly modelled in extensive detail the number of deaths we would likely see in this country even on higher vaccination rates across different age cohorts, even outside of the most vulnerable. Tens of thousands of deaths, even at 70 to 80 per cent vaccination rates. So 
Senator Canavan might not care about those people, but I do, the Greens do, and I think most senators in here do. So it's fine to come in here and talk about lockdowns. We all agree we want to get out of them as quickly as possible. The pathway is before us. Get as many Australians vaccinated as possible so we can move beyond this bloody mess that is COVID, and we can try and get back to a semblance of normality in this country. The pathway is there. Let's all get behind it do what the Australian people want us to do and do our job and be leaders. I understand that Senator Hanson uh, wishes the yes. call. Senator Hanson, are you there? Yes, yes I am. Senator thank Hanson. you. Can you hear me? Yes, all good. All right, thank you very much. COVID has had a, a huge impact on people's lives and businesses, and we've actually had to pick up the pieces and learn as we're going along. It's been impacting on the Australian um, community for the last year and a half. It's cost us hundreds of billions of dollars from the government, propping up businesses and those that have lost their jobs, and it's still impacting to this day. We've seen border closures, state border closures, and yet the Prime Minister got up just more than a week ago, a little over a week ago, and said, your circumstances in your state will not change, be any worse off than what it is today. Well, less than 24 hours later, the Premier, Anastasia Palaszczuk, shut down the whole state in the southeast corner. Eleven local government authorities were shut down and people are actually in lockdown. You haven't got any cases of COVID in a lot of these areas. It is the southeast corner, mainly in Brisbane, that's been affected by it. But the Prime Minister says, we will, you will not be any worse off. Well, that didn't even last 24 hours. I believe that the Prime Minister lost control of the borders here in, in Australia, allowing the premiers to shut down at their whim. It has been up to the taxpayers of this nation then to prop up businesses, let alone the impact it's having on the mental, um, what it's dealing with people mentally, the impact it's on having on jobs, businesses are going under, and purely for the fact is you say about COVID deaths, yes, they are occurring, but we had more deaths from the flu than what we have from COVID in one year. For the government to actually push also, and they're talking about a vaccine passport, which actually concerns a lot of Australians, and I've had a lot of calls with regards to this. People don't want to be controlled by governments and told whether they can hold a job. And I have had it from, from people that are applied for government jobs and they will not, they are denied that job if they haven't had a vaccination. The people of Australia are concerned about having vaccinations purely for the fact is the government cannot give them any guarantee of the health repercussions it will have on them in two or five years down the track. These vaccinations have been rushed into our community for fear of the spread of a pandemic. If we give people the insurances, the government can't even indemnify the people who've had the vaccinations who have died from it, but we indemnify the companies that make it and we indemnify the doctors who give the vaccination. But we're not, we don't care about the people. People need assurances. And I remember that when we get, did medicinal cannabis to actually for production in Australia, I asked the health department then, would they allow it to come in from Israel and Canada in the interim until we start our own production? The answer was no, it's not tried and tested in Australia. We can't allow this into our community. Yet it had been in Israel for 20 years, proven in that country, it did not have an impact on the people. Yet we couldn't allow it into Australia, but we are giving a, a vaccination a vaccine to people in less than 12 months that's been out in the market. And we know of people that have been affected by the vaccination. What I would like to um, ask the, uh, the minister, in light of the billions of dollars that have gone out, hundreds of billions of dollars of propping up the, the um, these businesses throughout the country, and it's due to the premiers, just the whim of a hat, 
um, a few cases locking down the country. At what point are you going to actually take control and rein the, the premiers in from, stop, from stopping them from locking down the borders? Minister. Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I'll deal with Senator Hanson's question and, uh, and then quickly try just to deal with one or two other matters that she raised. Um, uh, the question in relation to, uh, to state actions around uh, lockdowns and border controls um, uh, is a reminder uh, that we operate in a federation where uh, the Commonwealth and states and territories have uh, constitutional functions and, uh, and also constitutional and legal rights. Uh, the Commonwealth has granted no additional or new rights uh, to the states or territories uh, during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, they have been exercising rights uh, that uh, they have uh, always held under, uh, under the Constitution uh, of Australia. Um, uh, now, of course, those, uh, those rights are subject uh, to, uh, to uh, testing through court or legal processes, but the Commonwealth does not act as, uh, as um, police or watchdog on the states or territories. Um, uh, they, uh, they have those rights. However, through the Doherty Institute modelling uh, and the work in having that presented to the National Cabinet, what we have sought to do uh, is, uh, is uh, provide information, education, understanding and, uh, and to uh, move towards agreement and consensus uh, around the fact that under all circumstances they are currently known and understood uh, as the current vaccine rollout progresses, uh, states and territories should be able to step away uh, from widespread lockdowns, uh, wide-scale lockdowns and restrictions. Uh, from uh, the use of border restrictions uh, and progressively uh, move to much more targeted approaches such as the testing, tracing, isolating regimes uh, that, uh, that are envisaged in the Doherty modelling. Uh, I want to very quickly um, deal with uh, vaccine matters that, uh, that uh, Senator Hanson raised as well uh, to emphasise that uh, the vaccines approved for use in Australia, uh, the, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, both have gone through the therapeutic goods administration processes in Australia, normal processes, not expedited like they were in some parts of the world, uh, but the normal processes to, uh, to assure uh, Australia of safety in relation uh, to those vaccines. Um, uh, the efficacy of those vaccines proving to be very strong, uh, that uh, having uh, two doses of, uh, of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine estimated to reduce mortality among those who, uh, who contract COVID-19 by 92 per cent. Um, and for those who have two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, estimated to reduce mortality in the event of contracting COVID-19 by 90 per cent. Both highly effective vaccines, both safe, uh, both that Australians uh, should embrace and use. Uh, in relation to indemnities provided uh, to vaccine manufacturers uh, and to those who administer the vaccines, uh, those indemnities are not about providing money uh, to the company or to the doctor. Uh, they are about ensuring that in the very rare instances uh, of there being an adverse reaction uh, to the vaccine, uh, the government uh, will provide uh, support uh, for individuals who face those rare consequences rather than individuals uh, having to go and sue uh, the doctor or sue the company. Uh, the government will make sure that assistance is there. Minister, Se Senator like Hanson. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, the rights of the residents and under section 117 of the Australian Constitution that says the subject of the Queen resident in any state shall not be subject in any other state to any disability or discrimination, which would not be equally applicable to him if he were a subject of the Queen resident in such other state. So basically, what my, my term, how I interpret this, is that if people in one state are being treated totally different to another, therefore you're in lockdown, it is different to others in other states. So if you state that you know, the federation, the states can do what they want to do, it is up to the, the federal government's responsibility under the constitution to allow the rights of the individuals in those states, freedom of movement in their states, because they're being treated totally different to any other person in another state. Um, whether you want to respond to that one. But um, what I'd also like to ask is that these businesses that have been paid out a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they actually have been found, they weren't 
eligible for that funding. Why has the government not pursued them to refund that money? As I uh, assume that um, that Harvey Normans have refused to actually pay back that money. Minister. Uh, Chair, thanks, Senator Hanson. Um, uh, neither you, Senator Hanson, nor I are constitutional lawyers, but uh, um, my um, very quick interpretation of, uh, of Section 117, uh, which I'm not sure to what extent it's being tested by the courts, uh, but would be that uh, the Commonwealth uh, would, uh, would not uh, impose uh, discrimination uh, or disability uh, on residents of one state uh, that is not equally applicable across all states. Uh, the decisions in relation to lockdowns and restrictions are undertaken by independent states. Uh, they have their own sovereign rights. Um, uh, their limitations are only, uh, in terms of legislation, are only to the extent that the Commonwealth has power in certain areas. Uh, in, uh, in relation to uh, JobKeeper, of which I have answered a, a number of questions uh, very similar to the one that you've asked, Senator Hanson, um, as, uh, as I've outlined to others, uh, JobKeeper was a highly effective program at the time. At the time it was put into place, as, uh, as I'm sure you would recall, uh, there was uh, enormous uncertainty as businesses right across Australia were being forced to close their doors uh, in every state and territory. Um, businesses such as the one you mentioned were having those restrictions uh, placed upon them, uh, and JobKeeper was put in place to provide certainty uh, to avoid the standing down of staff at the time and to provide, uh, to provide support. Uh, thankfully, uh, Australia's success meant the economy recovered faster, some of those restrictions were eased faster, uh, and as a result, some of those businesses didn't suffer all of the worst consequences that had been envisaged at the time. Uh, but it avoided and, avoided and it saved the lockdowns at the time. Um, the government has uh, subsequently, through the life of JobKeeper, uh, tightened eligibility and requirements around its operation, uh, and then following JobKeeper, we now have an even more targeted program in place to provide economic support for Australians. Senator Hanson. Thank you. Minister, you didn't answer my question. They, yes, we paid it out to keep businesses open, those people who actually were stood down from their jobs. Harvey Norman wasn't wanting them. Actually, he's boasted the fact he's had his biggest year ever was during the COVID year. The fact is that he was paid that. It's proven that he had huge amounts of profits, as other companies have done. You have not pursued them for a refund of the money so they were overpaid back to the taxpayers. Will you be pursuing this money that's owed back to the taxpayers? Minister. Chair, um, the companies in question were not overpaid. Uh, they were eligible under the rules of the program as they operated at the time. Uh, we tightened those rules subsequently, uh, as, as I indicated, but uh, they were not overpaid in the terms that, uh, that you put, Senator Hanson. It is correct that a number of companies have voluntarily chosen uh, to, uh, to make repayments. We welcome that. We encourage it where it's appropriate from companies, and we think it's the honourable thing to do. Sen uh, Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. I just want to follow up on a question from uh, Senator uh, Roberts. It was a good question about about the cost of this uh, of the measures under this bill. I can't imagine Treasury has not modelled a maximum cost. I can't imagine that Treasury hasn't looked at the current uh, lockdown statements by the New South Wales government, for example, and uh, looked at the cost associated with uh, that particular lockdown to at least give us a minimum. So just the question is, are you, uh, I, I, firstly, just to confirm, Treasury is actually keeping a tab on this, and what are those uh, minimum and maximum costs? It being 12.15, the committee reports progress. The committee reports progress. Clark. Government Business orders of Order of the Day number four, National Health Amendment Decisions under Continents AIDS Payments Scheme Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will be brief on this. Uh, the purpose of the National Health Amendment Decisions around the Continents AIDS Payments Scheme Bill 2021 is to provide express support for the Continent AIDS Payments Scheme caps to confer review functions on the AAT. The bill amends the Act to provide that a legislative instrument made under section 12 of the Act may provide that applications may be made to the AAT for review of decisions made in exercise of powers confirmed by, 
conferred by the instrument. The minister may, by this instrument, formulate a continence aids payment scheme under which the Commonwealth makes payments as a contribution towards the cost of buying products to help manage incontinence. Under existing arrangements, the continence aids payment scheme, an annual or six monthly payment, is available to people five years of age and over who suffer from permanent and severe incontinence caused by particular kinds of conditions specified in the instrument. These payments help offset the cost of purchasing continence products from the participating person's supplier of choice. On 16 January 2021, the CAPS instrument was amended to provide that persons and organisations affected by these decisions of the Secretary could apply for internal merit review or, following internal review, independent merits review of that initial review decision by the AAT. The bill amends the Act to make it clear on the face of the Act that the legislative instrument establishing the CAPS can provide the AAT review of decisions provided for in the instrument and that, and that are not already covered by sections 14 and 15 of the Act. It's a sensible administrative reform that should improve accountability and, as such, Labor commends the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Uh, Minister? Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I, I apologise. Well. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I would like to make a short contribution to the National Health Amendment decisions under the Continents AIDS Payment Scheme Bill 2021. The bill makes important changes to the Continents AIDS Payment Scheme, otherwise known as PAPS. PAPS is an annual or six monthly payment available to people who suffer from permanent and severe incontinence. This bill allows people to apply for an um, internal review or go to the AAT for decisions made by the Secretary under the scheme. One in four people in our communities are affected by incontinence. Incontinence affects women, men and children of all ages, phys a physical ability and background. The impacts of incontinence are far reaching and can affect a person's physical, mental and emotional health and wellbeing. People who experience incontinence can suffer from shame, fear and anxiety. Older Australians are particularly impacted by incontinence. Incontinence is, a severe, is an intensely and severely personal and often stigmatising condition that requires time and the right skills to manage appropriately. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety received a range of evidence on the prevalence and management of incontinence in residential aged care facilities across the country. The commissioners were disturbed to hear that 71 per cent of people in residential aged care have experienced incontinence. Negative effects of incontinence can include increased risk of depression, reduced quality of life and increased risk of pressure industries and infections. Evidence presented to the Royal Commission also indicated that some residential aged care providers unintentionally contribute to incontinence by adopting flawed approaches to its management. The Commission has also heard that aged care workers often do not have the time, um, that, uh, the time needed to assist residents to go to the toilet in a timely manner and incontinence pads are used to manage the workload. This is especially concerning given the number of people in residential aged care within, with incontinence is expected to almost double from 129,000 to over a quarter of a million people by 2031. These factors drive up aged care costs significantly. The estimated direct expenditure on incontinence was $1.6 billion in 2009, with 83% 83 of this on residential aged care. It is not clear if any of the aged care funding provided in the 21-22 budget will be allocated to improving continence care and management as part of the government's aged care reform agenda. The Continents Foundation of Australia has commissioned the National Ageing Research Institute to develop and test a best practice model for continence care for residential aged care. The model specify, specifically addresses recommendations within the Royal Commission's final report and provides a clear strategy to ensure quality continence care and management. We can improve the quality of life for people in aged care significantly and we can do it now and in both now and into the future, if people receive the best continence care. Prioritising continence care and support will improve the health, wellbeing and dignity of all people living in aged care. I call on the government to implement a best practice model of continence care for residential aged care in Australia and make sure that the funding that was uh, 
given and allocated in the budget, this year's budget, is also spent on continence care. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thank senators for their contributions and commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you. The question is that the uh, bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Health Act to 1953 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment, COVID-19 Economic Response Bill number two, uh, 2021. Resumption in Committee of the Whole. The committee is considering the Treasury Laws Amendment, COVID-19 Economic Response number two, Bill 2021, and the amendment moved by Senator Patrick. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? No. I think that the ayes have it. No. The noes have it. The noes have it. A division is required. Please ring the bells.
stop the bells? Are the whips ready? Yeah. So the question is that the amendment is moved by Senator Patrick, number one on sheet 1352, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being uh, 16 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, I understand Senator Patrick had some further questions. I'll just allow people to get back to their spots. He's running it. He's running it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's get a photo. If senators could please uh, leave the chamber quietly, that would be appreciated. I understand that, Senator Patrick, you have the call. Thank you, uh, uh, um, Mr Chair. Uh, I um, would really just want to um, get an answer to the question I asked uh, prior, to, uh, the, uh, prior to us going to non contro uh, So the question, just to remind the minister, is uh, firstly, is Treasury modelling in a dynamic sense the events that are taking place? Have they modelled maximum and minimums? Uh, if so, what are the minimum costs associated with this bill and what are the maximum costs associated with this bill? Thank you. Senator Patrick. Uh, Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Chair. Uh, look, uh, in terms of um, uh, the framing Senator Patrick has put of, uh, of minimum and maximums, uh, I'm not aware that, uh, that estimates have been put in, uh, in those terms. Uh, I will uh, commit to uh, bringing to, uh, to the Chamber and, uh, and to Senator Patrick's attention any further information I can provide on that. Uh, the uh, current estimated cost of, uh, of the uh, support for New South Wales and the lockdown occurring in New South Wales uh, with the uh, flow of COVID-19 disaster assistance payments uh, and the business support payments uh, in partnership with the New South Wales Government uh, is running at about $750 million a week. Um, uh, so, uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, we can see the ongoing cost there. Uh, obviously, um, the costs vary significantly across state to state, uh, as we've seen from uh, the duration of lockdowns like South Australia's lasting only one week, uh, Victoria's a few weeks, and the uncertainty of situation in, uh, in Queensland. So um, uh, it is very hard to, uh, to really accurately put an estimate uh, on the cost of, uh, of current supports, uh, given uh, given their relationship to uh, the uncertainty around uh, around uh, uh, spread of the Delta variant, uh, where there may be um, uh, um, outbreaks and uh, and the duration that uh, the restrictions remain in place. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, commitment, uh, uh, Minister. And I don't intend to uh, hold hold you up any longer. But just as you come back with information, it might simply be a case of that uh, you know, under the new measures, it might be uh, uh, this sort of number for New South Wales, this sort of number for Victoria, or some whatever metrics you have, 
that would guide um, that, that you're using internally to guide your own uh, decision making, uh, that would be uh, useful. Minister. Oh, uh, thank, thanks, Senator Patrick, and, and noted. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Minister, you've mentioned the Doherty modelling quite a few times. Um, what is the relationship between the Doherty modelling and the UK modelling associated with Niall, Neil Ferguson? Um, why did the government initially talk, all the governments talked about flattening the curve? We saw the modelling results from New Zealand uh, early last year, and that showed the major peak levelled or decreased, and then subsequent peaks after that. We didn't see that with Australia. We saw a rise and a flatten, and that's it. Um, we've since, since seen that the New Zealand approach is far better than the, what we believe is the Doherty modelling on which the government gave us those graphs. It seems that there's no costing to the Doherty models, no opportunity costing to the Doherty models, no alternatives considered to other strategies. Especially this is significant when we see that lockdowns are proving to be ineffective. Is there any modelling on the health consequences for future health, putting off current problems because people are afraid to travel? Any, con any costing of the suicides? Any costing of the other health impacts and psychological impacts from, what is, what, what, from the trauma being inflicted by state governments? Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Chair. Look, I mean, there's, as always uh, in Australia, there are, rum, there are a range of uh, academic think tank and other uh, institutions that undertake uh, modelling on all types of, uh, of different scenarios, um, and, uh, and indeed some of those uh, that you raise may well be the case. Uh, it is our government's desire to see uh, Australia get to a point uh, where extensive, widespread, prolonged lockdowns and restrictions uh, can be uh, minimised, brought to an end and become a thing of the past. Uh, that is why we asked for the Doherty Institute modelling uh, to help guide us and the states and territories uh, who have those uh, constitutional powers in relation to, uh, to uh, the application of medical orders in, uh, in their jurisdictions. Um, you know, that modelling uh, has drawn on um, uh, the scientific knowledge uh, and the evidence uh, that those researchers have used uh, from, uh, from the outbreaks in Australia and elsewhere around the world. Um, uh, it is accompanied by uh, Treasury modelling, uh, and the Treasury modelling uh, does include consideration of, uh, of costs of, uh, of some different scenarios, uh, and indeed the types, as I indicated to Senator, Can Senator Canavan before, uh, of behavioural change uh, that we see from people where widespread outbreaks occur, even if you don't have uh, restrictions in place, uh, which also result uh, in very significant, uh, significant costs. Um, uh, and so, uh, so I draw uh, Senator Roberts' attention to, uh, to uh, those elements of the Treasury modelling as, uh, as an accompanying element uh, to, the, uh, to the Doherty modelling. Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you. Minister, one final question. In the absence of data, Fear and rumour can run rampant. We've seen state Labor governments, not the Berejiklian government, because it already had an election before the COVID scare, but the state Labor governments have used fear to increase their vote. And that's what happens under fearful circumstances. The incumbent government increases its vote. People in the, in the constitu in constituency are asking, is the federal Liberal National Government preying on people's fear and keeping this alive, keeping the fear alive. Is that uh, in play right now? Because you are facing the next election. Minister? Uh, emphatically, no, Chair. Uh, our government would like nothing more uh, than for COVID-19, the threats it poses uh, and the, uh, the costs it imposes to be a thing of the past. Uh, but the reality is uh, they're not. Australians have made enormous sacrifices uh, over the uh, last 18 months uh, to get us through this pandemic and to save the lives of their fellow Australians. Uh, I thank Australians—individuals, families, households, businesses, 
healthcare workers, uh, service providers right across this country uh, who have made sacrifices that have saved the lives of an estimated 30,000 fellow Australians. Uh, as we enter uh, the final stages of, uh, of hopefully managing this pandemic, uh, as we get to the point where we're seeing uh, now some 42 per cent uh, of Australians over the age of 16 having had at least their first dose of vaccine, uh, as we see around 80 per cent of Australians over 70 having had at least their first dose of vaccine, uh, and from that can have confidence that Australians will undertake widespread uptake uh, of the vaccine. We not only thank them, uh, but it's appropriate to reassure them that we're not going to blow the sacrifices of the last 18 months uh, midway through uh, the vaccination program uh, and, uh, and cause unnecessary loss of life. Uh, we are going to make sure uh, that we see it through uh, and get to the point where Australia, informed by evidence such as that from the Doherty Institute, uh, can reopen uh, safely uh, in a way uh, that allows us to bank those dividends that have seen Australia not only save lives but also uh, keep our economy uh, as one of the strongest in the world uh, throughout uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Roberts. I, I did want to respond to that and ask another question in, in light of what the minister has raised. When an organisation, an entity, whether it be a, a charity or a business or a council or a government, has a plan, the beauty of a plan when it's based on objective data is that if the circumstances change, the plan can be changed. I've already discussed earlier on and raised with the minister the seven strategies needed to be part of a comprehensive plan. This federal government has done partly one, is now pinning all its hopes on another. The state governments are pinning their hopes on one, being lockdowns, and waiting for the federal government to keep propping them up. That leaves the other four strategies untouched, yet the Chief Medical Officer and the Department Secretary for the Department of Health have verified that those seven strategies are needed in a comprehensive plan. The health the future health of Australians depends upon our economy. Taiwan has done a marvellous job. Despite one breach in quarantine, they've quickly recovered. Australia is limping along on two basic strategies, leaving another five ignored. When will we see a comprehensive plan? When will we see accountability against that plan, a real plan that says what is going to happen who is going to be responsible, when will it be done, where will it be done, what will be done and how will it be done, rather than just putting all our hopes on vaccines. I am concerned about the future economic security of this country, the future health of Australian citizens as well as the current health. There are better ways of looking after the current health. There are certainly better ways of looking after the future health. When will we see a comprehensive detailed plan? Minister? Uh, Chair, very briefly. Uh, I'm not aware of the, uh, the different strategies that Senator Roberts says he, uh, he um, uh, took uh, health officials through last year, uh, but I will go back and, uh, and check the hands hard to, uh, to familiarise myself with those issues that you raised, Senator Roberts. Um, uh, as a government, uh, we have outlined uh, a plan for the different stages of reopening. Uh, it uh, does uh, rely not just upon uh, vaccines. Uh, but also relies upon um, you know, continued appropriate uh, management strategies uh, for COVID-19 uh, that, uh, that are designed to ensure uh, that our shared concerns for the economy and health of Australians uh, achieve the optimal outcomes. The question before the chair is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Can say no. The ayes the bill as amended be agreed to? I'll put it, that question again. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question is now that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Law's Amendment, COVID-19 Economic Response No. 2 Bill 2021 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Question is that the motion of the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. 
I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those with that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to provide an economic response and deal with other matters relating to the coronavirus and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Charges Bill 2021 and a related bill. Resumption of the debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator McKim. Minister. We haven't started this yet. No. Okay. Um, so you'd like me to table this first? Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, Senator Patrick, were you seeking the call? Bring attention to the state of the chamber. Um, is quorum present? There not being quorum. Ring the bells. One more? No. <laughs> Ninety. Quorum is present. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, can I firstly thank? Uh, members who spoke on these two bills um, during the second reading debate. The, the Tertiary Education and Quality Standards Agency Bill 2021 creates a new annual charge that will be levied on all registered higher education providers to recover the cost of Texas sector-wide regulatory oversight activities. The Tertiary Education Quality and, Safety, uh, Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Cost Recovery Bill 2021 amends the Texas Act to enable the annual charge to be collected from providers. During the debate today and, uh, and on other days, those opposite raised cuts to higher education funding, which is simply not true. We are providing record funding to Australian universities, $20.4 billion in 2021. This is up 17 per cent from the $17.3 billion that was provided in 2019. This includes an additional $1 billion boost to support university research, which is flowing to universities this year. Under our Job Ready Graduates package, more, than, more Australians are studying at our universities than ever—802,000 this year compared with 763,000 last year, a 5 per cent increase. Commencements of new students are up 7 per cent. Importantly, more Australians are studying the courses that are more likely to get them a job. Commencements are up 14 per cent in science, 13 per cent in IT, 10 per cent in engineering, 14 per cent in agriculture, 11 per cent in education and 8 per cent in health. Thanks to our record investment and reforms, Australian universities are in a better than expected financial position. There are a number of indications that 2020 outcomes were better than anticipated 12 months ago. Universities Australia estimate total revenue reductions in 2020 compared with 2020, uh, 2019 to have been about $1.8 billion, or about 5 per cent of the 2019 total revenues, which is slightly below the lower bounds of UA's 2020 estimated range of possible re revenue reductions. 
The media has universities indicating better than expected results. For 2020, universities are reporting surpluses. For instance, Monash reported a surplus of $259 million, the University of Melbourne $178 million, the University of Queensland $83 million, University of Western Australia $58 million, uh, University of Adelaide $41 million, Flinders University $35 million, Edith Cowan University $24 million, University of Southern Queensland $13 million and Western Sydney University $13 million. Our boost to research funding ceases in 2021-22, which accounts for the decrease in higher education funding as shown in budget paper number one. This was not a bring forward, it was a new one-off stimulus. The figures in the budget papers include the higher education loan program outlays, including help outlays, shows that the government's overall funding to universities in 2021 is $20.4 billion, which is an increase in on 37 per cent since 2013. TEXA is currently consulting stakeholders on its future cost recovery arrangements. Following consideration of stakeholder feedback and passage of these bills, the calculation method for the annual charge will be set by regulation. I thank all members for their contribution on this debate and I commend the bills to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question before the Chair is that the second reading amendment moved. Senator Pratt, were you seeking the call? Uh, yes, I just wanted to clarify um, this, uh, getting, grabbing a copy of the second reading amendment um, before me because. Thank you. This is the second reading amendment on sheet 1331. And, uh, just can you um, ascertain for me, please, uh, Acting Deputy President? I spoke to the bill substantively, but can I speak to the second reading amendment separately? Mm. Okay. Senator Pratt, you have the call. Thank you very much. I wanted to acknowledge the Labor Party's support for the Greens' second reading amendment because I support the fact that the Greens are putting pressure on the Morrison government in order to stave off the relentless attacks that they have made on the higher education sector. I support the sentiment that there has been a, a uh, significant pattern within this government of defunding the higher education sector and shifting the costs of providing higher education away from the Commonwealth. A significant burden of this in the changes that the government made have fallen on students. And this has been to the detriment of um, students and indeed many industries across Australia. And I have a simple and significant example that came out of conversations at the state government's recent skills summit in Western Australia, where I was talking to uh, employers who are desperately looking for engineers and technicians for the mining industry and also were worryingly concerned about the decision of the University of Western Australia to abandon the anthropology courses that they currently uh, provide. Now, universities are making rational decisions based on the funding parameters that they were given in order to uh, they're making rational decisions to change their composite of courses based on the Commonwealth's new funding system. So universities like West UWA made a decision to cease offering anthropology <laughs> courses. Now I know this government likes to denigrate arts uh, and humanities courses and have seen them not as a priority. Uh, Hence, the massive fee increases which they indicated should provide a price signal to students to steer them away from those courses. Well, it not only steers 
those students away from those courses. It steers them away from uh, universities, from even offering those courses. So in that context, we now have the University of Western Australia abandoning its anthropology courses, and there are many students protesting about that. But you know, as I talk to mining industries, they were telling me significantly how critical anthropology is for their native tidal clearances, and that that is key to resolving the native tidal issues um, and working with and working with uh, universities that produce graduates that can work closely with First Nations communities to resolve Indigenous heritage issues. So that is critically important. Courses like anthropology, where students received a massive fee hike, a massive fee hike, uh, where their charges have more than doubled. Students used to pay uh, around six and a bit thousand dollars, and they'd get about the same from the Commonwealth. And now they get 1,600 or so in Commonwealth subsidies, and they have to pay the difference. They have to pay about fourteen and a half thousand dollars per year in fees. Now that is what then leads to decisions by uh, universities like UWA to abandon their anthropology courses. Courses that the mining industry, indigenous communities, rely on students with these qualifications in order to be able to um, resolve complex and important issues that enable our country to be productive, but also enable uh, respect and integrity for indigenous culture and heritage. But you know what else they went on to say? They said that, in effect, the lowering of the course price for engineering, where, yes, the government increased the contribution to four courses like engineering, but not as much as they cut out of the system overall. Even though so students were paying less because their fees are capped, but in effect, because the government's contribution was also lower, it capped the overall funding for engineering places within institutions. Universities couldn't raise extra revenue for those courses in order to um, uh, fund those courses. Now they're expensive courses to run. So what this has meant, in effect, is rather than a greater supply of engineers, is that we have seen universities cap the number of engineers that they are able to graduate, that they are planning for. And as a result, we are forecasting a shortage of engineers and engineering uh, graduates that are so critical to our economy. So this is just such a critical example of what is a worrying continuation of the government's larger pattern of defunding the higher education sector, shifting the costs of providing higher education away from the Commonwealth and onto students. So I put forward that telling example today as a really um, important example of the problems that institutions are facing today. And in the context of this legislation, which is about cost shifting again from uh, the Commonwealth onto students, we see again how ill-founded this is, particularly at the time of uh, the COVID stresses that so many university campuses are faced with at the moment. We have seen a massive collapse in international student uh, enrolments as a result of COVID travel restrictions, and rightly so. And again, it reinforces the fact that this is not the time to be moving 
the cost burden of providing higher education away from the government. Now, Labor very much supports reasonable and practical measures to recover the costs of regulation. But as we see at this particular point in time, the stresses that are experienced by higher education providers who've lost some 17,000 uh, members of their workforce and on small education and training providers who are affected by lockdowns, by uh, changes in class sizes, by the move to having to provide coursework online, uh, which creates a huge shift for them. Uh, and I think it's unreasonable for the government at this time to be shifting the cost burden onto, um, onto those providers. Now, what we also see in this context is that inevitably that will mean a cost shift onto students. And I note significantly that the government did a good thing in giving a reprieve for students um, from the 20 per cent loading in debt that you have if you do your VET course through a private institution. That's a 20 per cent loading uh, that, until this point in time, students have had to pay if they've accessed private education and needed a loan for it, a 20 per cent uh, interest rate, which simply uh, uh, goes straight to, in effect, an uh, interest rate profit for the government on having loaned students that money. Now, frankly, I know it's 20 per cent over the lifetime of paying it off, but if you're going to pay it off fairly quickly, I would see it being an unreasonable interest rate, given interest rates are so low at the moment. And in effect, this is paused at the moment, which is a good thing, but this government has made no commitment to removing it altogether. No commitment to removing it altogether. So what happens when a private institution has to pass the fee increases uh, on to their students so that they can meet the costs of that regulation? so that they can meet the cost of that regulation? Well, students will be paying interest on the costs of regulation, on the costs of the government regulating their course. That is manifestly unfair and unjust and should not be happening. So I call on the government in the context of that cost burden where they've so proactively moved costs onto students to think about that 20 per cent uh, loading that they've got uh, currently in place for student debt, and I call on them to abandon, them, abandon that permanently. It is simply not compatible with, this, uh, with the principle of cost recovery, because what you are doing here is not cost recovery. It will be cost recovery mm -hmm. plus okay. plus. It will be cost recovery plus 20 per cent. That's shifted on to the burden uh, of student repayments. This is an appalling state of affairs that the government has been so thoughtless in what it has subjected uh, ed the education sector here in our nation to, what it has subjected students to right around the country. The way that it has shifted that cost burden on to students has been nothing short of appalling in that context. And I note in that sense uh, students at the University of Western Australia who enrolled in anthropology courses, who enrolled uh, before that more than 100 uh, per cent fee hike took place, where the fees have doubled. But they thought, yes, I'm really committed to doing an anthropology course, only to find out, as a result of this government's changes, that their anthropology course is going to disappear altogether anyway. So the government has sucked that uh, $14,500 for that enrolment this year out of those students' pockets. It's literally sucked it out of their pockets 
because universities are now having to make these decisions on the fly because they inherited this model of government funding they inherited this model of government funding after after uh, students had enrolled in their courses so for those reasons the labor party is very happy to support the greens motion and now I just wish to clarify that the second reading has actually concluded with the minister's contribution. The ruling I made earlier, I've had advice revised that Senator Pratt should not have been allowed to speak. I let you finish, Senator Pratt, um, as I let you start. So, but um, the debate was concluded with the minister's contribution. Uh, Uh, all right, with leave, the minister is seeking to respond. Is leave granted? The, the, the question before the chair is that the second reading, amend, sorry, uh, second reading amendment moved by Senator Faruqi uh, be agreed to. That is the amendment on sheet 1331. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. Appreciate the Senate's understanding for the whips there. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Chisholm tell off the ayes and Senator Smith tell off the nose. The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 15. The matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now put the second reading. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, then those to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith tell off the ayes and Senator Chisholm tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 14, noes 12. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to impose registered higher education provider charge and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act 2011 and for related purposes. Uh, is there a wish for a committee stage on this bill? There is. Thank you, Senator Rest. So, is it, is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask, in the context of this uh, legislation, if the government has considered uh, even delaying its implementation so that the impact of con uh, COVID is more understood on the sector to which these fees will be imposed, or if it hasn't, uh, whether it has assessed properly the impact on training organisations and whether private smaller organisations might be put out of business. Oh, sorry, Minister. Thank you, <laughs> Chair. Uh, uh, we continue to assess uh, the situation. We are in constant communication with the higher education sector. We have uh, assured them and guaranteed them of their fees until the end of the calendar year 2021. And after that, the situation will be reassessed as appropriate with the situation uh, that we find ourselves in at the time. Senator Pratt. Uh, so this bill is for cost recovery. Are you saying that even though purportedly we're voting for cost recovery today that the government's not going to implement the provisions of the bill? I'm somewhat confused. Minister. Uh, so the intention is that the bills uh, will uh, begin in January 2022, but we will continue to monitor from that time. Senator Pratt. Okay, so in monitoring the situation at the beginning of 2022, will it be cost recovery at commencement? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, it will be. However, we've staged the fee recovery uh, by 50 per cent. Is it sorry? 20 per cent in the first. 20% in the first year, 50% in the second, and then, and then full fee uh, paid by 2024. Uh, Senator Pratt. So how is that consistent with monitoring if that is already set out in the schedule of the legislation as the government's approach? Uh, we can see that that will have a substantial impact on in particular smaller providers what is the increase for what is the 
approximate calculation of that fee for, um, for example, a small training institute with 100 for uh, 100 students, if it's a culinary school or something like that. Can you give me some cost estimates of what the current fees are and what um, the fees are projected to be uh, for each of those years by the type of course and the size of the student cohort? Minister. That's not information I have in front of me, Senator, so I take that on notice. But what I can say is that the structure of the fees is set in regulation, so it can be changed, or it can be changed um, uh, as, as needed in response to the situation at the time. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd just like to ask uh, the Minister to clarify uh, directly as to whether the government has done a deal with Senator Griff over this bill, because we understand he was paired. Uh, to support the government on this. I think as a South Australian and South Australian parents and students and universities and university workers deserve to know what deal Senator Griff has done to get this legislation passed. I mean, be upfront about it. What has he given you? Because if he's given you his vote for nothing, then what a dud deal that is. Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Hanson Young, for that contribution that was worthy of the broadcasting sign. As you know, as happens in every bill that we pass through this place, we will always speak to the crossbench in good faith. We take suggestions uh, that, from them in good faith if we need to. In this case, Senator Griff is supporting the government's legislation. Senator Patrick. Yeah, look, I'm uh, a little bit confused. So there's clearly been a last-minute change. And uh, look, I apologise. You didn't quite pick up on exactly what, what you're saying, but you're saying that that this, the the fees will now be introduced over a longer period of time. Is that? Can you just and and, and I request your indulgence. Just repeat what it is that you say that you're changing. Minister, thank you, Chair. The fees will be introduced over a period of three years. Senator Patrick. Yeah, I just want to make sure. I mean, is that spelt out in? The, the, in the primary bill, is that implemented through regulation? Is it consistent with the explanatory memorandum uh, that has been tabled by the government? Minister. Thank you, Chair. So that's set out in regulations. Uh, the proposed new annual charge covers the cost of delivering six regulatory activities concern management and resolution, stakeholder communication and engagement, risk assessment of providers, inquiries from providers, business support to Texas uh, regula regulatory activities and guidance notes for providers. For the first item, it's proposed that the cost will be divided amongst providers, proportional to each provider's size by student enrolments. And this is because more students, um, the more students a provider has, the more likely it is that a student will raise an issue or make a complaint for Texas to consider. Uh, this element costs $269,000 out of the $5.7 million total for all six activities. For items two to six, Texas estimates the cost of delivery is the same regardless of the provider size. So, for example, risk assessment is a data-based process that takes the same effort for a provider that has 20 students or a large university with 40,000 students. So this cost, $4.5 million, is therefore proposed to be evenly split across all 186 registered providers as at June, uh, the 2nd of June 2021. The annual charge will be phased in over three years, and that's commencing on the 1st of July 2022. From the 1st of January 2022, 20% 20 of these costs will be recovered, rising to 50% of the costs in 2023, and 100% of cost recovery from the 1st of January 2024. Senator, Pat oh, sorry. Senator Pratt. Um, I was asking the uh, minister, please, the senator, for a, an example of those fees and what they would actually look like. I'm really keen to properly understand the likely costs that each institution will face and indeed the prospective costs that might be passed on to students. 
I understand this phasing is not um, new, uh, but I still think it is far too significant in these uncertain times, noting that it would be full from 2024, full cost recovery from 2024 and 50% in 2023, when we know that there is a very uncertain future for um, institutions in this period of time. So it depends on the number of courses that a provider provides, um, and the uh, accreditation fees are paid once every four to seven years, four to seven years, and it averages around fifty thousand, fifteen to fifteen to eighty thousand per provider. Senator Pratt. So in the context of small providers, that's $15,000. Is that per annum or in the overall period? Minister? Sorry. That's when you average the fee out. So it's a per annum fee averaged over the, peri uh, the entire period. Senator Pratt. Over the entire period. So it's a one-off payment for that whole period of time. Yep. Um, can I ask, if that's the average payment, this is what led Labor to oppose this legislation in significant part, um, what does it mean in the context of a small provider where you may only have 100 students or so at a cooking school or other trade qualification? Once again, it depends on the number of courses that providers has. So, if there are fewer students and fewer courses, it will be less. Senator Pratt, um, you, I, I think, Minister, you're making this difficult for yourself. If you've got a hundred students, it's not likely to be a huge diversity of courses. So, you're, you know, I can, I can see um, the logic that you are trying to to pursue here. Um, nevertheless. Um, 15, if 15,000 is an average, what reassurance? What, what is the um, size of fees over the spectrum for smaller institutions? Minister, sorry. Just clarify your question for me a little further, please, Senator, because I didn't. Senator Pratt. I think uh, an average that was fifteen thousand, and what was the other figure? But, but fifth, between fifteen and eighty. How much lower than the fifteen will small institutions be? You must have some data around that. Minister. So that the fifteen thousand is at the bottom end. It won't be lower than that. Senator Pratt. To be lower than than that. Um, would the government would recognise that at that level of um, fee structure, uh, that would, for smaller institutions where you've only got a small number of students, it could be 10, 20, 50, um, that threatens the viability of some providers, as Labor's been told. What assessment? Um, have you done of this issue? Do you reject that assertion, or do you agree that um, that this is an existential threat to some providers? 
Minister. So the question that essentially you're asking, Senator Pratt, is if a small higher education providers wear a disproportionate share of Texas new cost recovery arrangements. Is that can I clarify that that's what you're asking? So the Australian government charging framework requires that all fees and charges be directly linked to the regulatory effort attributable to the activity. The majority of Texas regulatory assessments uh, are done to assist smaller non, uh, a smaller non-university providers that do not yet have authority to self-accredit their courses. The government is extremely mindful of the impact of this impact and has adopted several measures to address this. So, course accreditation fees will be reduced for all providers with less than 5,000 student enrolments, and that's equivalent full-time students. And this will reduce the financial barrier to innovation and new course development. Sorry, Minister. It being 1.30 p.m., the committee reports progress. And pursuant to order, I now call upon Senator's two-minute statements and call Senator Pratt again. Yesterday, Scott Morrison sent women and survivors of sexual assault in Australia a damning message. He sent them a message that he simply doesn't care. Yesterday's appointment of Christian Porter, Minister Porter, a man for whom allegations of horrific behaviour have swirled into one of the highest positions of power in managing uh, the Leader of the House of, House of Representatives. This is a stunning move by Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister. Minister Porter is a man who had the Respect at Work report on his desk for over a year, and he did nothing, nothing to address the very serious revelations that women are not safe in their workplaces and how the government must act to rectify this. And yet, Minister Porter simply sat on this report. Minister Porter never even opened the Respect at Work report. He took a slew of sexual assault allegations in this place and a reshuffle that sent Porter out of the portfolio to even get the report opened by this government. At a time when the Prime Minister is out spraying the media with his so-called support for women and sexual assault survivors, the very least he could do would be to allow an independent inquiry into the allegations against Minister Porter, but instead he quashed it. The Prime Minister gets to stand up in this place. He should be setting a standard. And the standard he is setting is that women and sexual assault survivors won't be listened to until it's by force. As Grace Tame wrote, Porter's circumstances are steeped in the protective privileges of a patriarchal parliament. And it's not a standard that Labor is willing you, to Senator accept. Pratt. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I rise to speak briefly on the fantastic and wonderful Great Barrier Reef. Uh, one, I'm one of the few senators in this place that, uh, that lives near or in the Great Barrier Reef catchment area. I think there might only be three of us. Might, might be hopefully getting that, not missing out on anybody. And, um, and I can report how great the reef is going. Uh, tourism is through the roof, uh, with lots of people locked into Australia coming and visiting the reef for the first time. Uh, if borders, uh, borders allow you to come up and see it, because it is in a fantastic state. This was confirmed last week when a report, I think actually, sorry, two weeks ago, a report uh, from uh, the Australian Institute of Marine Science showed that coral cover now on the Great Barrier Reef is at near record levels. Indeed, in my part of the world, in the central part of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, it's, it's basically at a record level. In the southern part, it's, it's near record, and the northern part's back up to where it was a couple of decades ago. So don't believe the doomsays. There's a whole lot of people out there who don't live near the reef, who are some of them have never visited it, like to say and talk it down and say it's dead and make small businesses that try and rely on tourism have a very tough life in North Queensland, when the reality on the ground is that, yes, it's been a tough decade for the reef because of major cyclones and some bleaching events and crown of thorn starfish. These are natural events and the reef has recovered. It is a little alarming, though, that this, these new figures only just came out before a UNESCO meeting that was deciding whether the reef was in danger. Where have these figures been? Where were those figures last year when the Queensland government were putting on crushing new regulations on farmers in North Queensland that are costing them $60,000 a year on the Queensland government figures? We need to get to the bottom of why there's been a cover-up on the coral cover of the reef 
and its real state, because we know the facts now, and the facts are the reef is looking fantastic and it's never been better. Thank you. Senator Waters, remotely. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's homelessness week this week, and uh, Australia is in an affordable housing crisis. And yet, in a wealthy nation like ours, no one should be without a roof over their heads. Uh, in Queensland, we've got 47,000 people who are on a waiting list for social housing. Some of them have been waiting for more than two years. And I've just been up and down the coast of Queensland before lockdown, and we've got a, a huge problem right across our state. There's 5,000 people on that waiting list in Cairns. There's almost 1,000 in Rockhampton, um, and there's almost 3,000 on the Sunshine Coast. Um, locals are being priced out of the market, uh, the private market, and they can't find anywhere to go. Now, we know that before COVID, the fastest growing uh, cohort of people who were facing homelessness was older women. Um, that's still the case and it's gotten worse. Women over 45 are now the fastest growing people at risk of homelessness. And there are 405,000 older women who are on the brink of homelessness. We can do so much better. We should have a massive housing build. The Greens would like to see a million homes built right across this country over the next 20 years because no one should be without a home. Um, that would create construction jobs as well as solve homelessness and the housing crisis. Um, we need to change those tax settings that make it easier to own your fifth or your sixth home than it is to buy your first home. That's why it was really sad to see the Labor Party uh, backflip on their negative gearing and capital gains tax commitments. Um, the, the wrong way, go back. We need to work together to make sure that everyone can afford a roof over their heads so we can generate that economic stimulus from a big housing build um, and stop subsidising people that don't need the help. The Greens in the balance of power will work with the next government, hopefully a Labor one, uh, to fix homelessness and the housing crisis that is plaguing our nation. Thank you. Senator Green, remotely. Thank you very much. Uh, Tara is a small town in the Darling Downs in Queensland with a population of around 2,000 people. It has a school, a hospital and a library and it has one aged care facility. It's home to 30 residents and 40 staff. Last month, council made a decision to close the Tarkula aged care facility based on alleged staffing shortages. This means that residents will have to move away from their hometown and their families. This came as a shock to staff and there are genuine questions about whether this was a justified reason to close the home. An audit of the facility in March found that the facility met each quality standard, including that the workforce was sufficient, skilled and qualified. Whatever the case may be, the federal government and the local MP, David Littleproud, were fully aware of this impending decision by council, but gave the council no guarantees of a fix for the staffing shortage. Today, I've written to the aged care minister and the council demanding answers. I've asked the council to reverse its decision and save Parkula. If any level of government could come up with a single project that would create 40 local permanent secure jobs in a town of 2,000 people, they would jump at the chance and they would fund it in a second. But instead of doing that, the Morrison government shrugs its shoulders and passes the buck. The closure of aged care homes is happening in rural and regional towns right across the country because the Morrison government has failed aged care residents, workers and communities. This is a government that will spend $600 million to win inner city liberal seats with a car parks rule, but won't lift a finger to save aged care homes in regional Queensland. We need to save Tarkula and we need to fix aged care now. Thank you. Senator Hanson, remotely. Thank you. Despite every effort to close the gap between First Nations descendants and Australians of all colour and creed, we continue to entrench the victimhood status with endless cash handouts and infinite apologies. I stand here as an elected member of this parliament as a voice for Queenslanders and Australians. And any suggestion to legislate or change our constitution to incorporate a voice to parliament will strongly be opposed by One Nation. As my friend and granddaughter of Paddy Uru has repeatedly said, how can you have indigenous people in parliament and advising parliament who have never lived 
and Aboriginal life. She calls these people like Marcia Langton and Tom Culmer, bitumen blacks. There is no incentive to close the gap because there are so many businesses and bureaucrats whose livelihoods solely depend on division. In other words, sustaining the gap is big business. I find the words of Scott Morrison's closing the gap speech today completely disingenuous. The Prime Minister's remarks are as hollow as the eucalypt limbs used to produce the didgeridoo. We must put a stop to entrenching the victimhood status on our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. The majority are not victims. They are capable, resilient and valuable Australians who should be encouraged to participate in Australia's optimistic future. Our nation's history is not perfect. We know that. But we will only close the gap when we treat all Australians equally and on an individual needs basis, not based on race. Thank you. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, down in Tasmania, we normally like to take a team approach. Team Tasmania, as many will call it, many of our own colleagues. And that's something I'm very proud of. And uh, just uh, yesterday, there was some great news that came out of Tasmania, and that was that the state of Tasmania had achieved 50% uh, of the population, eligible population, receiving their first dose of vaccine, which is a fantastic milestone, can I say, and 25 per cent getting fully vaccinated. Now, this is a great piece of news. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. But can I say I was most surprised on the basis of that information coming out yesterday, that great news, that there would be a couple of senators in this place from Tasmania, not from my party, I might add, who wanted to run down this good news. I mean, instead of there being a single word of encouragement for Tasmanians who've done the right thing and rolled up their sleeves and got the jab, or encouraging more Tasmanians to do just the same thing as we're asking them to, then uh, they just sat there and found holes and problems. Not one word of encouragement, which is something that is bitterly disappointing. I think we do need to remember that this is about encouraging those who do the right thing and encouraging further uh, Tasmanians to be able to do the right thing. Not whipping up oh, politics, yeah. not finding division. This is not a political game. This is a life and death matter for many. And so I encourage my Tasmanian colleagues to get on board, stop running down Tasmanians, stop running down our state, and acknowledge the good work our state has done. The people of Tasmania, 50 per cent, leading the nation. Get on board. Join Team Tasmania. Yeah. Senator Mariel Smith. They wrote merely. Remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This week is National Homelessness Week, the theme being everybody needs a home. During this pandemic, I think most of us can agree that our homes have never been more important or felt more important to us. Our homes should be the places which make us feel the safest, that make us feel secure. They should be the centre of family life, of love, of happy memories, of happy times, and give us a sense of security and permanency and place in our community. But for too many Australians, we know that the home isn't a safe place, it's not a stable place. For too many Australians, they are living in unstable accommodation, insecure accommodation or transiently. And far too many Australians are sleeping rough. For all of these Australians who don't experience what they should from the home, who indeed experience homelessness or rough sleeping, it is past time for our parliament to commit to change, to commit to do better. Because like so many policy failures that we see in this place that come around our country, homelessness is preventable, it's solvable with the right commitment, the right investment and the right uh, commitment to solving that challenge. And it's incumbent on all of us to remember that in the work that we do in this place, not just this week on National Homelessness Week, but every week. I'm deeply proud to be part of a political party that is committed to meaningful change. Anthony Albanese has committed to building 20,000 additional social housing properties through uh, a Housing Australia Future Fund, and 4,000 of those properties would be reserved for women and children fleeing family violence and for older women who are at greater risk of experiencing homelessness. And we know that this is one of the greatest cohorts of people in our community at risk of homelessness. These are sort of policies we need to tackle homelessness, but of course they are just the beginning. And together, I hope we can do more. Senator Lambie. 
thank you, Acting Dep Deputy Madam President. I want all the parents out there that have got kids that are going through officer training in, over the next few weeks at the Sydney University Regiment to pull them out immediately. And I'm not mucking around here. Get them out of there, because I can tell you what, they are dangerous to your children. Kids who are doing a gap year with Army Reserve are getting bullied and abused at the hands of Australian regular Army officers. The Sydney Uni Regiment is an officer training regiment, and young people go there and live on base. That is part of the one-year program to become an Army Reserve officer. Most of them are 18 or 19 a year, years old recruits, and they should be having the time of their lives. They've just left home, they're right out of school, and they're meeting new people. But their gap year is turning into a nightmare from hell. The problems are bubbling over. There are illegal room searches going on. There are allegations of sexual abuse. There is rape going on. There is bullying going on. You know it. That is what's happening at our Sydney University Regiment. And come out and try and deny it. Just try me today. I'm doing everything I can to get it fixed. I've raised it with the Chief of Army. I've raised it with the Minister of Defence. And I'm asking both of them for the sake of our children and the future of our military. Go in there and make sure our kids are safe. We are now at the point where they need to delay the start of the date of the new recruits, like I've just said. Let's be clear here. The Army has a duty of care, and you're not living up to the expectations of the standard I'm supposed to walk past. You are bloody shameful. You are absolutely shameful. I've asked the minister whether he was confident that year 18 and 19-year-old recruits would be safe from review. Guess what? He has not directly answered my question. That is where we are at. We can't guarantee those kids will be safe. I'm ex-military police. I'm asking you, from one military police person to another, get in there and do your job and call them out. Get in there and use that training. We've got problems, and they're abusing our kids at the Sydney University Regiment. Get in there. Senator Stoker, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. From the team who brought you the pink bat scandal and $900 checks to people who passed away, well, now we have Labor's cash for jabs. We shouldn't be surprised to learn, though, that Labor's proposal will divert money from where it's most needed and do very little to increase Australia's vaccination rate. Labor say it's their policy to use $300 payments as an incentive for people to get vaccinated. It's a copy and paste, though of the policy announced by US President Biden just a few days earlier, which would come at a cost to Australians of up to $6 billion. It's another mindless imitation from Albanese's Labor, who so often plays copycat to former UK leader Corbyn and Mr Biden. And yet this comes at a time when state-driven lockdowns continue to buffet the budget. And yet, despite its cost, the international evidence suggests it would do little to actually encourage people to get vaccinated. The Australian government's behavioural economics team has found financial incentives are, quote, unlikely to drive vaccine uptake in Australia. Indeed, for anyone who might find the payment a driver of behaviour, it would likely counterproductively encourage them to delay vaccination until after the next election, hoping that Labor might win. By far the best incentive to get vaccinated is to protect your health. On the best evidence we have, getting vaccinated will lower your chance of getting COVID. It will lower the severity of the illness if you do. It will help protect your family members, friends, colleagues and community. But close behind is the end of the justification for the cycle of lockdowns that Australians have endured so patiently to regain the freedoms we once took for granted and the can-do optimistic culture that comes with it. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Deaths, loss of jobs, businesses closing, $300 billion plus of public expenditure, border closures, lockdowns. COVID has had the biggest effect uh, on Australian life since World War II. It's also involved some of the biggest public policy decisions uh, ever undertaken in terms of quantums of, of money spent. Some things in the pandemic have gone well, some things have not. Nearly 20 months from the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Australia is paying a heavy price for massive public policy failure on international quarantine and the procurement and distribution of vaccines. 
Now, those who do not learn from the past are often doomed to repeat it. A Royal Commission inquiry is needed to establish precisely how Australia got into the position we find ourselves and to learn all the lessons we can from COVID-19 uh, and the response. Only a Royal Commission would have the authority to cover the breadth of issues and actions of both the federal and state governments. Only an independent, non-partisan and fully empowered inquiry can cut through government spin and secrecy to get the truth. A Royal Commissioner, a Commission should not only uh, call for the so-called records of the National Cabinet, but other Cabinet, uh, uh, both state and federal, even national security claims. Only a Royal Commission can extract the truth from reluctant ministers and bureaucrats. Only it can, uh, a Royal Commission can deliver authoritative findings to, to serve as a guide for future policy. It's an essential part of our COVID-19 response. Senator Sheldon, Mike. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, yesterday, the High Court ruled and delivered a judgment on the Workpack versus Rosada case. Let's make no mistake. It is a victory for labour hire companies and the Morrison government against hard-working Australians. The government and multinational labour hire companies, who over the last two years have worked hand in hand to crush the rights of casual labour hire in, in mines. The Morrison government chose to intervene in this case, not on the side of hard-working Australians, but on the side of multinational, multi-billion dollar labour hire companies. Morrison government spent almost $300,000 on legal fees in this case. $300,000 of public money to keep the labour hire rot alive. Now that shows what side the Morrison government is on. Legal experts are warning that the Rosata precedent be used to uphold sham contracting arrangements and attack the Australian middle class. And it could stop workers at Uber who are being paid as little as $6.70 an hour, no workers' comp, no leave entitlements, no unfair dismissal rights, no collective bargaining rights from fighting for the minimum wage. The University of Adelaide Professor Andrew Stewart said, and I quote, it's an open invitation to businesses to hire workers as independent contractors rather than employees, meaning they don't just miss out on annual leave, but minimum wages limits on working hours, the right to complain of unfair dismissal, and maybe super and workers' compensation as well. So rather than spending taxpayer money to uphold exploitation, the Morrison government should be legislating for rights for all workers, whether employees or contractors. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Thorpe, remotely. Thank you, Chair. Today, the do nothing, I don't hold a hose, mate, Prime Minister, stood up in the other place to again highlight the failures of the government he leads with regards to First Nations people in this country. The Morrison government yet again is showing us that they are not serious about ending systemic inequality between First Nations and non-Indigenous people in this country. Mr Morrison isn't just failing to close the gap. In his leadership vacuum, things are getting worse. Over the last eight years of the Liberal government, most key indicators have gone backwards, despite First Nations communities demanding action. First Nations people are not the problem. The system that is deliberately stacked against First Nations people and the do-nothing Morrison government is the problem. The 2021 Closing the Gap report is yet another shameful reminder that more First Nations babies are being stolen from their families, more First Nations people are dying by suicide, more First Nations people are being imprisoned. And this report clearly demonstrates that the Morrison government has no idea. The Prime Minister is standing in the way of the solutions our people have always had to the problems we have been pushed to experience as a result of colonisation and land dispossession. 
Grassroots First Nations people need to be in the driver's seat when it comes to making decisions that affect our lives. Self-determination means giving us the right, the resources and the power to determine our own destiny. Fancy that. Grassroots First Nations leadership is the only way forward. That Thank is you, how Senator we solve Thorpe, the your issue. time's expired. Senator MacDonald. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The care a community provides for its elders is a mark of that community. And I rise to give due respect and hearty congratulations to volunteers and staff at aged care facilities, particularly in our regions and smaller towns. I recently had the pleasure to attend the Warina aged care facility in Innisfail, just south of Cairns, where I opened the site's new 64-bed Sepoy Roberts building. Warina Innisfail started operations in 1970 and has a stellar reputation for providing quality, dignified care. And this new building is outstanding in its comfort and care for the residents and improved workplace safety for staff. As announced in the recent federal budget, the Morrison government will deliver a $17.7 million package of support and once-in-a-generation reform to aged care to deliver respect and dignity to our senior Australians. Also as part of the 21-22 budget, the Morrison government is investing $125.7 billion over the next four years into Medicare, an increase of over $6 billion from last year's budget. There's an election coming soon, and if anyone says the Morrison government is cutting Medicare, it's just not true. Senior Australians built our nation. They're our parents and grandparents, our founders and protectors, and they have contributed so much to our communities. I always make a point of visiting aged care facilities because of the, re of the tireless work by staff and volunteers such as Warina patron Claire Richardson. I'm glad to represent the Liberal National Party that re realises the importance of regional aged care which walks the walk when it comes to providing funding and training to the sector. It is so important because regional aged care allows families to stay in the regions. Well done to Warina Innisfail President Chris Kayla, the Board of Directors, staff and volunteers. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Well, we've all come across that person, the bloke who wants the title, wants the big contract, wants the money or the glory, but doesn't really want to do the job that goes with it. The middle manager from hell, the dodgy contractor who leaves his customers in the lurch and ends up on a current affair. And when we come across these people in our day-to-day -day lives, it causes a lot of stress and often costs us a lot of money. But when that person is supposed to lead our country through a pandemic, when that person is a prime minister, it's a crisis for us all. Mr Morrison revealed his character during the bushfires when he left Australia's in the lurch and nicked off to Hawaii. And now he's done it again. He spent all last year telling premiers they shouldn't lock down. He said not locking down was the gold standard. And when Melbourne had a Delta outbreak in June, he said he wanted to see the restrictions lifted as quickly as possible. That's what he said. And then when this current Delta outbreak started in Bondi, he said, I commend the Premier of New South Wales for the fact she hasn't gone into lockdown. And since he urged no lockdown for bon the Bondi cluster, it spread causing lockdowns across Sydney, Victoria and South Australia, and today the hunter goes into seven days lockdown. The cost in lives is tragic, the cost of jobs and the economy is reckless, but now, like the dodgy contractor, he wants you to forget what he told you before. Now, Mr Morrison says, the only way to deal with outbreaks is lockdowns. Isn't that amazing? Now he says he supports lockdowns strongly. Well, he's changed his tune, but you know he doesn't want you to notice that he has. This bloke's story changes every week, every week, and Australians can't rely on anything he says. He's always ducking and weaving. He's always ducking responsibility, and you know what? He's always blaming someone else, and it's Australians who are left in the lurch. Senator Urquhart. Recently, workers at McCain Foods in Smithton, through their union, the AMW, notified the company, in accordance with the law, that they would be taking industrial action in support of their claims for their enterprise agreement. They have been attempting <coughs> to negotiate with the company for the past six months. The company locked them out on two occasions. A delegate on the site recently posted this message on social media. She said, ah, McCain, you have done it again. 
I'm a proud Tasmanian. I was born and bred in Smithton. I've been a quality assessor at McCain Foods here in Smithton for seven years and a delegate for five. My mother used to do the same work I do, and that makes me proud. Our bosses at McCain Foods have just shut us out of our workplace this morning because they are refusing to agree to decent paying conditions. We are essential food workers in Tasmania. We are the ones that have kept food on the table during a pandemic, but our bosses refuse to recognise this. We have taken lower pay increases in the past to help the company out during harder times when now they are set for record tonnage. It is totally unfair because workers at McCain Foods on the mainland are earning up to 15 per cent more than us for doing the same work. And again, just down the road at Simplot, food workers are earning about 15 per cent more than doing the same work. We have bargained with McCain's in good faith, but now they have locked us out of the workplace as a bargaining Order. tactic. Senator Urquhart, it being 2 p.m., we will move to questions without notice. Senator, Ken I'm going to ask for Senator Keneally will be having the first question remotely, so I'll ask for quiet. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. In an article in this Sydney Morning Herald entitled New South Wales Pharmacists Stuck in Waiting Game for Vaccines, Mario Baroni, a pharmacist in Western Sydney's hotspot suburb of Fairfield, reported that despite placing a second order for AstraZeneca doses on Monday, the vaccines won't arrive for nearly three weeks. He says, and I quote, these vaccines are in a fridge somewhere, but they aren't in pharmacy fridges. Given there have been tragically five more deaths from COVID-19 recorded in New South Wales today, why are pharmacists in the hot spot of Fairfield waiting almost three weeks for AstraZeneca vaccines to arrive? Minister representing the Minister for Health, remotely, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, as pharmacies uh, undertake their onboarding process for uh, delivery of uh, vaccines through the National Vaccination Program, uh, there is a process of onboarding registration and ordering of vaccines, Mr. President. Uh, the, there is a cycle. Uh, of assessment of that process, uh, of preparing the um, pharmacists to ensure that the appropriate training has been undertaken so that the vaccines are handled appropriately and administered as they should be, Mr. President. And we have seen in the past the circumstances where for uh, appropriate uh, training and that's led to mistakes. So there are processes, Mr. President, where, uh, as a part of the onboarding process, the uh, pharmacists uh, are registered. Uh, they go through a process of assessment uh, and training. Uh, and and there's, uh, while that process is being undertaken, uh, their orders are uh, are taken from them and uh, deliveries are processed, Mr. President. So it does take a couple of weeks to onboard a uh, a pharmacist into the system, uh, but that's done deliberately so that we can ensure that the vaccination process is undertaken uh, safely uh, and in accordance with the appropriate processes of delivery of the vaccine to the Australian community. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Port Macquarie-based pharmacist Judy Plunkett says she's yet to receive a single vaccine dose and has said, and I quote, if pharmacies were brought on in April, we could have done tens of thousands of doses by now. Every barrier has been put in front of us. Why are pharmacists who want to vaccinate Australians against COVID-19 having every barrier put in front of them? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I completely reject the premise of Senator Keneally's question. Uh, it's always been part of our national plan to progressively increase the number of outlets that uh, the coronavirus vaccines were available at. Uh, we started uh, with the state clinics, the Commonwealth vaccination clinics, uh, then we brought on GPs, and as vaccine uh, availability increased, uh, the plan was always to progressively bring on pharmacy. And that's exactly what we've done, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I reject the comment that we've put barriers in front of uh, pharmacy. Uh, we have progressively built 
the vaccine supply and the number of outlets to ensure that Australians could get access to a vaccine wherever they are around the country, but to ensure that that is done safely, uh, progressively, so that we can meet our objective of providing everyone who wants a vaccine one by the end of the year. Order. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Pharmacy Guild of Australia's New South Wales branch has criticised the Morrison government's decision to contract logistics out separately, instead of using the community service obligation wholesaler network, which would have used existing cold chain supplies to ensure 24-hour delivery. Does the Morrison government take responsibility for the failed logistics arrangements which are delaying vital COVID vaccines to New South Wales? Senator Colbeck. Well, again, Mr. President, I don't accept the premise that Senator Keneally has placed on the, uh, on, in her question. Mr. President, all throughout this process, we've put in place systems and measures to ensure the safe delivery uh, and distribution of the coronavirus vaccines. They are, um, have to be managed in a particular way. They have to be managed in accordance with appropriate cold storage. Mr. President, and so it has been uh, an unprecedented, an unprecedented logistical exercise to ensure the distribution of the vaccine, Mr. President. Uh, and we have, across the country, successfully delivered vaccines to thousands of individual outlets for the coronavirus vaccine, Mr. President. And we will continue to ensure that we safely. Uh, and properly uh, get those deliveries out Order, to all Senator of the Senator Colbeck. That Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing Indigenous Australians, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Commonwealth's Closing the Gap implementation plan announced today will lead to better outcomes for Indigenous Australians across Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank Senator Smith for his question on this very important topic. Firstly, can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, the Ngunnawal people, uh, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also pay uh, particularly I would like to acknowledge Senators McCarthy, Dodson, Lambie and Thorpe in this place. The release today of the Commonwealth Closing the Gap Plan is a really significant milestone. Um, in achieving the targets of the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, which came into effect last year. With the release of the plan, we are committing more than $1 billion in new measures to support the achievement of Closing the Gap measures. And we're turning our commitments made under the National Agreement into practical and real actions. This plan is about real reconciliation, how we get there, and making sure all governments are held to account, state and federal. So whether it be delivering new health clinics and housing for health professionals to close the gap in relation to life expectancy, or initiatives to lift participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in quality and culturally appropriate early childhood education and care services, or whether it's delivering the Territory's Stolen Generation Redress Scheme, which supports healing for stolen generation survivors. And we will deliver the Outcomes and Evidence Fund to incentivise evidence-based service delivery and deliver tangible and improved outcomes to support child and family safety. We are providing an additional $254.4 million towards infrastructure and better support Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations so they can continue to do the critical work that they do and have been doing so very successfully over recent years. And we're investing $160 million in new funding to ensure the best start in life for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children through a range of different initiatives. But most importantly, we're doing this together. This plan is co-designed and it will be co-designed delivered. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister explain for the Senate why working in partnership is important to closing the gap and how this is different to previous approaches? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Um, as part of the, the national agreement on closing the gap, we set out four priority reforms to fundamentally change how governments and Aboriginal and Torres, Torres Strait Islander people work together. The implementation plan that was announced today details how governments will do our part in achieving these reforms. 
It highlights the real and practical actions to be taken across all areas of government, and most importantly, it commits funding to actions that will ensure that we get there. Importantly, all governments will work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders with an increasing level of accountability, transparency and responsibility. This reflects the new model of working together. We will prioritise investments so that we are all responding to the evidence and doing things that will make the most difference. The Morrison government is committed to working with Indigenous Australians to deliver the outcomes needed to close the gap. Senator Smith, the final supplementary question. Thank you very much. What are the benefits of this new approach under the National Agreement on Closing the Gap? Senator Rustin. Under the new um, National Agreement, we have committed to work in true partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders. Like the Commonwealth, all parties are required to develop implementation plans that outline how they, how they will deliver their parts and their commitments under the National Agreement. They are required to report on their actions annually, ensuring there is a much greater level of shared accountability than under previous agreements. Increased transparency is built on data, and the Morrison government has already delivered towards this priority reform this year with the release of the Closing the Gap dashboard, and we will continue to deliver on our commitments. The implementation plan is also firmly in line with our continued to commitment to work in genuine partnership with Indigenous Australians in both policy development, program and service delivery. The, this commitment to shared decision-making will be embedded in the design, implementation and monitoring of policies and programs to improve life outcomes for all Indigenous Australians. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question <clears throat> is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In section 1.1 of the Morrison's fourth vaccine plan released in just two months, the Morrison government lists everyone it blames for the slow COVID-19 vaccine rollout, including ATAGI, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, state and territory governments, vaccination clinics and Australians themselves. How did the Morrison government forget to list itself? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, um, uh, what a petty question from Senator Gallagher. Um, and what a, misrepresent and what, a misrepresentation, what a misrepresentation of what a misrepresentation Order. Order. of the documents and the facts, Mr. President. The government acknowledges that there have been challenges in relation to the vaccine rollout. We acknowledge that, and we take responsibility for it and for fixing it, Mr. President. And we take responsibility for ensuring that, notwithstanding the challenges that have been had in terms of supply that was forecast to arrive that didn't arrive, notwithstanding changes to health advice. Uh, we continue to push on with ensuring that we have uh, supply growth now and into the future, uh, that we have growth in distribution points now and into the future. Uh, and in doing that, Mr. President, we're in the best position to be able to see continued growth in relation to the vaccine rollout. And the data for the last 24 hours is just out, and some 221,859 Australians turned out in the last 24 hours uh, to receive uh, their latest vaccine doses. That, Mr. President, is yet another daily record set in relation to the vaccine rollout. And I thank each and every one of those Australians who, notwithstanding uh, the negativity or elsewhere, uh, are turning out in record numbers. It has pushed the total number of doses administered across Australia to more than 13 million now, Mr. President. In doing so, it sees uh, the over 70s pass the 80 per cent threshold. That first age cohort who were prioritised under the vaccine rollout. We now have more than 80 per cent of them have managed to achieve uh, the target, and in doing so, uh, we will no doubt see even more push on, even more, of course, getting their second dose as those rates climb uh, and that number grow even further in that age cohort, as it will right across the Australian population. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <clears throat> Mr. President. The reason the initial vaccine rollout has been bungled is the Morrison government's failure to secure adequate supplies. Does Mr Morrison take responsibility for his failure to keep Australians safe? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, the Morrison government procured some 195 million doses uh, before we get to the recent announcements, before we get to the recent announcements in relation to those booster doses that were procured. Now, Mr, Mr. President, Mr. President, the government, absolutely, as I said before, 
accepts responsibility for the rollout, the challenges and fixing it. That's our job as a government. We don't shirk or shy away from doing so. Uh, we are pleased to see that we have increased volume of supply. We're pleased to see that we have increased distribution points able to be brought on progressively as we get that increase in supply. We are particularly pleased to see the way in which Australians are responding in record numbers to the vaccine rollout. Australians responding in ways that don't mean they need $300 payments. They're making it clear they want the vaccine. They're making it clear they want to turn out. And we are supporting them to make sure they have increasing chances to turn out rather than the types of silly policy Order. thought bubbles from Senator those opposite. Senator Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Gallagher, a Thank final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In June, Mr Morrison boasted nobody in Australia had died uh, from COVID-19 in 2021 and nobody was in intensive care. Mr Hunt boasted it was one of the most extraordinary public health achievements in Australian history. 21 people have tragically died in the New South Wales outbreak and 51 people are now in intensive care. Does Mr Morrison concede he is actually responsible for one of the most extraordinary public health failures? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. No, we don't make that concession. We acknowledge that managing COVID-19, managing a global pandemic remains incredibly challenging. That Australia has, has done far better than the rest of the world in the management of the pandemic. But tragically, 932 Australians have lost their lives uh, from COVID-19. 932 in total. 21 have lost their lives during uh, this New South Wales outbreak. Mr President, our government uh, is determined, though, that Australia will continue to do the best we can in managing the pandemic according to the medical advice that we have. That's why we commissioned the Doherty Institute to undertake the modelling there. It's why we have made sure uh, that we pr progress and advance a plan built upon that advice and evidence. Uh, Australia is not immune from COVID-19, but we are absolutely able, as we have done, to continue to respond to the changing circumstance of the Delta variant, to other challenges thrown at us, but to do so in world-leading ways. Senator, Bum Senator Wish Wilson. President, my question is to Senator Hume, representing the Environment Minister. Minister, Australia has just successfully lobbied a UNESCO World Heritage Committee to vote against the scientific advice provided by the IUCN that the Great Barrier Reef should be listed as in danger. A report from Spanish media overnight quoted Spain's UNESCO ambassador as admitting to striking a deal with Australia that they would support Australia's amendments to have the reef not listed as in danger if Australia backed its attempt to have two Spanish properties added to the UNESCO World Heritage List, despite the committee recommending against this. We have also heard that Australia co-sponsored an amendment to list a site in Saudi Arabia, despite the committee also recommending against this. Minister, can you confirm these reports and detail what other deals were done in the name of your government's political agenda? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Wish Wilson for his question, his enduring care of the Great Barrier Reef, which is shared with that of the Morrison government. Um, the Morrison government, in fact, is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage Great Barrier Reef. The tourism industry, traditional owners, the reef communities, they rely on the Morrison government's commitment to the reef, and we will not let them down. Our world's best management of the reef is acknowledged by many, including the World Heritage Committee, who said in this year's decision on the reef that it commends the State Party, that being Australia, for the strong and continued efforts to create conditions for the implementation of the Reef 2050 long-term sustainability have Senator plan. Senator Wilson on a point of order. Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Point of order on relevance, President. Did, did the government do any deals? to win the UNESCO vote. Senator Wish Wilson, the question had a very lengthy preamble, I appreciate. The minister was addressing the body that made the decision you were questioning about, so I believe the minister is being directly relevant if she's talking about the decision that was made, um, because she's entitled to be directly relevant to all or part of a question, especially when it is lengthy. Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr President. So discussions between the members of the committee will always remain private, so we make no apologies no apologies for defending we make no apologies for defending Australia's reputation as the best marine park managers in the world. Mr. President, the, mem the Minister for the Environment has highlighted before that climate change is the most Order serious long-term threat 
to the health of coral reefs worldwide, and that includes the Great Barrier Reef. It also threatens 82 other World Heritage Sites around the world. Rainforests, fjordlands, glaciers—none would be better off if UNESCO succeeded in its bid to single out Australia for what is, we all agree, a global problem. And that's why the World Heritage Committee unanimously struck out this year's attempt to use Australia only for its, call, for its global call to action. Mr President, with only 1.3 per cent of global emissions, Australia cannot fix this problem alone. The world must do more to reduce emissions, and the World Heritage Committee must find a path towards collective action and not singular punishment. The Morrison government's concern was that UNESCO sought an immediate in danger listing without appropriate consultation and without a site visit and without all the latest information. It's clear that this process has concerned not only Australia but other nations as well. So we welcome the support of an overwhelming majority of the Order. nations at the 44th Senator session Hume, of the World Heritage Committee. Expired. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Minister, UNESCO didn't strike this out. It recommitted the vote to May 2022. Your government is now being watched closely by the world. There is specific language in the recent UNESCO ruling that requires Australia to demonstrate an acceleration on key points of the Reef 2050 plans, including by lowering emissions that are killing the reef beyond current plans. What is your plan for accelerating emissions reduction, and how is giving money to new fossil fuel projects, including the gas-led recovery, going to accelerate emissions reductions? Order. Senator, order. Senator Hume. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Indeed, 19 of the 21 members of the World Heritage Committee support in spoke in support of Australia's position. The World Heritage Committee's endorsement of Australia's position will give reef managers, marine scientists and land managers the chance to demonstrate the success of the outstanding work that is taking place across the reef. We will invite representatives of UNESCO and the IUCN to visit the reef and see firsthand the work that we are doing to build the reef's resilience and submit a state party report to the World Heritage Centre by 1 February 2022. Order. We will continue to work Work with UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee to protect the long-term future of the reef, and we're working with the Queensland government to ensure that the strategies under the Reef 2050 plan are delivering Order. the best possible outcomes for the reef. The Australian and Queensland governments are investing more than three billion dollars from 2014-15 to 23-24 to implement the Reef 2050 plan, and more than two billion of this is from Order. the Australian Senator government. Hume. Senator Hume, Senator Wilson, a final supplementary question. Minister, the world's best science provided by the IUCN to UNESCO tells us we all face a future where one of the world's most iconic and critical natural wonders may die in our lifetimes, primarily from the burning of fossil fuels and a lack of ambition, global ambition, on climate change. Minister, can you today put your hand on your heart in the Senate and say you are happy with what your government is doing, everything possible to reduce emissions and protect the Barrier Reef for future generations? Senator Hume. Senator, that, Senator Wish Wilson, thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Mr. President. Hand on heart, Australia is a good citizen in the World Heritage System, and we have implemented all previous recommendations. But what on earth corrective measure could we possibly implement on our own to address global warming? We are delivering on all of our outcomes that we have committed to in the Reef 2050 plan. And that includes controlling outbreaks of the crown of flawn starfish that eats coral, improving water quality, doubling the on-ground joint field management program, addressing plastic solution, rehabilitating island, coastal and reef habitats, and in fact, as reported in the 2019 Reef Water Quality Report Card, we are over halfway to the fine sediment target and almost halfway to the dissolved inorganic nitrogen target. Mr President, can I reiterate that the Morrison government is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef? Order, Senator Hume. Order. I'm going to ask senators. The wearing of masks makes it particularly difficult to call senators to order because I can't see their mouths move. Uh, I, can, I can see, I can recognise some voices at the front of the chamber, but particularly at the rear of the chamber. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister advise the Senate on the latest health measures to support closing the gap? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Macdonald, for the opportunity to outline these important measures. And I know that uh, Senator Macdonald takes a strong interest in closing the gap, particularly working with local communities in far north Queensland. Mr. President, to support the first Closing the Gap implementation plan, the Morrison government is investing more than $300 million in health infrastructure and programs to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders can access health services when and where they need them. The government is also investing $45 million to ensure the best start in life for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children through the Healthy Mums and Healthy Bubs program. This funding is an additional $82 million for the Connected Beginnings program, which includes funding for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services. These programs are focused on prom promoting healthy outcomes and healthy lifestyle choices for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and their babies. This will provide mothers with improved access to health care, including access to antenatal care from their health providers and to provide support until their baby is one year old. These programs complement and build on the government's investment of more than $781.1 million in the 21-22 budget to prioritise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and ageing outcomes. Mr President, the Closing the Gap implementation plan sets a foundation for the Commonwealth's efforts over the next decade in achieving the targets in the National Agreement on Closing the Gap signed by all Australian governments in July of 2020. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. How is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting Indigenous Australians as part of the response to COVID-19? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Again, thanks, Senator Macdonald, for the question. Through the Commonwealth Government's $1 billion investment in new Closing the Gap measures, we're investing $254.4 million in infrastructure to better support the critical work of Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations, which have been a significant part of the government's response to COVID-19. Operated by communities delivering comprehensive and culturally appropriate primary health care services, including administering COVID-19 vaccines across rural and remote Australia. Mr President, we are absolutely committed to improving health services for Indigenous Australians, their families and their communities. Aboriginal community controlled health organisations have been vital in providing health support for Aboriginal communities across Australia. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. What are the socio-economic targets related to the National Agreement on Closing the Gap? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. The new Aboriginal the new National Agreement on Closing the Gap was released in July last year and represents a significant shift in the Closing the Gap framework. 17 national socio-economic targets will track progress in improving life outcomes, including closing the gap in life expectancy within a generation by 2031, increasing the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies with a healthy birth weight to 91% by 2031, and significant and sustained reduction in suicide of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people towards zero. Mr President, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan is underpinning action to, to drive progress against these targets with a combined national focus. The Closing the Gap Implementation Plan has been developed by ministers, departments and agencies across our nation, with peak Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island partners, particularly the Coalition of Peaks, representing around 50 Order, community Senator controlled Colbeck. organisations. Time has expired. Senator Seawood, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. If children between the age of 12 to 16 are not included in the government's vaccination targets, the whole of the population target is actually 65 per cent, not 80 per cent. If we reopen at 65 per cent, our hospitals will be overwhelmed and we will have tens of thousands of cases. As Queensland's latest outbreak shows, kids can catch and transmit COVID. Why aren't you including children above the age of 12 in the vaccination program? 
How many children have to catch COVID before the government includes them in its vaccination targets? The minister representing the Minister for Health, um, Senator Colby. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Seward, for the program. Uh, Mr. President, children are, in fact, included, uh, as announced by the Health Minister on Monday, in the vaccination program. Uh, we commenced uh, with uh, children with certain health issues, Indigenous children in, and, and children in remote communities, uh, as a part of our vaccination program. Uh, and uh, the, the vaccination of availability uh, and approval for uh, ch uh, children uh, was only made by uh, the TGA uh, in recent times, Mr. President. And so uh, the, the health minister, in fact, did announce on Monday that children will become part of the vaccination program in the categories that I've outlined, Mr. President. Our objective is to offer all Australians for whom a vaccine has been approved the opportunity to have one as soon as possible. We want all of those over the age of, uh, of, uh, of 18 to be able to have the opportunity for a vaccine by the end of the year. Uh, and as I've said a number of times, and as the Health Minister and the Prime Minister and many of my colleagues have said, we'll continue to grow and develop the uh, vaccine program uh, with the availability of vaccine, opening up more opportunities for Australians to access the vaccine through more outlets, Mr. President. It's important that as many Australians as possible uh, get vaccinated. Uh, we've seen with the Delta variant, variant uh, how the how the COVID virus has, has modified and changed its behaviour. And so it's important that we continue to adapt to the circumstances uh, as the, the virus itself uh, adapts and, and creates more variants. So we'll continue, and, and the government will continue to do that, Mr. President. Senator Seawood, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, the government is not including all children in the targets. They are not including, in fact, children over the age of, or between the age of 12 and 16 in their targets. Why isn't that occurring? Why have you only relied on the Doherty Institute for advice and not listened to other experts as well, such as the Grattan Institute and uh, other experts that are saying children need to be included in the targets, not just the program, and all children Order between Senator the ages of 12 and 16. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. And again, thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. Mr. President, the government commissioned the Doherty Institute to conduct research um, to provide us with advice on the parameters for opening up the economy. We have released that information uh, publicly so that all Australians can understand the circumstances under which the various stages of the process to open up the economy and open up the community can be undertaken. Uh, the Doherty Institute uh, modelling was based on the advice with respect to vaccinations uh, available uh, at the time. And Mr. President, and, and as I've just indicated, uh, children will progressively uh, become part of the vaccination rollout program. But the vaccination program rollout has always been based on a range of priorities. Uh, and those priorities have progressed as we've had availability of additional vaccines. Senator Seawood, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, are you not including kids because there is not enough vaccine available? And do you concede that by not including children between the age of 12 and 16 in the targets, that this is a much more risky approach? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. Uh, I've already indicated on a number of occasions that children will be part of the vaccine rollout. So, so I don't concede uh, what she's indicated as part of her question. Children uh, will be, and they already are being included as part of the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. They're not part of the targets. Order. Point of order, Senator Chair, Se Mr. No, President. I'm sorry, Senator Sea. We, 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 I think the rules of engagement under remote participation don't allow points of order to be made remotely. Someone here can do it, but um, Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. Order. 
Um, Senator Colbeck, to Mr. continue. President. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, the government com uh, commissioned the Doherty Institute to undertake research to give us uh, and all of the community an indication of the parameters that might permit the community to open up uh, and, the co and the economy to open up. Uh, that information has been provided to all Australians so that they can understand the circumstances and the targets with which that might occur. Mr President, we will continue Senator to Pratt. work to provide access to vaccines for all Australians as approved Order. by the Senator TGA. Senator Colbeck, time has expired. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I refer to the answer the Minister for Urban Infrastructure gave in the House yesterday about the commuter car park fund. Yesterday the, Prime Min Sorry, yesterday, the minister claimed decisions were based on departmental advice, yet the Auditor-General found not that not one of the 47 car parks were recommended by the department. Today, Mr Morrison refused on nine occasions to say what involvement he had in deciding the car parks in target seats. At any point, did Mr Morrison or, or his office see the list of top, top 20 marginal seats used to distribute funds? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Colbeck. Oh, sorry, Senator Birmingham. Oh, <laughs> thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, um, these are uh, valuable projects for communities around Australia that the Senator is asking questions about. Uh, they uh, they uh, do and will provide uh, benefit to uh, people in, uh, in a range of different communities. Uh, as, uh, as is well known, they were a subject of an ANO report and the departments accepted uh, the recommendations of that report and has begun to implement them. Have you concluded your answer, Senator Birmingham? Order. Order. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Order. Senator Brown is on her feet. Order. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Evidence on the public record makes clear the Prime Minister's office was directly involved in deciding grants under the Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program, revising projects on the infamous colour-coded spreadsheet. Can the Minister outline the role the Prime Minister's office played funding car parks for political gain? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, it's uh, it's not unusual for uh, for ministers, prime ministers, to be lobbied, to be engaged in relation uh, to needs in different communities uh, across the country. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, I, I mean, I listen to those. I listen to those opposite. Who, of course, on once again, you know, they, they have their own version of history. You know, they fail to acknowledge the fact that Labor had its own $300 million park and ride fund, don't they? Order. Senator Wong, what a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. The question goes to, and the Prime Minister was asked nine times, did not answer. This minister did not answer. And we are asking in this chamber what role the Prime Minister or his office played in funding these car parks. On the point of order, um, the minister was in order until I think he strayed upon an alternative, um, on, on alternative programs, because I believe to be directly relevant. One needs to be relevant to the multiple programs that were mentioned in the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks Mr President. Well, the question goes to rank hypocrisy, too, in terms of the approach of those opposite. Uh, the Prime Minister certainly played no greater role than I suspect the member for Maribyrnong did in announcing 24 such projects. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Today, Senator today, Mr. Morrison claimed Australians had voted for his commuter car park fund, despite the majority of grants being approved before the election was called. This minister echoed those views recently on insiders. Does this minister really expect Australians to accept the Morrison government using taxpayer money as Liberal Party money on the basis that rorts are okay if you're re-elected? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Well, it seems it's okay for those on that side to, you know, to 
throw mud about something this side of politics does in relation to funding community infrastructure, uh, and they'll call that names. But when they were doing exactly Order. the same thing in the lead up to the last Order. election, when they were doing exactly the same thing, of course, Order it was valuable community left. infrastructure. It was OK Senators for the member Gallagher from Maribyrnong Brown. to run around the country Order. announcing car Senator, parks Order. in different Senator locations. Senator but it's not OK I'll for the coalition to, to do it. Your seat. Before you raise a point of order, Senator Wong, you would have heard me constantly call it. I couldn't hear a word that was being said. Um, <laughs> well, you may have better hearing than I have. I couldn't hear a word as I was calling senators to order. Mr President, I understand the sensitivity this minister has in defending this, but he has now on three occasions avoided answering a question and Senator, resorted, Senator Wong, resorted Senator simply Wong, to I'm going, going to about you to the— your I, all right, well, Senator Wong, there was, I, I, I don't. With the, a, a critique of the content of an answer and whether someone asserts it is an answer or otherwise is not a matter for here. That goes to the content of an answer. Points of order are for direct, direct relevance. I could, genuinely could not hear a word of Senator Birmingham's quite loud voice as I was constantly calling senators to order. So, Senator Birmingham, to continue. Thank, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Mis, Mr. President. I'm happy to come into this place and, uh, and answer uh, serious questions, well-intentioned questions. Uh, I'll deal with the fact that uh, uh, when questions come, of course, from people who hold a consistency in relation to their position. On this matter, I just find it so hypocritical, so amazing that those opposite— Order. Senator Wong, on a point of order? Point of order, direct relevance. This question goes to the expenditure of public monies. It is not, it is not directly relevant within the standing orders for him to simply talk about the Labor Party. Well, I'm not at this, I take that point, Senator Wong, and I ruled that point earlier, but as I've made previously too, a glancing comment um, as you rose to following the minister when the minister made a comment about the opposition at that point, while answering a question about his own comments that contains politically charged phrases in the question, I think an answer of that nature is not is not out of order. I have, I have consistently ruled very tightly when questions are tight, factual questions, um, as I did earlier this week. This was not one of those, and the minister is entitled to defend his own record and statements in a manner he sees fit when they're contained in the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I am simply pointing out the double standard. The coalition announced policy and commitments in relation to investing in community infrastructure in car parks. The Labor Party announced pre-election policy to invest in Order, car parks. Senator Birmingham, Each time of them for the would answer have been funded expired. by the time for the answer has expired. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the magnificent Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education. Can Order. the minister advise the Senate on the specific regional education measures that will lift outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to support? Okay, Senator Scar, on a point of order, which is not common during point, the question. Point of order, Mr. President. There was a clear interjection from the leader of the opposition in relation to. Sorry. Order. I, sorry. We could be here for quite a few weeks in a row. I'm going to ask senators in the first week to take a breath. So the leader of the opposition referred the leader of the opposition referred to my good friend Senator McKenzie as the rorting minister. I think the leader of the opposition should um, withdraw. I first I, I didn't hear it. Sec, I, I didn't hear it, so I, I can't. What I'm going to do that is not in the list of terms that I have traditionally ruled out of order. I will, although if the opposition could listen to me, I am going to seek some advice from the clerk about words that we've asked to withdraw before, and I will come back to the chamber if necessary and upon reviewing the Hansard. But I, I, but I will ask senators to restrain themselves. Um, I'm not certain whether that term has been ruled unparliamentary before, but I will check. Um, I will also urge senators that can I ask senators to listen for a minute? Terms that are parliamentary when used in a general sense are sometimes unparliamentary when specifically directed at a person. That is what I will check about this term. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator McMahon, can you, can you um, continue your question, please? Can you restart your question, please? Because I couldn't hear it. 
Yes, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate on the specific regional education measures that will lift outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children to support closing the gap? The Minister for Regionalisation, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for her question and for her strong representation of the Northern Territory. The Liberal and Nationals government knows that further effort is required to improve educational outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in regional and remote Australia. Indigenous kids, particularly those from remote areas, are more likely to start school behind, with the gap growing throughout their schooling life. And if you start behind, it's incredibly hard to catch up. School attendance rates have not improved, and despite some improvements in literacy and numeracy, about one in four Indigenous students uh, in years five, seven and nine remain below the national minimum standards in reading. We want to turn that around. Since the national agreement was signed, the Commonwealth has taken concrete practical steps to establish partnerships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to develop solutions that work and enable shared decision-making processes. Everything we do under that agreement is in partnership, not just with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, but with states and territories. As announced by the PM today, we're investing $250 million to ensure all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children have a strong and positive start to their learning journey, to be able to access quality education that will assist closing the gap. Significant investment in evidence-based programs are lifting participation and improving literacy rates. $280 million to support improvements in leadership capability, professional development and student outcomes through city to country partnerships, getting high performing uh, metro schools, partnering with Indigenous schools. Uh, Halebury, in my home uh, state, is partnering uh, with an Indigenous school in Darwin, and they're getting great improved increases because you can't be what you can't see. And for often for young people, it's learning from their peers. And that's seen a significant improvement in NAPLAN results uh, as a result of that partnership. We're also investing in Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And that is fantastic news for the Northern Territory. Can you tell me how will the Liberal and National Government's new measures support effective learning and education outcomes? through the development of strong literacy skills. Senator McKenzie. We know that focusing on reading and literacy will help set up Indigenous students for the success in school years and beyond. We're backing what works by providing up to $25 million to scale up evidence-based programs that have already succeeded. We're putting $8 million to support the growth of make it, the program called Making Up Lost Time in Literacy. We're going to double the amount of schools that are uh, going to be participating in that program. That is a program that focuses on a phonics-based approach to literacy skills, because not everybody uh, learns the same way. The government knows how important it is that teachers uh, who are engaged in uh, schools uh, with Indigenous students have the right skills and will provide $5 million to the Good to Great Schools in Australia program that supports better student learning outcomes by improving uh, teaching methods. And we're also going to provide additional funding to support the expansion of the Kimberley Schools project in the Pilbara region of uh, WA. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can you tell me how will the government assist students in remote communities to access a quality secondary education? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, we're not just investing in early childhood care and education, we're not just in schools, but for secondary, uh, we're wanting to make sure that parents and students have choice to determine what works best for them. In remote schools, communities, there can be few, if any, local sc secondary school options, and that's why often boarding or residential schools are an important option for so many uh, children in your home territory, Senator. The government will invest $75 million to help meet the cost of building three new boarding schools in remote Western Australia and the NT, and upgrades to a fourth in the Northern Territory. Indigenous children in regional and remote areas need to see the opportunities available to them. Together, Using the evidence, we can close the gap on Indigenous education outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Yesterday, the minister refused to say whether Mr Morrison agrees with Coalition Senator Rennick's use of social media to undermine a TGA-approved COVID vaccine, which his own government is encouraging Australians to take up. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Rennick? Yes or no? And if not, what action will he take? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, I can't say that I've, uh, that I've reviewed the specific comments of Senator Rennick, and, uh, and I won't always take Senator Watt's word for it. What, uh, what, uh, what I can confirm, Mr. President, well and truly, is the government's very strong support for the vaccination rollout and very strong encouragement for all Australians to get vaccinated at the earliest opportunities, uh, for all Australians to heed the advice in relation to the Order. safety of vaccines and the efficacy of vaccines. The evidence that shows very clearly uh, that both vaccines available in Australia, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, each of them reduce the rate of death uh, when somebody acquires COVID-19 uh, by some uh, 92 per cent and 90 per cent respectively. That is the prime abiding reason and incentive why anyone should get a vaccine. The number one incentive to get vaccinated in Australia because it could save your life. Order. Because it could Senator save the lives Birmingham, of your I have family Senator members. Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. On relevance, the question is simply whether Mr Morrison agrees with Senator Rennick. I think, I, I think Senator Birmingham did address his familiarity or otherwise with that at, when he commenced the question, and I'm reluctant to rule out this material as not directly relevant, given that he started with that point. Senator Birmingham. Right Senator Rennick. Uh, uh, and Senator and, Rennick uh, and uh, Mr President, obviously it was the fact I was talking about the real incentives to get a vaccine that perhaps drew the point of order from Senator Watt, the real incentives to get a vaccine being the fact it will save your life, save the lives of your family members, save the lives of your fellow Australians. And you know what? Australians know that's the real reason to get a vaccine. They know that the real reason to get a vaccine is because of those life-saving properties. It's why Australians participate overwhelmingly in childhood vaccination programs. It's why Australians are turning out in record numbers to participate in this vaccination program. It's why demand is very strong, and that's why the Labor Party policy in relation to handing out $6 billion order. of cash Senator, is so horribly misplaced, Senator Birmingham, Mr President. Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Mr President. The point of order is direct relevance. Uh, it is the case that there was reference to what, Mr. what Senator Rennick was doing, but the question goes to whether the Prime Minister agrees and, if not, what action he will take. Order. Senator Rennick, please. And, and so on the point of order, I, I, I believe Senator Birmingham addre addressed at the commencement of the answer his lack of intimate familiarity with the, quote, the, the comments referred to by Senator Watt, alleged comments referred to by Senator Watt in his question. I will say, however, that while I, was, I made it clear I was reluctant to rule material about the vaccine rollout generally as being not directly relevant, I will say that I do not think commenting on opposition policies meets the direct relevant test. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Now, there was no direct quote in the question, so as I, uh, as I said at the outset, I've not seen whatever the comments that Senator Watt is referring to are. But I'm very clear. The Prime Minister is very clear. The government is very clear in our continuous advocacy around the science, the efficacy, and the encouragement of Australians to get vaccinated Order, as Senator they are doing Birmingham, in record time numbers. For the answer expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. According to his social media, yesterday, Coalition member for Dawson, Mr George Christensen, told the Coalition party room, and I quote, we should not be mandating the wearing of masks and we should not be condoning lockdowns. Does Mr Morrison agree with Mr Christensen? And if Mr Morrison won't take action against Senator Rennick, will he take action against Mr Christensen? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, the Prime Minister has already said Order. he doesn't agree. He's already said publicly he doesn't Order. agree. He's made that perfectly plain, Mr. President. Now, Mr. Now, now, Mr. President, I know that, that Senator Watt thinks there's some ability to run around with a muzzle or a gag or something to address uh, to address these sorts of comments. In the end, Order. we are, and you're the one who wants to keep highlighting these matters. We want to make sure what we highlight 
is firmly, squarely the health advice, Mr. President. That is precisely what we're doing. It's what we're doing in the communications campaigns this government pursues. Now, the member for Dawson's not seeking re-election at the next election. He'll say what he's saying. The government speaks very clearly from the Prime Minister, from the Health Minister, from all the ministers of the government, and from the officials of the Chief Medical Officer and otherwise, to very clearly encourage Australians to get vaccinated. And they're doing so in record numbers, Mr President. 42.4 per cent of all Australians over the age of 16 have now had their first dose, another record day, and we are going to Order, keep providing them the information Senator, and encourage what them to a keep final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Coalition Senator Matt Canavan has criticised public health measures as, and I quote, doing much more damage to our love of liberty and our political system. That's the real threat to us now. Does Mr Morrison agree with Mr Canavan? And importantly, what action Order. will Mr Morrison take to ensure that his MPs back in the government's own public health message? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. And no, and indeed, in a, debate, in a debate only earlier today in this chamber, I responded to Senator, Senator Canavan acknowledging that we did not agree in relation to some of those statements. So we have been very clear in that regard, Order, Mr. Senator President. Watt. I mean, Senator Walt wants to ask about whether or not people agree. I'd love to know whether they all agree with Mr. Albanese's policy, because it didn't go to shadow cabinet apparently. So apparently they didn't get a chance to say in their senior levels, Order. in their executive levels, whether they agree. I can assure you, Mr. President, every member of the cabinet of this government Order, agrees Senator with our Gallagher. approach. Um, Order. Mr. Mr. President, he's order, order. I've got Senator Gallagher on her feet with a point of order. Mr. On my right, Senator Mr. Wong. Mr. President, I, I can't see on my right who's interjecting, but please cease. Senator Rennick, I can see you. <laughs> Senator Gallagher. Point of order, uh, Mr. President. On direct relevance, um, the minister is ignoring your, the guidance you've provided and previous rulings on commenting on opposition policy. I, I, I think by the time you had raised, the minister had moved on from that what I was glancing phrase. But I, I, I take the point, um, and I think the minister has taken the point he sounded like he had moved on. Senator Birmingham. Indeed, Mr President, as I, as I was saying, to finish the sentence I was in, every cabinet minister in our government stands very clearly for the policies of getting this rollout delivered. Our policies are consulted through the Cabinet. They go through the Cabinet and we stand by them. And the fact is that the vaccine rollout is seeing high and growing demand across Australia. That high demand and growing demand is something that we will continue Order, to encourage. Senator Birmingham, Australians time are responding for the to that message and we fact Order, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Rennick. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting Indigenous Australians to upskill and gain employment opportunities to support closing the gap? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. And can I just acknowledge? Uh, Senator O'Sullivan's previous role uh, in working with the Mindaroo Foundation in particular, uh, but his dedication to ensuring that um, Indigenous people were given every opportunity to get a job. Senator O'Sullivan clearly understands the benefits of upskilling, of reskilling, uh, to ensure that people are equipped with what they need, those necessary skills, to move into employment. Mr President, today's release of the Closing the Gap Implementation Plan uh, it was well and truly an important moment for our nation, but it also shows the important work that all partners of this historic agreement are doing to improve the lives of Indigenous Australians. In the 2021-22 budget, the Morrison government delivered funding for substantial reforms to help Indigenous Australians get into quality and long-lasting jobs both now and into the future. That is why we're delivering a $243.6 million new Indigenous skills and jobs advancement package. This is all about improving the economic, the social and the educational outcomes for Indigenous Australians. 
What this investment, Mr. President, includes is around $42.8 million per annum. This will then grow to $60 million per annum in future years to the Indigenous Advancement Strategy for a new skills and employment program. Mr. President, the program will build on the most successful elements of the current Indigenous specific employment programs and focus, so importantly, on upskilling Indigenous Australians for in demand jobs. We want them to get into work, but also putting in place those mechanisms to support them Order, Senator into Cash. employment. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Mr. President, I thank the Minister for that answer. Can I also ask how is the government investing in pilot programs to help Indigenous Australians looking for work? Senator Cash. Again, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. And, uh, Mr. President, we know that continue to closing the gap, and obviously we are all committed to closing the gap, but also to empowering Indigenous Australians. We need to work together with all sectors of the community, with all, all levels of government, uh, to improve opportunities. In the 2021 budget, again, the Morrison government committed to investing in pilot programs to ensure that employment services aligned with the changing job market, and in particular, as we know, COVID-19 has impacted on that job market, but in particular the changing job market in remote Australia, in order to meet the unique needs of job seekers in remote communities. The new pilots will commence in a number of locations by the end of 2021, following, so importantly, a co-design process. Then we will progressively roll out the program Order. Senator Cash. in 2020. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government investing into Indigenous Australian-run businesses, in, particularly in primary industry, to grow and prosper? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And again, as part of our plan, in particular you know, to assist us in securing Australia's recovery, but also to continue to meet the closing the gap employment targets. We are prioritising funding from the Indigenous Advancement Strategy to support economic growth, but also to ensure that we are providing jobs on country. Through the 2021-22 budget, we're delivering $10 million over the next two years to support Indigenous businesses and community organisations involved in the primary industry and land management sector to grow, to prosper and to create more jobs, in particular for Indigenous Australians. By supporting Indigenous businesses, we are working together to improve employment, economic development and social participation. Again, Mr President, we know that to continue to closing the gap, to continue to empower Indigenous Australians, we need to work together with all sectors Order, of government. Senator Cash, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. I'm going to uh, ask Senator Wong to withdraw the interjection directed at Senator McKenzie. So I withdraw, Mr. President. And I understand. Can I get guidance on your ruling that yes. if we say the government are orders, that is not to be withdrawn, but if I say Senator McKenzie is a rorter, that is to be withdrawn. Thank is that, you. Yes, is Senator. That while if I could just read something to the chamber for in response to that query, while and this has been provided previously to um, others who have requested similar advice. While the word "rort" is not itself unparliamentary, an allegation that a senator rorted a program would be considered out of order in Senate proceedings on the basis of the prohibition in Standing Order 1933 against imputations of improper motives and personal reflections made against senators and members. So going to the point I made to Senator Scar, it is when it is directed in a personal nature. Thanks, senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. There are, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck and Birmingham uh, to the questions asked by Senator Keneally and I. Now, we all know that Australia and the world is currently in the grip of the worst pandemic we have seen in the world for decades. Australians are being asked to make huge sacrifices right now uh, particularly those in lockdown areas in Sydney and South East Queensland, but also the millions of other Australians who are suffering economic, uh, mental health and other harm uh, as a result of the pan pandemic 
and the government's failure to do its job with vaccines and quarantine. But despite the fact that Australians are making huge sacrifices, day after day, night after night, we see members of this government running active disinformation campaigns on various social media platforms. The chief offenders, of course, are the member for Dawson, Mr Christensen, and two senators in this chamber, Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick, day after day, night after night, spreading anti-science, anti-mask, anti-lockdown, uh, all sorts of disinformation designed to confuse Australians, to make them doubt the science, to make them doubt the public health uh, orders uh, and advice that is being given. And they do this completely unrestrained by any member of their own government. Now, earlier this year, uh, this government encouraged the private sector to bring in place a, a voluntary code of conduct around disinf disinformation on social media. But day after day, night after night, we see members of this government actively promoting disinformation about COVID on a range of social media platforms. And they do this without any action being taken by their own government, which not only has a code of conduct about disinformation in social media, but is out there every day uh, uh, encouraging and arguing to Australians that we all do the right thing because we are all in this together. Now, we quoted a couple of examples uh, in question time both today and yesterday of Senator Rennick uh, sharing articles that undermine TGA-approved COVID vaccines, vaccines which his own government is encouraging Australians to take up. Mr Christensen uh, is promoting uh, views uh, and, and arguing in, in social media that we should not be mandating the wearing of masks. We shouldn't be condoning lockdowns. And again, day after day, we see Senator Canavan on social media arguing that we should, quote, end the lockdowns, amongst many other things. Uh, now, when these are put to uh, Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister, uh, and he is asked uh, what action the government will take, that is the one question that Senator Birmingham will not answer, because the truth is that neither he nor the Prime Minister, nor for that matter any member of this government, will take any action against their rogue backbenchers who are out there running an active disinformation campaign in the Australian public, designed to confuse people, designed to make people doubt the public health advice that is being given, uh, uh, designed Watt, to please, run against their own Senator policies. Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Rennick. Uh, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Chair, could Senator Watt please point out what the actual information I said is actually disinformation, be more specific, uh, rather than you, just Senator casting Rennick. general aspersions. Senator Rennick, uh, points of order need to be around the standing orders. That's the debating point. Thank you. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I've already done that only about 30 seconds ago, if Senator Kenneth Rennick would care to look back at it. So three times today, Senator Birmingham was asked what action the Prime Minister would take uh, about the disinformation cam that is, campaign that has been, running, been run by three members of this government. Uh, and three times he wouldn't answer that question, and that is because this government is not going to take any action uh, against any of their members who are out there running disinformation about COVID. How can we expect Australians to do the right thing and to follow the public health advice that this government is actually encouraging them to follow when the government's own members of parliament are out there spreading anti-mask, anti-lockdown, anti-science, anti-vaccine views day after day after day with complete impunity, with a complete lack of action uh, from anyone in this government. So it's OK for Mr Morrison and other ministers to be out there encouraging, ordering, demanding Australians to do the right thing, but they do nothing about the fact that their own government members are out there encouraging Australians to do exactly the opposite. Why won't this Prime Minister act on his rogue backbenchers? There are only two possible reasons. One is that he is too scared that they will withdraw support for his government and that they won't vote for the government's actions and he's not prepared to, prepared to stand up for them. Or the other reason, which is probably worse, is that this is a deliberate strategy from this government to court far-right extremist conspiracist views while attempting to uh, uh, position themselves Thank in the middle you, ground. Senator it's White, a disgrace. Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I think it's quite remarkable for um, Senator Watt to stand up here and talk about um, 
a handful of uh, examples of people who uh, are spreading misinformation, disinformation. These people are backbenchers, uh, and you know, whereas from Senator Watt's own state, their own chief health officer has been one of the keys to turning people off vaccinations. Jeanette Young saying she would rather see 18-year-olds get COVID, this age group that is now recognised as being super spreaders because they get minimal symptoms, they are active and they work and they need to work, but they're out there. She's telling them she'd rather see them get COVID than get AstraZeneca. I mean, that is just the example of you want to address misinformation, how about look in your own team as well? And uh, for Labor to get up here today, let's just think for a minute. What else has happened today? I mean, I'm not focused on what uh, Mr Christensen, member for Dawson, is putting on his social media. I'm not focused on what Senator Rennick is putting on his social media. No, no one is. So why are you concerned, Senator Watt? Why are you concerned? What I am more interested in, what else has happened today? We had a significant closing the gap statement this morning, but Labor are more concerned about trying to score cheap political points on vaccin vaccination rollout than actually focus on something significant, something that means a lot to a significant portion of our population. Maybe it's because Labor are concerned that even though they initiated the closing the gap process, which is welcome which is a great process, born of the best intentions. But to date, it hasn't been achieving our goals. That is why our government brought together a new 10-year agreement, signed by all Australian governments. So it is not just the purview of the Commonwealth. The Coalition of Peaks and the Australian Local Government Association are also involved, and over 50 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations have been involved in the process. Finally, instead of a top-down approach, we are actually involving the people most impacted by this vital policy area. But because Labor only, they only care about vaccinations today, well, let's talk about the vaccination of the Indigenous population on this remarkable day. As at 4 August, we have vaccinated over 146,000 people who identify as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islanders. They've received at least one dose. That's 25 per cent of the eligible uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population aged 16 and over. 11 per cent of their population have received a second dose. And now, this is quite an achievement when you consider that earlier on in the vaccination rollout, this population was one of the most vaccine-hesitant populations. I commend the efforts of the Aboriginal health uh, services that have gone to great lengths to educate and communicate with their communities and get these vaccinations into their arms. I commend the work of the Royal Flying Doctor Services who have been out and about in 88 of our most remote communities and have delivered nearly 10,000 doses of vaccination. I, I, I come back to, however, the overall health overview for our Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, because this is a very important part to close the gap. We know that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have worse health outcomes. But our Closing the Gap statement today is supported by more than $1 billion in targeted investment to close the gap across multiple areas, but including nearly $300 million for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services. So, you know, let's focus on what matters. Let's focus on what's real. Let's stop focusing on backbenchers' social media and start focusing on what matters. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Carr. Sure, Madam Deputy President, the pandemic, of course, is one of the great crises that's been facing 
our society, and I think it, internationally it's reshaping the way in which we live. And so for the day when the minister Colback indicated that the government acknowledged that it had challenges in terms of its capacity to provide sufficient supply for what it acknowledges itself as being the key to finding solutions to this pandemic in terms of supply and the logistics of the vaccines, I think he's underestimating the difficulties that the government has brought on itself. It strikes me that the government has mismanaged this crisis at every level. From the very beginning of the crisis, the government has sought effectively to present this as a political challenge to take advantage, political advantage, and has sought to play favourites with the states. It's sought to uh, underestimate the capacity of Australians to deal with the truth in regard to this matter, has failed to acknowledge the importance of our own manufacturing capacity has failed to deal with it any real way that uh, or any understanding of the international questions when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, has failed to come to grips with the basic questions in terms of um, the major health crisis faced with this, uh, with this uh, pandemic. In fact, we had this protracted debate about whether or not we should concentrate on the economics of uh, the country versus the health of the country, and it's played out through the government's attempt to blame one state over another, and of course to try to uh, fail to deal with, I think, uh, the personalities involved with this matter. I'm particularly concerned um, that we have not been able to develop our own manufacturing capacity. While I acknowledge how important it is for AstraZeneca, for instance, to be able to make vaccines in Australia. I find it extraordinary that the government is not able to even provide us with the most basic information on the supply contracts that are engaged with that matter, claiming, of course, that it says national security is involved. Now, when the uh, ABC sought under Freedom of Information details of the supply contract uh, for AstraZeneca, they were told that such uh, provision of uh, such contracts would prevent a major risk to the national security of the country, despite the fact that the European Union, United Kingdom, the United States, Mexico, Brazil have taken an entirely different approach to the provision of basic public information about those supply contracts. And so we, it doesn't excuse the failure of the government to deal with the fundamentals in terms of not being able to provide sufficient vaccines for the people of this country. We saw, for instance, their lapsadaisical attitude to the provision of different types of vaccines, the uh, catastrophe that emerged around the uh, provision of the Pfizer vaccines, where we saw the minister's attempt to duck and weave about his direct engagement with Pfizer, where industry sources indicated that he, rather than his uh, believing, it, as he tried to imply, that there was just a matter for low-level public servants who were the bunglers in regard to the contract arrangements that industry sources had highlighted through the ABC that the minister himself had been rude, dismissive and penny-pinching when it came to dealing with the senior management of Pfizer. We saw with the R&D, global R&D, a uh, former R uh, president of the global R&D, John uh, Lamantina from Pfizer, under underscored this point about how unfortunate it was that Australia had failed to secure the necessary supplies of the Pfizer vaccine because of the failure, the failure of the government to understand basic elements of supply chains and basic elements of how the pharmaceutical industry actually worked globally and made worse by the minister's direct assault upon individuals within that company. Now, I find it extraordinary that the government has tried to duck and weave and not able to even deal with basic issues around the mRNA vaccine production facilities when it should have been able to move much more quickly and to be able to deal with these fundamental questions. Now, it's not too late. It's not, uh, it is, of course, still time for us to be able to develop the necessary sovereign capability to ensure that we can protect this country and we can ensure that the people of this country can enjoy the benefits of modern science and modern manufacturing processes. Thank you, Senator Carr. Your time has expired. Senator Small.
Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And uh, whilst Senator Watts had a lot to say about potential misinformation today, it's not the first time uh, that Senator Watt has focused on this. Indeed, in uh, estimates only two months ago, the Senator was giving air to an article, and I quote, which refers to a public health English blueprint study in the UK that found both AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines were only 33 per cent effective against the Indian variant three weeks after the first dose. So at the same time as this government was getting on with the business of rolling out the vaccine, of protecting lives and livelihoods, Senator Watt was scaremongering and undermining the effectiveness of our vaccine rollout in this parliament. Professor Kelly goes on to say, uh, in response to Senator Watt, that she's actually read the article and she is always wary of preprint articles. A preprint article means it has not gone through the usual peer review processes that is required. We found all through the COVID-19 pandemic that many of those articles have proven to be false. So when it comes to uh, talking, in fact lecturing, this chamber about spreading misinformation, Madam Deputy President, I won't take it from Senator Watt. On the very real questions of sovereign vaccine manufacturing that Senator Carr raises today, this is a government that has a story to tell of which all Australians can rightfully be proud. Not only was Australia the first country in the world to close its international borders at the onset of the pandemic, but Australia took the decision in August of 2020 to ensure we had sovereign vaccine manufacturing capability in this nation. It's worth noting that mRNA vaccines had never received widespread approval for use in humans before COVID-19 uh, was affecting the world in 2020. mRNA vaccines are at the cutting edge of medical science, and Australia has, in fact, uh, asked for proposals from local manufacturers to ensure that we develop this capability here in Australia. Other nations have done the same. Singapore, for instance, uh, has started uh, the process of developing mRNA vaccine manufacturing capability and expects it to be up and running in 2023. So whilst we've received a dozen proposals which are in the process of being assessed, the best advice that the government has is that it's between one and three years from concluding that sort of arrangement to the vaccine manufacturing capability being a reality. So far from the lies and misinformation that we hear from those opposite, seeking to scare and frighten the Australian people at a time when they are seeking to do the right thing by themselves, to do the right things by their loved ones and to do the right thing by their nation, to roll up their sleeves and go and get vaccinated, as we're seeing in record numbers. Just yesterday, uh, yet again, a new record of almost 214,000 vaccines in arms in Australia right now. And that was without trying to bribe them, as the Labor Party have sought to do, showing that they've learnt nothing from their previous errors in government, where we saw cash for clunkers, we saw pink bats, we saw school halls, we saw checks to dead people. No, they've learnt nothing from that. They've learnt nothing from eight years on the opposition benches. But in trying to bribe the Australian people to do what they are doing in overwhelming numbers, they have showed they have learned nothing from their previous mistakes and that they are not fit to sit on the government benches in this parliament. The PM has acknowledged the challenges that we have faced in an unprecedented vaccine uh, rollout, the first time the nation has had to confront such a challenge. It is testament, uh, therefore, that we have a great story to tell, having protected lives and livelihoods, a death rate uh, that is uh, the second lowest in the OECD. And in fact, if we had the OECD average mortality rate, some 30,000 additional Australians who are currently here would not be alive. That is the cold, hard fact of the success of this government in protecting lives and livelihoods throughout the, the pandemic. And in the face of the misinformation, the lies and the scaremongering from the Labor Party, we will remain resolute in continuing to deliver for Australians. Thank you, Senator Small. I believe we've got Senator Sheldon by remote. Yes, Senator. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I want to speak um, 
into question to questions uh, that were put to Senator Colbeck and the answers he gave. I want to speak out in support of pharmacists across New South Wales, particularly in southwest Sydney, who are pleading for support from the Morrison government. They're struggling to grapple with the Morrison government's failed vaccine rollout. Now, today marked yet another record high of cases and deaths in the Sydney COVID-19 outbreak. 262 new cases and, very tragically, five deaths. We desperately need to increase vaccination rates in hotspot areas. Yet the Sydney Morning Herald reported only today that the vaccine rollout through pharmacies in New South Wales has fallen desperately behind. In April, 1,250 pharmacies in New South Wales were authorised to administer AstraZeneca vaccines. Yet here we are in August, and only 314 pharmacies in this state are now putting jabs into arms. 314 pharmacies out of 1,250 authorised. That is just 25%. Because, yeah, why? Because, they, because, yeah, why haven't they been able to get the vaccine? Uh, you put the shots in the arms because the vaccines aren't there. They haven't turned around. The government did not prepare itself for this particular um, pandemic, as we've had opportunities during this year to do it, and during last year, and almost uh, uh, for two years now. Now, the prime minister failed to secure an adequate supply of different vaccines. The prime minister failed to set up an adequate national quarantine system. And now the Prime Minister has failed to establish an adequate vaccination scheme through our network of pharmacies. So what's happened? The Pharmacy Guild of Australia, New South Wales branch, pins the blame on the federal government rollout plans. There is an existing community service obligation wholesale network with established cold chain lines which ensure the delivery of essential medicines around Australia within just 24 hours. This existing system was entirely suitable to manage the rollout of COVID-19 pharmacies, vaccines to pharmacies. Now, the Pharmacy Guild says this would have fast track the rollout, rather than enable pharmacies, would have enabled pharmacies to access COVID-19 vaccines through this established system. The Morrison government set up an entirely new parallel system. And now we have a situation where only 25% of authorised pharmacies are receiving vaccines. And even those few pharmacies fortunate enough to receive vaccines are suffering lengthy delays. Pharmac pharmacist Mario Barone, Barone, in doing the brave and essential work of vaccinating Australians in Fairfield, the epicentre of the current outbreak, he said it's taking more than two weeks for his AstraZeneca orders to arrive. It is communities in Fairfield, in Canterbury, Bankstown, in Liverpool, and other parts of West and Southwest Sydney that have borne the brunt of this outbreak. Some of the most marginalised and disadvantaged communities in Sydney. And they are being hit hardest by the failure of the Prime Minister's rollout. Southwest Sydney has the lowest rate of full vaccination in Sydney at just 14.6%. Out of Southwest Sydney is just 17.8%. And the outer west, um, southwest, um, is 17.8%, uh, and the outer west is just 17.9%. It is the wealthiest enclaves of Sydney where vaccination rates are highest, and the eastern and northern suburbs where rates are as high as 26.9%. While hardworking middle class Australians are yet to get, be, be, uh, and have been left be, yet to get again being left behind by this government. I want to quote another pharmacist, Port Macquarie-based Judy Blunkett. Uh, Judy, uh, Ms Blunkett, uh, said that who is yet to receive a single vaccine dose, she said, I quote, it has been singularly the most frustrating thing in all of our lives for the past six months. If pharmacies were brought on in April, we could have done tens of thousands of doses by now. Every barrier has been put in front of us. Australians are sick of this government putting barriers up. It's about time the Morrison government took responsibility and gave them a helping hand. 
you know, they should be looking at a whole Thank series you, of Senator initiatives. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy President, I rise to take note of answers provided uh, uh, by the minister representing the Minister for the Environment, uh, Susan lay, lay off the Reef. Um, um, Senator Wish Wilson, please refer to Susan Lay. Thank you. Deputy President, um, I think in uh, my my tenth year here in this chamber, I can honestly say, and I can put my hand on my heart, just like the minister did today and say that of all the cynical, you know, unfathomable, you know, unconscionable things that I've seen in this place by this government, the environment minister, in the middle of a worsening pandemic, at taxpayers' expense, flying around the world to lobby the 21-member nation of UNESCO's World Heritage Committee to vote against the science provided by the IUCN Scientific Committee to that UNESCO committee that they should list the Great Barrier Reef in danger, because climate change primarily, along with deteriorating water quality, threatens the world heritage values of that property. None of us in here can dodge the fact that the reef, especially in the last 10 years, has suffered catastrophic decline. Four mass coral bleachings in the last decade, when coral bleachings caused by warming oceans, caused by burning fossil fuels, haven't occurred in history until 1998. In any of the records that we have, there's been no, no incidences of these mass coral bleachings. Our best climate science models in this decade predicted it wasn't possible to get back-to-back -back bleachings of the Barrier Reef till 2050 based on emissions targets, yet that's exactly what we got in 2016 and 2017. And while you deny that the reef is in danger, while you fail to act, while you prosecute a political pathway to deny, then you will fail to act. That's what this is about, Acting Deputy President. The, the only thing I could get out of the minister today was that somehow this salvaged Australia's reputation. This is not about Australia's reputation. This is about the future of the Barrier Reef and the UNESCO World Heritage Committee sending the strongest possible signal that the global community, not just Australia, but the global community, needs to act on reducing emissions, at least in line with the Paris Agreement. I couldn't think of a stronger possible siren call to action than for the Barrier Reef, the world's greatest natural wonder, to be listed in danger because of climate change. The Minister, Minister Lay has also, in recent weeks, said in a series of interviews that somehow her reason for lobbying against the World Heritage in, in Danger listing was to stop scientists from becoming depressed. Well, what a load of rot. I can tell you many good scientists are thoroughly depressed at what they have seen unfold before their eyes in the last decade on the Great Barrier Reef. They have devoted their life to studying and promoting the health of the reef, and they are witnessing its decline. And they are witnessing this government promoting fossil fuels, giving public money to new fossil fuel projects, to Adani, to Beetaloo, to new fossil fuel power stations. They have witnessed 80,000 square kilometres of our oceans being handed to fossil fuel companies to go out and explore for the next fossil fuel bonanza in a time of climate emergency. They have witnessed this. What could depress those scientists more than seeing a government in denial? a government deliberately peddling the interests of fossil fuel companies that, by the way, donate to this government and keep them in business. How cynical is that? She also said it was offensive to the reputation of First Australians. How, in, how the hell is this offensive to the reputation of First Australians? They're watching what we are doing in our lifetime 
in our colonial world what we have done to the reef in just a very short period of time. After spending 40 to 60,000 years living in harmony with a barrier reef and its thousands of kilometres of ecosystems, I can't believe the Australian people are that stupid that they would buy the arguments of this environment minister, who has lobbied against climate action and lobbied directly for climate denial, lobbied to cover up the truth of the Great Barrier Reef. The only thing that will save the reef is the truth and action, because we have no choice. This is not the last you will hear of this president. The committee will be Thank revisiting you, Senator this Wilson. next year. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wish Wilson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, that concludes taking note. We'll now move to tabling <coughs> and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator. Senator on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present two reports as listed at item 15 of today's order of business together with the accompanying documents. Uh, the Human Rights Scrutiny Report No. 9 of 2021 and the Parents Next Examination of Social Security Parenting Payment Participation Requirements Class of Persons Instrument 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I, I uh, let you know that I, I believe both Senator Seward and Senator Thorpe would be seeking the call to speak to this. Okay, so Senator, I can see Senator Thorpe there. So we might start. Could you just move to take note? Thanks. To take note of that. Report. Thank you, and I'll call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the report tabled by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights on its inquiry into the Parents Next Social Security instrument. The instrument sets out who is required to fulfil certain participation requirements to receive the Parents Next support payments. If people don't comply with the requirements, they risk suspension of their income payments or even cancellation altogether. During the inquiry, we heard from so many women because it is overwhelmingly women who participate in this program and the support services that advocate with them. So I thank them all for sharing their heartfelt stories and the real stories of struggle. The evidence we heard was overwhelming. It is not necessary to make participation in this program compulsory. In fact, it is counterproductive and often harmful. There are so many circumstances that can contribute to someone not being able to participate in the required activities. In the current system, a participant has to worry about failing to comply with program requirements, or she might not be able to meet the basic needs of her family, like putting food on the table, having a roof over their heads, paying the bills for, for, for transport or children's activities. That all goes. Once mum's payments are taken, kids go hungry. Theoretically, the system allows for ex exemptions in cases of family violence, but realistically, there will be other priorities to address first, such as ensuring the family's safety. Dealing with the bureaucracy of social services is not another complication women need on top of what they're dealing with. Unfortunately, these cases happen all too often, with some providers stating that up to 80 per cent of their participants are affected by domestic violence—80 per cent of participants. And imagine the pressure on single parents. My heart goes out to all those single mothers out there, having been one and having the same struggles. I know what that's like, and I just uh, send my my love and um, heartfelt feelings to you, and and know that I've been there, but also know that when I speak here in this chamber, that I'm speaking from experience. And I hope that uh, we try and get some kind of justice for you all out there. 
I know how hard it is and how much hard work it is as a single mum uh, having the bureaucracy and the government come down on you in this way. You don't need the government to put more pressure on when you already give everything you can. As I said earlier, it is almost entirely women who are affected by this program and First Nations women disproportionately so. The kinship systems of our families and our women is different. Our women are burdened with more complex responsibilities and caring obligations that unfortunately are not understood by the bureaucratic system that we have to deal with. My people have to deal with sexism, racism on a regular basis. So many don't know what it's like to have the incredible burdens that we carry as black women. I appear before you today as a senator because I benefited from a job employment training program 30 years ago through Centrelink. And that set me an employment path. That program was voluntary and helped me at a very difficult time in my life to be able to rebuild my life uh, at 17 with a three-month-old baby. It enabled me to educate myself and get further training, find a job. And what do you know, I became a Centrelink manager. I wanted to participate in the program and make the most of it, but there were also times when that would have been difficult for me. Most women in Parents Next want to get back into the job market or want to continue their education, but they also want to look after their children. These women know best how to deal with their individual situations and have their own educational and career objectives and aspirations. It should be up to them to choose to participate in a program and what activities are most useful to achieve those objectives. Surely that makes sense to everybody listening. Surely. The government uh, obviously doesn't get it because they're so privileged in their bubble. This is what self-determination means. It means allowing people, particularly our people, to be in the driver's seat and make our own decisions about our own lives and be able to control our own destiny regardless of whether we are on income support or not. I'm very happy today that the committee's first and foremost recommendation is to abolish the targeted compliance framework and make Parents Next participation voluntary. This could provide the support parents need and want, while at the same time ensuring participants stay motivated and most importantly, safe. I hope that the government will hear the voices in this report and act on these recommendations. It's time to abolish the compulsory requirements of Parents Next. And I just want to uh, reiterate that unless you have been there, unless you have struggled, unless you have a mob of kids that are uh, screaming for your attention and who sometimes get sick and you have to care for them, unless you've been in that situation, then you don't know. When Centrelink cut your payments off and you have to feed your children and you have to get your kids to their sports and all of the other things your kids want to do and you've got no money, and you have to keep your children happy at the same time as keep your, your landlord happy to be able to pay rent. How do you do that when your payments are being cut off because you couldn't get to an appointment or the uh, Parents Next provider rang once, you didn't answer, so they cut you off anyway. Uh, I just want to say to all of those, uh, particularly those single mums out there who have experienced this, and who gave their time 
and their energy to actually bring their personal stories to this inquiry. I want to say thank you and thank you for standing up and thank you for speaking for so many other single mums out there and dads because this happens to them too but we know that women are most affected, especially black women. Uh, so I want to thank you all for participating and I hope that the government sees uh, this as an important change to ensure that more of our people on this kind of income support get better opportunities in the way that suits them best. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I'll go to Senator Seawitt on remote. Thank you, Deputy President. I too would like to take note of this important report, which is, of course, the Parliamentary Joint Committee um, on Human Rights um, report on Parents Next examination of the instrument that in fact extends and changes parenting parents next. This is an issue that I have raised repeatedly in the Senate. And I'm really pleased to see the recommendation that this program be made voluntary. This is very familiar recommendation to me, given that it's basically the same one that I made for the Australian Greens in our additional comments to the Senate Community Affairs References Committee inquiry into the program, which I referred and chaired in, uh, in 2018. I urge the government to read this report and to implement this recommendation. Rather than being supported to raise their children, women are being subjected to a mandatory program that is resulting in adverse outcomes such as having to give up work days and study to meet program requirements or lose their payment because their children's medical appointments conflict with appointments with providers. This program is an ideological program to, uh, um, that impacts on people on income support. And it's heartbreaking to read the submissions which, and the points that were raised by the people that submitted to the inquiry, which as Senator Thorpe has just outlined, is this program predominantly affects single mothers. These issues that were raised during this inquiry, I feel like deja vu because they're the same issues that were raised or very similar issues that were raised during the Senate Community Affairs Inquiry into this program. The issues raised in uh, this inquiry were grouped into categories that included results arising out of participation in various activities. These are the results that arise under various activities under Parents Next. Questions as to whether Parents Next needs to be compulsory in order to succeed and suggestions as to less rights restrictive alternatives, the inflexibility of the targeted compliance framework and the Parents Next program design, as well as the practical absence of flexibility in the administration of the program, the absence of key supports to help participants engage in Parents Next and the hidden costs associated with participation, harm caused to parents and children by the application of the, the targeted compliance framework including the undermining of intended positive impacts of Parents Next, an inability by participants to meet their basic needs or those of the children, where their, parent, where their payments have been cut off and the absence of a process by which to assess the risk of this occurring. The particular risks of harm to women and children who have experienced family violence, the disproportionate impact on Indigenous women, generally particularly where financial penalties were being applied for non-compliance with mutual obligations and a lack of consultation. The incompatibility with Australia's international human rights, legal obligations. Submitters and witnesses primarily submitted that the Parents Next program should either cease or if it were to continue, that the targeted compliance framework should no longer be applied to it and, the partic and that participation should be voluntary. This program takes choice and control from women. It, it, the government seeks to control women through this program. Receive, receiving social security in the form of a uh, parenting payment should not call into question the quality of a, of a recipient's parenting. This program views mothers of young children as unemployed workers, when in fact they are working long hours raising the next generation. Parents, particularly single parents, should not be forced into employment. 
One of the key flaws and sources of distress for sole parents is the constant threat that a payment will be suspended or cancelled. And then how do they support their family? Studies show that people who have been subject to harsh compliance um, policies experience very high levels of psychological distress, which interferes with their capacity for long-term planning and effective engagement with employment. And we've heard that loud and clear through the submissions to this inquiry, as well as to, this, to the Community Affairs Inquiry in 2018. Children are living in poverty because this government is cutting off their parents' access to income. When a parent's payment is suspended or cancelled, it is their children who face the consequences. The government shouldn't be trying to turn at every turn to police people's lives or chuck them off their payments that are vital to their well-being and particularly and most importantly to their family's well-being. This program is a dud. It hurts people. It should be cancelled. It should and then support. If the government is genuine supporting parents that want to engage voluntary, generate a program or develop a program in consultation with those that are being affected to find the best ways of supporting any pre-employment programs or support programs for the people that the government um, is claims they're aiming to support. Parents Next is a failure. It hurts people and should cease. Um, if anybody else, if there's not anyone else speaking to this, I'd seek leave to continue my remarks. I think that's fine. Thanks, uh, Senator Seward. Um, so the, yeah, all right. Um, that concludes those reports. I think Senator Patterson, you're presenting. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, I present the advisory report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Identified Disrupt Bill 2020, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. This bill introduces a data disruption warrant which enables the AFP and the ACIC to access data on one or more computers and perform disruption activities for the purpose of frustrating the commission of criminal activity. A network activity warrant to enable the AFP and the ACIC to collect intelligence on criminal networks operating online. An account takeover warrant to allow the AFP and the ACIC to take over a person's online account for the purposes of gathering evidence of a criminal activity and minor amendments to the controlled operations regime to ensure controlled operations can be conducted effectively in the online environment. The bill has been reduced, introduced in response to growing technological advancement that challenges the ability of our law enforcement and intelligence agencies to combat the most serious types of offending, including human trafficking, drug crime, child sexual abuse and terrorism, increasingly conducted on forums and in places that most Australians will never see. Ms. Madam Acadeb and President, it is no exaggeration to state that, particularly during the COVID pandemic, online crime has reached an all-time high. Evidence from the AFP Commissioner, Rhys Kershaw, informed the committee that the AFP has seen a worrying rise in traffic to the dark web, including a 168 per cent more child abuse material identified during the first quarter of 2020, as opposed to the same period in 2019. The committee supports the bill and the three new warrants it introduces. However, in its consideration of the bill, the committee has also recognised the significance of the new powers and their potential impact. The committee concluded that oversight should be increased and safeguards should be added to ensure the community has confidence that these powers are only used for their intended purpose while remaining operationally effective. The committee has made 34 detailed recommendations, and given the time limitations, I'll just make a brief mention of the most significant. Recognising the novel nature of these powers and their intelligence gathering capability, the committee, through recommendations one and two, recommends the expansion of its oversight remit to cover the intelligence functions of the ACIC and the AFP. As those agencies take on more intelligence capabilities, we believe the Intelligence Committee is best placed to provide the specialised parliamentary oversight required. In recommendation nine, the committee proposes that these powers should be authorised by superior court judges, with the exception of account takeover warrants, where we believe any eligible judge, as defined by the Surveillance Devices Act, is the appropriate authority due to their inherently time-sensitive nature. 
In Recommendation 10, the committee suggests that the issuing authority be required to consider the type of offences that they are sufficiently serious and proportionate to the threat for the new warrants to be used. The combined effect of these proposed changes would be to strengthen the issuing criteria to ensure the powers are being used only for the most serious types of offending as outlined in the Bill's explanatory memorandum. These offences include offences against the security of the Commonwealth per Chapter 5 of the Criminal Code, offences against humanity including child exploitation and human trafficking uh, in Chapter 8 of the Criminal Code, serious drug, weapons and criminal associations offences per Chapter 9 of the Criminal Code, and money laundering and cybercrime offences found in Chapter 10 of the Criminal Code. It is important that these new powers, that new powers such as these proposed in this bill, are adequately reviewed. The committee has recommended that the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor review the powers within three years of the bill receiving royal assent. The committee has also recommended that it review the provisions of the bill not less than four years from when the bill receives royal assent to allow the committee to take into account any report by the insulum. Additionally, the committee has recommended that each of the new powers sunset five years from the date on which the bill receives royal assent. I want to thank each of my colleagues on the committee for their constructive and collaborative deliberations in reaching these balanced conclusions. The committee also extends its gratitude to the officers of the AFP and the ACIC, who have taken time away from their critical daily work to ensure that all members were appropriately briefed and informed to make these recommendations on the bill. These included classified briefings to ensure the committee members had a clear understanding of the rapidly evolving and serious threat environment that officers are grappling with. We thank them for their candour and their cooperation with the committee. The committee recommends that following the implementation of its recommendations, the bill be passed. I commend the report to the Senate and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, okay, I'm going to call uh, Senator Davey. Well, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, I present the report of the Committee on the Operation of the Australian Crime Commission Amendment Special Operations and Special Investigations Act 2019, together with the accompanying documents. Thank you, Senator Davey. Um, we'll now move to uh, consideration of documents. So they're the documents are listed on pages six to eight of the notice paper, and I remind senators that um, any document to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. And we'll start with the documents on page eight. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Page eight or page six? I beg your pardon. I'm way ahead of myself. You are. Page six. Thank you very much, <laughs> Madam Deputy President. Uh, I take note of document one and two and three on page six and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, uh, Senator Seawitt. And we'll now move to the documents listed on page seven. Senator Urquhart. I take note of document four, eight uh, and 13 on page seven and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. We'll now move to, um, there's one other document on the top of page 14 before we go to community reports and government responses. Document 14 on page 8, Deputy Sorry. President. I will uh, seek to take note of that and um, seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. We'll now move to committee reports and government responses starting on page 8. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I take note of document 4, 5, 6. 6, 9 and 10 on page 8 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. We we'll now move to the rest of those documents, 11 to 15 on page 9. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Uh, I take note of documents 11, 12, 13, 14 and 15 on page 9 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of the Auditor-General's report. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I take note of documents 1, 2 and 3 on page 9 of the Auditor-General reports and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, are there any ministerial statements? Senator Mackenzie. Uh, table doc 
documents relating to the following uh, orders for the production of documents concerning the Doherty Institute modelling of COVID-19 vaccination targets and COVID-19 vaccination certificates. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, Senator McKenzie. Wow, I'm having a bad day, am I? <laughs> Senator McKenzie. Thank you. On behalf of the Prime Minister, I table the annual report on closing the gap and accompanying ministerial statement. For the information of senators, the documents will be considered next Wednesday during government business time. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of general business, and I call the clerk. General Business Notice of Motion Number 1203, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, relating to Anti-Corruption Commission. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy uh, President. And um, Labor has brought this motion to the chamber today because of. Um, <coughs> uh, Senator Gallagher, could you just move the motion? I'll move the motion. Yeah. Sure. I move the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Labor has uh, brought this motion to the chamber to deba today for debate because of the concerns we have with the behaviour of this government and the way it uses uh, public money as though it's Liberal Party money. Uh, and we have seen example after example after example of this. And it seems after eight years this government no longer even pretends to care about having proper process and integrity in government decisions, particularly when it comes to allocating public funds. Uh, and I will go through some examples of this. But I think this um, issue of declining standards, lack of integrity, and this, this culture of rorting, because there isn't a more appropriate word that I can use for it, comes right from the top of this government. I think when you track back and look at how some of these funds, which have been uh, very clearly used for political purposes only. Uh, when you track back and look at how some of the decisions that were made, they were made by Mr Morrison when he was treasurer and when Mr Gaitchens uh, was advising. And then when they moved into being chief of, or head of PM&C and, and prime minister, when that decision was taken, we saw the explosion in these funds and we see a pattern. What happens is a fund is announced, millions of dollars, sometimes billions of dollars, are placed in these funds. Those funds sit there unallocated, and then there's some sort of dodgy process that's put around them, usually in the lead up to an election, and it has been politically successful for them, so why would they want to stop? Uh, but what we see is decisions taken on the eve of the election. We saw this with sports rorts. Um, where we saw projects signed off, then projects a week before caretaker, then projects changed, and then discussions between officers about who gets how much of the money and where it goes and what was politically more beneficial for the government, even being made after caretaker, and nobody cares because no one's policing caretaker anymore. We've been through that with Mr Gaitens. Um, and these decisions are made. And then election promises are given when decisions have been made in government, as executive government, when money has been provided in the pre-election budget update. So it's all done under government. And then there's a list of election commitments that are, are then these funds are used to bankroll. And there's not even any pretending about it any longer. When we had a department in front of us and uh, not long ago, and we asked them whether this dodgy allocation of money was going to continue, and this was in relation to the Urban Congestion Fund, a multi-billion dollar fund, whether there was going to be any changes to the way funds were administered out of this fund based on the damning audit report that was done into the community car park projects. And the department's evidence was, no, nope, there will be no change. There's still a billion dollars unallocated in the urban congestion fund, and there will be no change to how this is allocated. So we will see a repeat, no doubt, of what happened in the commuter car park project funds. And 
We saw in this year's budget 21 new funds and grants programs established to um, allocate money—21 on top of the funds they've already got, which we already know have been dodgy. The community development grants—let's have a look at those. Since the last election, $2 billion in this program, including an additional $55 million in this year's budget, 68 per cent of projects went to coalition seats. And since the last election, 66 per cent of all funding went to coalition seats. The Female Facilities and Water Safety pro Program, remember that? 88 per cent of projects went to coalition seats and 98 per cent of funding went to coalition seats. The Community Sports Infrastructure Grant, Sports Rorts, where the ANAO found there was evidence of distribution bias in the award of grant funding. This was over $100 million worth of funding in this. By round three, once they'd got the rorting down pat, once they'd worked out exactly how to do it and to do it to, to the mo utmost political benefit, 73 per cent of round three had not been recommended by Sports Australia and the overwhelming majority of funding went to seats that the coalition was targeting in the election or, or, or wanted to win, either held marginally or wanted to win. The commuter car park fund. Now that's a very special fund. This has been sort of this is like the quintessential way to make sure that public money can be used for public, for private benefit, for Liberal Party benefit. And this had the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, several cabinet ministers up to their eyeballs in it. So what they did, and it's pretty nifty the way they did it, they allocated all this money into a fund at a budget, hoping people wouldn't really notice. On the night the Treasurer said, and we are building commuter car park funds around Australia, what he didn't say was we're actually only going to do it if you meet the top 20 marginal seat list that we've also created and that we are only going to invite MPs or uh, senators, duty senators, to actually apply for that funding. They didn't say that on budget night. I went back and had a look at the budget address. It just said we're going to be, have this congestion-beating commuter car park funds. People were rightly believe, if they'd been watching that, for the whole of Australia. But the fine print that the audit office found was that fund was only open to MPs or duty senators from the coalition who, who actually met the top 20 marginal seat list. How dodgy is that? And out there in plain sight, no one's even pretending. And then they had this, this process, which was called canvassing, where in order to access this $660 million, you got an invitation. First, you had to be on the top 20 marginal seat list. Then you were asked, well, you know, would you like a car park? In the Treasurer's instant, would you like four car parks? OK, you can have four, because we're allocating this. There was no merit base to any of the decisions. This is what the Audit Office found. No merit assessment, no competitive assessment, no recommendations came from the department. And this is the real kicker. 81 per cent of the projects were approved by the Prime Minister himself. How sweet a deal is this? As, as Prime Minister and Treasurer, you get to put all this money into a fund. You don't allocate it. You tell Australia that this is a fund, presumably for everybody. And then, on the eve of the election, you sign off on, on what, 27 car parks, I think, the day before caretaker, for which the department didn't know about them, for which nobody had been able to apply for them, and for which there was no merit base to the decision making. How did the Treasurer know that the four car parks in his electorate actually were going to meet the objectives of the program? Well, that's easy, because there weren't really any objectives to the program. That's another way you design a fund to make sure you can use it for your own political purposes. Well, this has to stop. It has to stop. 
and there is no sign it's going to stop. And the only way it's going to stop, because they're not shamed, you lot aren't shamed by the ANAO. You don't care anymore. Instead of actually dealing with this and the recommendations from it and changing your behaviour, you go out and attack the auditor. That's the way to do it. Throw a bit of mud and hope it sticks. The only way to deal with this is to have a national anti-corruption commission. And where are we? We're almost a thousand days from the day that the Prime Minister said he would introduce an anti-corruption body for, this, for the federal parliament. Every other jurisdiction has one. One thousand days later, I mean, we know this guy has been slow, slow on the vaccine rollout, slow on quarantine, but he actually has a real valid reason to be slow on putting in place some sort of integrity body in this parliament. Because you know what? They might actually have a look at this and get to the bottom of it. The auditor can only look at the department side of running a program. But an anti-corruption body, well, that might be a different story. So is there any reason, any surprise why we are not seeing any movement on it? And only a Labor government will actually introduce a national anti-corruption body and actually reintroduce standards around integrity and honesty in government. Because the situation as it exists now is if you're not on this top 20 list or some other list that, that staffers in ministerial offices have created, bad luck. How about we govern for 151 seats instead of the top 20 seats that you're actually after? There's an idea. How about when we have funds established for sporting programs, for women's change rooms, for building better regions? I notice the Prime Minister's banged in an extra $250 million into that little favourite slush fund this, this budget, hoping that nobody sees it in the, in the $100 billion budget spend. Who's going to notice an extra quarter of a billion dollars going into the Building Better Regions Fund? Who's going to notice? It'll be just sit there, sit there nice and pretty and wait until the election. And then what do we do? We've got the system down pat, don't we? We go and canvass our coalition party room colleagues and say, look, guys, we've got an extra billion here. You're in a bit of trouble in your seat and you're in a bit of trouble and we want to pick that seat off. What do you need? What, what will it cost to get that seat? And who, who cares if it doesn't have any merit process or have any competitive process or actually have any recommendations? And you know what we can do? We can sign it off before we go into caretaker and try and bind another government, and then our election promises will cost nothing because we're just ripping money out of these funds that, w that the rest of Australia thought was for everybody, but it is actually only for our political campaign. That's what you guys are doing. These funds have been corrupted by the process that you have put around them or the lack of process and the lack of honesty. We got told there are maps which allocate the Urban Congestion Fund across states. Maps which say, oh, well, you'll get this much, actually, in that seat we'll give you this much, before any applications are made. And then we've got funds with spreadsheets that tick-tack from minister's office, and it's not just Minister Mackenzie's former role. It's the Prime Minister, Minister Tudge, I think Minister Sukar was involved. The Treasurer was clearly involved because he got four car parks. He was one of the lucky ones. Minister Sukar got quite a few from memory. I think Mr Wilson got a lot down there too. How about that? The commuter car park fund where Melbourne and certain seats in Melbourne got two and a half times more than Sydney, even though Infrastructure Australia acknowledges Sydney has the most congested roads in Australia. Melbourne got two and a half times what Sydney got. And then, and then the, other, the other kicker here, the other kicker here that makes it special is Order. where data shows that it's predominantly the southeast of Melbourne that has the, uh, the congestion that needs fixing, actually allocate the money 
the most sorry, the most congested roads are in the northwest, but the money got allocated in the southeast. No, really. So that I mean, how blatant does it have to be? I mean, honestly, you guys are professional at it. You've written the rule book, and guess what? There are no rules. The only rule is that you want you want to hold your seat or win a seat. That's the rule. And instead of fundraising privately for the Liberal Party campaign, what you do is you come up with this incredibly crafty way of just using public money and then allocating it for all of your election commitments, and then pretending that you didn't do it and that people voted for it. Well, people didn't vote for it. You'd already signed it off. You'd already allocated the money. It's so dishonest. It's so dodgy. It has to stop. The only way it will stop will be a national anti-corruption body, because there is no one, it seems, that the Prime Minister will change his behaviour for. And why would he? Because it's worked so well for him. Well, we're calling it out, and we will continue to call it out. And he won't answer questions in when he's asked, what did you know, what did you do? But we all know that he is leading this. He's right at the top and he rewards this behaviour and it stinks and it should stop. Thank you, Senator Gulliher. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acti Acting Deputy President. Well, Senator Gallagher, that's sure got to hide. Um, something would uh, tell us through you, Chair, that she should really go back and look at history and the distribution of car park expenditure over time rather than picking out one period. But I'll save those remarks and uh, I would like to make it clear to the opposition and to all Australians listening at home that this government will deliver an integrity commission, not only because it's something that we promised to do, but more importantly because it is the right thing to do. Not only that, but we believe that having a robust Commonwealth integrity commission will help us ensure that our democratic functions that we rely on so heavily can continue to run unimpeded by crime and corruption. This government is doing the work as we speak so that legislation can be introduced before the end of the year. I can repeat that for you, Senator, if you like, before the end of the year. This is, however, extremely important legislation and it is important we get it right. So before the legislation is introduced, we must first consider the feedback that has been received from the extensive consultation process that has been undertaken. This nationwide consultation process on the legislation to establish the Commission has recently been completed, with 333 written submissions received and 46 consultations, meetings and roundtables occurring during the consultation period. Now, we all know that it's been a long time since Labor has been in government and they may have forgotten what that's like. So let me remind you that sometimes you can't just click your fingers and make complex legislation appear out of thin air. In order to get the right outcome, you actually have to do the work in anticipation of the legislation. And that is exactly what we're doing. Unlike the Victorian government, which I heard reports of this morning, their Auditor General had condemned them for going ahead and building railway lines without actually doing any planning. That's not how the Morrison government does its job. Once the government has considered the feedback from the consultation and the legislation in, it, it has considered the feedback and the legislation will be introduced. The passage of the bill will be subject to normal parliamentary processes, as in it will be debated here, and from there the Commission will commence operations approximately six months after the passage of legislation. Because this is such important legislation, we must get it right, Madam Acting Deputy President. And it might do the opposition well to remember that in the lead up to the last election, you committed to, and I quote, continue to consult with experts on the design details. And, as I've just outlined, that's exactly what the government is doing. And the fact that you're now making noise about a process in which you endorsed as well as shows a lack of substance of, to your position on this motion. It shows that you're simply making noise for the sake of making noise and trying to remain relevant. The scale of reform occurring is immense 
and getting the process right is important because we want Australians to have full confidence in, in that the Commission is doing what it's supposed to do. And we've seen failed uh, instruments like this before in other jurisdictions. Australians must be able to trust their institutions and be assured that they are getting it right. I'd like to remind the opposition that what this body sets out to do is extremely serious, that the ramifications of not getting it right would be immense. This is an agency that will not only be essential to ensuring the integrity of our public sector, our government and our elected officials, it will be essential to ensuring the Australian public has trust in its institutions, government and the rule of law. Now, as I said, Madam Acting Deputy President, you may have forgotten what it's like to govern, but it is essential to the functioning of Australia's government that we are methodical, consultative and thorough in our approach to developing this legislation. Australians expect us to get this right, and that's what we're doing. It's simply far too important, and that's not a risk we are willing to take. We've seen instances, as I just said, in other jurisdictions where, because they did not get the legislation right, the lives and reputations of innocent people have been dragged through the mud and destroyed. This is not something we will let happen. The point of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission is to investigate and, if crime or corruption is found to be present, act accordingly, and that is referring prosecutions to the courts. This is why the government does not believe that public hearings are an appropriate mechanism for investigating agencies within the public sector division. As important as it is to detecting and deterring corruption, we must always design systems to prevent injustice and unfairness to the people being investigated and, in, and accused by the authority of the state. The Commonwealth Integrity Commission is not there to be used as some form of daytime entertainment that people can tune into to get their daily dose of drama. This is not reality TV, nor is it there to be used as a political tool to drag others' names through the dirt or destroy the reputation of others. By conducting private hearings, we will avoid these potential harmful acts from occurring. Private hearings will strike an appropriate balance between investigating criminal corruption and limiting the potential for reputational damage without any conviction. So we'll also ensure that the reporting of public hearings does not prevent anyone from receiving a fair trial if they are accused of criminal conduct. And this is not some made-up, fanciful scenario. I myself, in my previous business, took a number of clients, excuse me, helped a number of clients uh, through accusations made in the New South Wales ICAC. Now, the accusations were either disproven or um, shown to be of minor importance, but their businesses were destroyed, their livelihoods were destroyed, their reputations were destroyed. We don't want that in the Australian Integrity Commission. We have seen this happen in the New South Wales Supreme Court where this, in 2019 when the New South Wales Supreme Court had to delay the trial of two former state parliamentarians, in part because of the adverse pre-trial publicity they received in response to the public hearings by the New South Wales ICAC. The New South Wales Supreme Court found that it may have prejudiced the availability of a fair trial for the accused. Our government's model ensures that the courts make the findings of, criminality, of criminally corrupt conduct and it's the courts that determine a person's guilt or innocence. Not political commentators, not the media, not social media. But the courts will be the ones who decide the guilt of a person. Natural justice is such a fundamental concept to our society and our legal system that the presumption of innocence is, must be upheld and is not something that we are willing to throw away simply because those opposite stamp their feet throw their toys across the room and give us these motions to come in and debate. Our commitment to establishing a Commonwealth Integrity Commission is firm. 
In the 2019-20 budget, budget, the government committed $106.7 million of new money to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. This was in addition to the $40.7 million in funding for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, ACLE, which will transfer to the Commission, a total of $147.4 million. This investment, already committed by the government, is in stark contrast to Labor, who has something called seven design principles, whatever they are, and they think that it will only cost $58.7 million. Now that's nearly $90 million less than what the government has budgeted for. So while those opposite stand there making their weak commitments that they will never have to fulfil, this government is investing the money and is investing the time to get this done and to get it done right. Not only have we committed the $147.4 million in funding, but the government has already implemented phase one of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission by expanding the jurisdiction of ACLE to cover four additional agencies. The Australian Taxation Office, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, Australian Prudential Regulation Authority and the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. So while those opposites sit there and move motions like these, the record shows that we are getting things done and that we are committed to getting it done right. In the interim, the government has allocated $54.4 million to support this expanded jurisdiction under the first phase, which means the, the, uh, that ACLE's staffing levels will increase from 64 to 110 in the 21-22 financial year to support its expanded work. What this government has is a robust, multifaceted approach to combating corruption. We want to ensure that when and where corruption occurs, it is dealt with appropriately. The Commonwealth Integrity Commission will further enhance our existing integrity arrangements. The Commonwealth Integrity Commission will be the lead body in Australia's successful multi-agency anti-corruption framework and will enhance accountability across the public sector. Under this framework, multiple agencies have responsibilities for preventing, detecting and responding to corruption. And these already include the Australian Commission for Law, Law Enforcement Integrity, which has specialist skills to arrest corruption risks that face law enforcement agencies. The Federal Police, the Australian Federal Police, which works with partner agencies across the Commonwealth to leverage expertise, capabilities and information holdings to respond to serious and complex corruption offences, including fraud and foreign bribery. The Commonwealth Ombudsman considers and investigates complaints where people believe they have been treated unfairly by an Australian government department, and the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority audits, advises and reports on the work uh, on the work expenses of parliamentarians and their staff. Not only that, Madam Acting Deputy President, but Australia's democratic, democratic system of representative government, professional and independent judiciary, free media and active civil society all play an important role in protecting and preventing corruption by enabling and encouraging scrutiny of public and private sectors. There are a few uh, important points to also remember regarding the government's model for the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Firstly, it will have the same powers as a Royal Commission to investigate criminal corruption in the public sector. Like the opposition's National Anti-Corruption Commission, the Commonwealth Integrity Commission's jurisdiction will extend to a wide range of persons and entities. The Commonwealth Integrity Commission will be able to investigate private individuals and companies where this is relevant to one of their investigations. It will also be able to exercise its own motion powers in relation to law enforcement corruption issues. It will be able to look into conduct that occurred to prior to its establishment if the offence existed at the time the conduct occurred. Therefore, for the life of me, I do not see why this is not something the other side would not support. If those opposite truly cared about co combating corruption and wanted to see an anti-corruption body, they would get behind the government's model 100 per cent. 
But as I said earlier, it seems as though all they truly want to do is make noise for the sake of making noise in an attempt to remain relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. We have Senator Waters remotely. Hi there, I think Deputy President is checking you can hear me okay. We certainly can, Senator Waters. That's great, thank you very much. Well, this motion talks about the 966 days since the government announced that it would introduce legislation. And the motion also says that the Labor Party announced on the 26th of July that it would establish a powerful, transparent and independent National Anti-Corruption Commission. Well, the Senate has actually already done its bit. Almost two years ago, the Greens bill for a strong, independent and properly resourced corruption commission with teeth passed this chamber. It's been uh, 696 days, in fact, since the Senate did that. Now, the bill has been languishing in the House of Reps on the long list because the government doesn't want a strong anti-corruption watchdog. It certainly doesn't want the version that the Senate has passed because it has teeth and would actually work to clean up corruption. So it's perhaps unsurprising that the government doesn't want to touch it with a barge pole, considering the litany of scandals that continue to plague it uh, and many of its ministers. So instead we see um, the government announced almost three years ago that, oh, it's, it's going to do its own bill, it's coming. Uh, two years ago, it described the bill as imminent, and I think it's been about six months now since the second round of consultation was concluded. Now, it's sham consultation because the experts keep making suggestions to the government about how to fix the government's weak proposal, and the government keeps ignoring it because it doesn't want a strong corruption watchdog. It wants a fig leaf uh, so the bad behaviour can continue and everybody knows it. Uh, so the Greens have been pushing for a federal corruption body for more than 10 years now. Our first motion was in 2009. Uh, to kick off this conversation, and we've not let this drop for the succeeding 10 plus years. So it's great that commitments have now been made by both of the big parties, but words, words are cheap. And as I say, it's been 696 days since the Senate passed my bill, uh, and the government's doing absolutely nothing to progress a strong version, and it keeps on kicking off into the long grass its own weak version. But in that time, public confidence in the integrity of this place, of our democracy, has continued to decline. In fact, Australia has dropped out of the top 10 in Transparency International's global anti-corruption rankings, which is also known as the Corruption um, Perception Index. So people want better, they deserve better, um, and they can smell a rat. Um, in the absence of a federal corruption watchdog, and I might point out that the Commonwealth is the only level of government, um, of all of our state and territory governments, that doesn't have a corruption watchdog. Every other state and territory um, has one or is in the process of setting one up. So in the absence of that federally, Australia has had to rely on this patchwork of measures um, to find out about the dodgy dealings of this government. We've had the ANAO, the Audit Office, uh, there's been Senate inquiries, there's been orders for production of documents, there's been some FOI challenges, there's been the state and territory corruption watchdogs, um, and there's been investigative journalism. And those measures have revealed an absolute dog's breakfast of scandals, a litany of scandals, in addition to the ones that are listed um, in the motion and that Senator Gallagher uh, discussed in her contribution. Um, the, you know, the list is as long as your arm. There's been overpayments for offshore companies for water licences with no water. There's been millions of dollars handed to an inexperienced business uh, registered to a shack on Kangaroo Island to run offshore processing facilities. Multi-million dollar contracts for those gulags um, that keep getting renewed despite a myriad of complaints, breaches of local laws, and a failure to meet the, uh, the KPIs. There's been pork barrelling of the Safer Communities Fund uh, by Minister Dutton um, and others. There's been millions of dollars of public money handed out to gas companies headed up by Liberal Party donors. 
Uh, in particular, the most recent one, um, which we just examined in an inquiry uh, at the start of uh, last week, $21 million of public money uh, going to Empire Energy, a company to open up fracking in the Beedaloo Basin against the wishes of the traditional owners to make a dangerous experiment with our groundwater and our climate with, with hydraulic fracturing for shale gas. Uh, and of course, that company has very close connections to the Liberal Party um, and is headed up by one of its largest donors. Uh, perhaps it's not one of its largest donors, they have so many, but one of its significant donors. Um, so the list of scandals continues. There are so many involving Minister Angus Taylor that I would run out of time if I were to list them all. But the fact remains is that there is a, a real dearth of uh, transparency and integrity uh, applying to this government. Standards are at an all-time low. And the Australian public are having their confidence in the institutions of our democracy damaged as a result. Um, a Centre for Public Integrity Analysis released uh, just last week found that every single one of the programs that the ANAO has audited, those grant programs, sports, rorts, sports, rorts, to the, the car parks, but of pork and ride, the list goes on. Every single one of those grants programs that the ANAO has audited since 2019, um, which have dished out $10 billion in public money, every single one has found to be flawed, with problems that have ranged from minor improvements to serious maladministration. This has gone beyond um, one occasional flip up. This is now a pattern of dodgy behaviour that is shaking the confidence of the Australian public in our institutions of democracy. Now, I don't think much of this government, um, as I'm sure everybody knows, but I do think that parliament and our democracy should be, um, should be held in high regard. And as such, the people that are involved in, um, in, in running it on a day-to-day -day basis should be acting with more integrity, more transparency, and with the utmost standards um, of, of the public interest. And yet we see uh, time and time again that standards that would have gotten someone kicked out of the ministry 10, 20 years ago, it's Teflon now. And that minister stays in their role and often gets a promotion or at worst gets moved to a different ministry. So the standards of this government are lower, I think, um, than have ever been before in the history of our parliament. And that saddens me greatly because the people deserve better. Um, but what they've got is a patchwork of integrity measures to try to hold this dodgy government to account. And too many things slip through the cracks. The ANAO, which has been just fabulous, considering it runs on the smell of an oily rag, um, they've been critical in bringing dodgy behaviour to light. But very few consequences have flowed from the behaviour um, and the misbehaviour that they've identified. Government ministers are Teflon coated. Uh, they bluff their way from scandal to scandal, and mainly their hides are only saved because the next scandals come along to distract from the last scandal. We won't fully understand the scale of the corruption, the fraud, the dishonesty, and the exploitation without a strong federal corruption watchdog. A few weeks ago, a group of high-profile former judges, including Mary Gordon, uh, Margaret White, Paul Stein, Tony Fitzgerald and Margaret McMurdo called on the government to make good its promise to introduce uh, a corruption watchdog bill. Um, that promise that was made uh, almost three years ago and uh, a draft bill still hasn't seen the light of day. They said, and I quote, a National Integrity Commission is urgently needed to fill the gaps in our integrity system and restore trust in our democracy. Now, I agree with that, but imagine what we'd actually find if we had a rigorous, independent and well-resourced uh, integrity commission with strong investigative powers. Imagine what a difference it would make if consequences actually flowed for corrupt behaviour um, and the findings of such. Imagine how busy a federal corruption watchdog is going to be when we finally get one. It's what Australians want, it's what they deserve. The recent Australia Talks survey found that 89% of respondents thought that most politicians in Australia will lie if they feel the truth will hurt them politically. 72% of 
of respondents strongly disagreed with the statement that politicians are usually held accountable for their actions, and 88 per cent of respondents want a federal corruption watchdog. Now, since the government originally said it was going to legislate its commission within 12 months of taking office, it's missed numerous deadlines. It ignored the criticisms of its original draft framework, um, and when an exposure draft for its proposed Commonwealth Integrity Commission was finally released, nothing had changed. It completely ignored all of the input from the experts in that first round of consultation. All of the same experts made all of the same criticisms of that exposure draft because it's weak and ineffective, and that's exactly what the experts described it as. The Centre for Public Integrity analysed those submissions. Um, there were over 200 of them made by various organisations, and all but two opposed the Commonwealth's uh, bill in the version that it was drafted. 198 submitters, experts in the field, opposed the weak version of a corruption watchdog that this government is trying to fool the public with. Um, it's nowhere to be seen, um, and its draft principles are so weak that the experts have pilloried it, and they keep saying that in repeated consultations, and their critiques and commentary keeps being ignored by this government because this government doesn't actually want a corruption watchdog, and if it's going to be dragged to have one, it's going to make it as weak and toothless uh, and piecemeal as it possibly can. But the experts are calling the government out on that, and the Australian public realise that that's what's going on. They don't want a Clayton corruption watchdog. They want a real watchdog with teeth that's going to start to clean up the absolute dodginess and plague, uh, scandal-plagued uh, incidents that this government keeps dishing up for its delectation. Um, now, those submissions that I mentioned, the 200 of them made several points. They criticised the narrow definition of corrupt conduct and they criticised the high bar commence investigations because, of course, making the bar so high means that most of this dodgy behaviour wouldn't actually be captured by the government's version of a so-called corruption watchdog, which is no doubt exactly why it was designed that way. The submitters also criticised the uh, limited ability of the Commission to act of, on its own, um, of its own volition, of its own initiative. And of course, they criticised the lack of ability uh, for the Commission to act on public tip off. Um, instead, the Commission, the government's version of the Commission, would have to wait to be asked for dodgy conduct um, to be investigated by the very same government that it would then investigate. So you see the rub there. No government's going to dob itself in. That's exactly why the Morrison government has designed their version of the corruption uh, watchdog to be so weak. Um, the experts criticised the lack of protection for whistleblowers in the government's version. They criticised the different standards for law enforcement agencies and the public sector. And in fact, the police um, uh, uh, union representative has also strongly criticised this. Why have two tiers of standards? Why not have everybody held to the same high standard, including politicians? That's what Australians want. Uh, but this government is not going down that path because it's too busy protecting its own. The experts also criticised the fact that there was no power to hold public hearings or to report publicly about public sector corruption. Again, they don't want this to have any sort of reforming impact. Um, if they keep it all secret, like this government loves doing with so many things, um, well, maybe the dodgy conduct can continue. Well, it kind of defeats the purpose of having a corruption watchdog, um, as so many of the successful uh, state corruption bodies have shown. An effective integrity commission would restore confidence in a political process, but the government's ineffective, weak version would not. And worse, it would remove pressure from the government to actually do a decent job, and it would give the impression that action had been taken, while really it would just be business as usual, behind closed doors, like it is and like the Australian public has come to expect from this dodgy government. We need a strong, independent and well-resourced corruption watchdog. We need one that can investigate the wide range of dodgy conduct that we've seen from this government. We need it to have broad investigative powers and we need it to have public hearings so that dodgy conduct can be brought to light and that that deterrent effect um, can occur. 
I'm pleased to say that the Greens National Integrity Commission bill does all of those things. It's already been passed by this Senate 696 days ago, coming up on two years now. And if the government would just bring it on for debate, we can have strong, independent national corruption watchdog that this motion calls for by the end of the month. Let's get on with it. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Acting Madam. Sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President or Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's, uh, can I say at the outset that Senator Waters from my home state of Queensland undermines a lot of what she says when she is so gratuitous with her use of, of terms and so overblown in her rhetoric. And I'll give one example, and that was her reference her analogy, trying to draw an analogy between Australia's offshore detention facilities with gulags, to quote. Can I say to the good senator, if she really wants to understand what a gulag is, read Alexander Solzhenitsyn's three-volume yeah. The Gulag Archipelago. I've got, I've got the three volumes in my Brisbane office. I've got the three volumes in my Canberra office. If she really wants to understand what a gulag is, actually read about it. Read about it from someone who actually spent over 10 years of his life in a gulag and spoke the truth to the world about what was happening in the Soviet Union at that point in time. It really does undermine Senator Waters' substantive points when she draws such weak and, I would say, despicable analogies. With respect to Senator Gallagher, I must say I, I, I couldn't help but reflect on the fact that she was talking about so many things that are actually in the public domain, that are in our newspapers to the subject of debate in this chamber and in the House of Representatives chamber with respect to policy decisions and processes undertaken by the government. It completely undermines her argument that we need a Commonwealth Integrity Commission when the, actually the existing checks and balances that we have in place, including the National Audit Office, are actually picking up on a lot of these issues, and the opposition are discharging their responsibilities in terms of drawing attention and shining a bright light on them. Where are these things in the murky underworld that aren't attracting government light? Where are these issues? The fact of the matter is Transparency International and their latest ranking of countries across the world ranked Australia 11 out of 180. 11 out of 180 in terms of its corruption index. Can I tell you, Madam Acting Deputy President, as someone who has lived and worked in countries at the other end of the spectrum, Australia at a federal level and indeed at state levels does not have a material corruption issue. I come into this chamber and I look at all my fellow senators. I look at all my fellow senators and I don't see any of them that I would have any expectation that they would ever engage in any corrupt conduct and I believe every single one of them, every single one of them is serving in this place because they want to do their best for their country and they're not doing it out of personal self-interest. That's my firm view. And I think it doesn't help. It doesn't help in terms of, uh, in terms of the Australian people's uh, perception, perception of the political class and our political institutions, for members in this place to run, it, to run our own institutions down and to tar everyone with a thickly tarred brush. It really does not assist. It does not assist. Australia is incredibly fortunate that it does not suffer from the scourge of corruption to the extent that many countries around the world do. And corruption is insidious, absolutely insidious. It hurts the weakest in society. It hurts the weakest in society. It undermines institutions and frays the social contract. I want to quote from an article. I want to quote from an article with respect to a New South Wales ICAC case to shine a bright light on the concerns that many of us have with respect to the need for the legislation relating to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission to be carefully drafted and carefully calibrated. I'm going to quote from an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, and this article is dated 16 March 2016, and it's by Michaelia Whitbourne, and it's entitled Criminal Charges Dismissed Against Former SES Commissioner Murray Keir Following ICAC Probe. 
Former State Emergency Commissioner Murray Keir has accused the state's corruption watchdog of, quote, ruining his life, end quote, after he was cleared of criminal charges following a high-profile inquiry. Mr Keir was charged under whistleblower protection laws with sacking his former deputy as a reprisal after she made misconduct allegations. But in another blow to the Independent Commission Against Corruption, which has come under sustained fire over its handling of the ill-fated inquiry into Crown Prosecutor Margaret Keneen SC, local court magistrate Greg Grogan dismissed the charges on Wednesday. There was, quote, no element of revenge, payback or reprisal, end quote, in Mr Keir's dismissal of Ms McCarthy in May 2013, Mr Grogan said. Mr Keir said outside court that the watchdog had, open quotes, ruined my life, end quote, ruined my life, end quote, and, open quotation marks, caused immense angst to my family and my friends, end quote. He said the inspector of the ICAC, former Supreme Court Judge David Levine QC, who has launched a blistering attack on the watchdog over the Canine inquiry, had, open quote, said some sensible things, end quote, about the agency. Quote, I think the government does have to do something about ICAC. It can't continue the way it's gone. I just hope logic prevails at the end of the day and that the Premier does do something with ICAC, end quote, Mr Keir said. Then I just want to read this as well from the same article because I think this is important, absolutely important. Asked if he wanted his job back, Mr Keir said, open quote, I'd really love to contribute in some way to the community. If that's back in emergency services, it's too early to say, end quote. That is why there are legitimate concerns that we have to ensure that we get the legislation in relation to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission right. People's reputations are at stake. Through the rambling dissertation of Senator Gallagher, I'm not sure what her definition of corruption is. I'm not sure what Senator Gallagher would be referring to a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Is she going to be referring political decisions? Is she going to be referring matters of political process? Is she going to be referring matters with respect to whether or not funds have been wisely spent or not? What is it exactly those opposite intend to be referring to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission? I must say, Madam Acting, Acting Deputy President, I'm not, in, I'm not instilled with confidence by the actions of the Shadow Attorney General in the other place, Mr Dr Mark Dreyfus, who's, who's referred nine matters to the Australian Federal Police, none of which have gone anywhere. Nine referrals to the Australian Federal Police, none of which have gone anywhere. Those opposite are not instilling confidence in those of us on this side of the chamber with respect to what they actually hope to achieve through the establishment of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. And I do hope, when a Commonwealth Integrity Commission is established, that those opposite treat it with the respect with the respect that the institution will deserve and do not abuse the institution and the processes for base political gains. I dearly hope that is the case. I dearly hope that is the case. But I must say the rhetoric which I've heard in, during the course of this debate certainly doesn't instil me with any confidence whatsoever. The fact of the matter is that the Morrison government has committed to establishing a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. There were hundreds of submissions received with respect to the legislation re relating to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission and many of the points which have been canvassed in this debate. And it takes time to give those matters sober consideration. In the meantime, ACLI, the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, is, is dealing very professionally and efficiently with an expanded jurisdiction, which includes the ACCC, which includes ASIC, APRA and the ATO. They have been provided with substantial additional funding in order to undertake those processes. And that funding means that they are able to undertake more investigations. But can I say this to you, Madam Acting Deputy President? In the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Act, 
the touchstone, the touchstone before any investigation is to commence, is whether or not there is serious or systemic corruption. That's the touchstone, serious or systemic corruption. So again I say to those opposite, will they reflect on what the purpose is of this Commonwealth Integrity Commission? Will the referrals they think should be made to it fall within the ballywick of serious allegations of serious and systemic corruption? Or will its time be wasted? Will its time be wasted? Will those resources be wasted in pursuing a political agenda? All of us, all of us in this place need to seriously consider the ramifications of such an entity being used for base political processes. All of us need to consider that very, very carefully. In relation to the issue of public versus private hearings, this is an issue on which reasonable people can disagree. Reasonable people can disagree. Certainly Ackley has the power to undertake public hearings. It hasn't done so once in its whole history. Not once. Because in terms of putting the tests as to whether or not it's in the public interest to hold a public hearing, considering the impacts on the reputation of those who are subject of a complaint, in soberly considering those tests and whether or not it would actually assist in terms of progressing an investigation or indeed hamper one, in terms of soberly considering those issues, it has never found the need to conduct a public hearing in 10 years. And I, I deeply respect the integrity of all the officers and all the commissioners who have served at Ackley since its establishment, but we should seriously reflect on the fact that in, in its entire history it has never seen the need to conduct a single public hearing. It has the power, it has the power under certain conditions to initiate a public hearing. And that is a matter on which reasonable people can have a debate on. But in 10 years of serious investigations, dozens and dozens of investigations, many of which led to public prosecutions, it's never once, it's never once seen the need to actually undertake a public hearing. And that should give everyone the cause for reflection. When this issue of public versus private hearings was considered by a, a select committee, which included senators from this place, there were arguments both in favour of public hearings and private hearings. Ultimately, a consensus view seemed to emerge that perhaps, yes, you can have public hearings, but it must be subject to a number of tests and controls to protect against the politicisation, the politicisation of the Integrity Commission. And nothing I've heard, nothing, Madam Acting Deputy President, I have heard during the course of this debate gives me any comfort whatsoever that the Commonwealth Integrity Commission will not be used for base political reasons. In fact, all of the rhetoric I've heard, all of the rhetoric I've heard is to the contrary. Is to the contrary. All of it. I go back to that case of the SES Commissioner in New South Wales whose life was destroyed through the ICAC process. He had to take early retirement at the age of 55, spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars in legal costs just to go through a process, a public humiliation, and then be vindicated at the end of the day. Is that the sort of process those opposite are seeking to impose upon our public servants? and our bureaucracy? Is it really? Can I tell you, as chair of the uh, Joint Parliamentary Committee with Oversight for Ackley, it actually has given me a lot of comfort, a lot of comfort in terms of, um, in terms of issues, the level of issues of corruption in the Australian um, government. While Ackley only deals with law enforcement officers, or members of the ATO, ACCC, APRA and ASIC who deal with law enforcement issues, the number of actual offences committed is quite minimal. Is quite minimal. And it's been quite a successful process in terms of where those issues have occurred, shining a bright light on them and holding people to account. So let's not run down our political institutions. There's pl plenty of people outside this place who will do that for us. Let's keep it in context. 
And if we're going to have a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, which I believe we should, please, please do not, do not politicise it. People's reputations and lives are at stake, and we've seen that at a state level. Nothing I've heard in the rhetoric from those opposite gives me any comfort whatsoever. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Carr. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the question be put. Um, I have Senator Smith on a point of order. This motion is agreed to. Will that deny Senator Roberts and myself an opportunity to make a contribution? That would indeed be the case. That would be the case. As in, yes, you, you would not have the opportunity Thank to make you. a contribution today. Um, so the question is that the in front of the chair right now is that um, Senator Gallagher's general business notice of. Apologies. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be put now. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. It being after 4.30, my understanding is that we can't call a division. Is that correct? We will move that to a later date then. And in that case, um, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, so we move to the 30 minutes of adjournment debate. And I call Senator Scar. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I was absolutely delighted to have the opportunity on 30 July 2021 to attend the Islamic Council of Queensland Community Leaders Award in, in Brisbane. And it was great to see strong representation from all levels of government in attendance at the Islamic Council of Queensland Community Leaders Awards, where my friends David Christopoli, MP, the opposition leader of the Liberal National Party in Queensland, also Mr Mark Robinson, MP, and Councillor Kim Marks, who's a councillor for the ward of Runcorn, Runcorn, which has quite a large Muslim community. And it was great to see all levels of government represented from the LNP supporting the Islamic Council of Queensland Community Leaders Awards. I want to make a few comments in relation to the awards. The first was it provided an opportunity for all those people in the Muslim community who are doing such outstanding charitable work to be recognised. And it was great to see the way it was organised such that there was no demarcation between a special prize to X or a special prize to Y. Everyone Everyone who was nominated and who got through the process got the same award. And at the end of that process, the stage was absolutely packed, absolutely packed with community leaders from the Muslim community who are doing absolutely outstanding things in my state of Queensland. Second point I wanted to make was, and the MC made this point, and it was a very good point, and that was to recognise that not everyone who's doing good works in the Muslim community in my home state of Queensland had the opportunity to be recognised that night. And indeed, many people in the Muslim community are doing good works, not seeking any community recognition at all. And they're doing it under the radar because that's what their faith tells them to do, that's what their values tell them to do as Australian citizens. And I take my hat off to each and every one of them. And what are these great works? These great works extend to all sorts of areas in terms of providing community assistance. It extended to helping farmers who were subject to drought and fires. Extended, extends to helping the homeless. And during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's also included helping especially international students, especially international students who needed support to get through the period in which we're currently going through. So, so many areas of our society are being bettered are being improved by the, by the charitable impulse that is, lives, lives within the Muslim community of Queensland. I would like to pay tribute to Dr Habib Jamal, who is president of the Islamic Council of Queensland. Dr Jamal came to our country, and we are so fortunate 
that Dr Jamal came to our country from South Africa via New Zealand. And he has made his home on the Gold Coast and he held very senior positions in the Islamic community on the Gold Coast and has now uh, achieved the position of President of the Islamic Council of Queensland. And what he brings to that position is great empathy, great respect and a quiet humility. I see Dr Jamal at many multicultural events in the southeast corner of Queensland. Dr Jamal extends his hand of friendship to people all across the community. And I really do commend Dr Jamal on the uh, contribution which he is making to our, our, Australian, our beautiful country of Australia. And I'd also like to pay congratulations to a good friend, Jeanette Dean OAM, who made sure, made sure on the night that Dr Jamal was recognised for the great work he does. So, in a spirit of reciprocation, Madam Acting Deputy President, can I just say that Janeth Dean is also an ornament to our community in Queensland, and she herself does great work through the Muslim Charitable Foundation, which, amongst other things, provides emergency housing to people in need. And I visited the Muslim Charity Foundation and sat down with Janeth Dean and went through an exercise book where she'd written the case studies of people who'd taken advantage of that emergency housing provided by the Muslim Charitable Foundation. And those people came from all sorts of backgrounds. All sorts of backgrounds. It didn't matter whether or not they were Muslim or some other religion. It didn't matter whether or not they were originally from Queensland or had come to Queensland from somewhere, somewhere else. The Muslim Charitable Foundation was there to help them, help them with food vouchers, electricity bills, medical bills and emergency accommodation. So, lastly, can I just say that the Islam Islamic Muslim community of Queensland Senator represents Stan, the best of Australian your values. Your time has finished. Um, Senator Smith. Senator Smith's not, not there. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe's not there. Senator Vane. Senator Vane isn't here. Senator Sheldon. He's not there. And Senator Rice. Senator Rice is not there. Um, the, Senate the Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again on Monday, 9 August at 10 a.m. <laughs> I've had so many people tell me that. <laughs>